like to call this meeting to order. If I could have the members join me at the podium, and we will get started. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Trade, Commerce, and Technology Committee. I am joined uh, by my colleagues, Council Members Bonin, Krikorian, Buscayano, and Martinez. Uh, and we're going to get started. Uh, I understand there are some general public comment cards that have been submitted. We are going to take those uh, at the end. After both items are completed, we will move to that. And so we're going to start with item one. And unless there is an objection, uh, I'd like to recommend well, that item one be approved on consent. Uh, I don't see any problem with it, although we do we have any public comment cards on that. Yes, Mr. We do have public comment cards on that. So we're going to take that also at the end of uh, after item two. We will take up item one. But since it appears that the members will be willing to do that on consent, uh, any folks who are here from the port on item one, uh, I don't recommend that you stick around for it. Uh, we're not going to be asking anybody to the table for that item. So if you're here on item one, uh, you're, you're, free to, you're free to go and not have to uh, sit through item two. But we will take the comments on item two, on item one, uh, afterwards. So that brings us to item two, which is, I believe, why most of you are here today. Now, colleagues, whether you come to this item before us inclined toward one side or the other, one thing I think we can all agree upon here is that the decision that we make affects vast numbers of Angelinos and visitors throughout our city and will have a significant impact on how Los Angeles residents, tourists, and others access and interact with the airport, our airport being the fifth busiest airport in the world and the second busiest in the United States. The stakes are high. This is a big deal. As such, it's critical for both our local neighborhoods as well as our city and frankly, the entire region. Um, that's why I was a vocal proponent of the City Council's right, and I believe responsibility, to assert jurisdiction over the Board of Airport Commissioners' decision to approve the non-exclusive license covering transportation network companies, or TNCs, such as Uber and Lyft, a move that cleared the way for TNCs to begin operating at LAX. Now, I want to Thank, especially want to thank the Board of Airport Commissioners, its President Sean Burton, as well as the dedicated staff of the Los Angeles World Airports for their efforts and diligence in pursuing this policy. But the issues that we're dealing with today are very weighty, and in all things, the devil is in the detail. And it's the appropriate role of this body to review decisions of this magnitude. Now, more than ever before, technology is the engine through which tasks large and small are accomplished and the tremendous capacity of tech-based solutions to disrupt and to meet the needs of huge swaths of people is demonstrated daily in the ways that are both profound and mundane. As policymakers, we must address the intersection of traditional commerce and technology to modernize while ensuring customer access and protection. Pursuant to the Charter's Section 245, this committee has a decision to make, whether to concur or to overturn the Airport Commission action. In either case, Recommendations made by this committee um, will be included in what's called the committee report and will also be voted on by the full council. Now, there's several ways to, to conduct a hearing like this. Um, I wanted to make sure that the hearing that we conducted was substantive and that we really were able to dig into the, to the issues. So it's a little different in the way that we're structuring it. We're not just going to have two hours of public testimony followed by some comments uh, and then a vote. Instead, we're going to bring up the stakeholders and, and subject matter experts from the Los Angeles World Airports, the regulatory agencies who oversee various ground transportation, um, as well as operators themselves, the TNCs, the taxi, and the limo industry representatives. And we're going to bring them up in tranches. So we're going to first hear from uh, the regulators, then we're going to hear from the regulated and the other folks um, the other folks who are regulated at the, at the airport. And so members, um, in terms of questioning and how we go about that, the way I'd like to do this is there's five different, there'll be five different opportunities for us to ask questions. And so after each of the panelists come up, we'll start off with Lawa. We'll, we'll go over and do a, a round of questions. And I would ask members to limit themselves to one or two questions so that we can keep this moving. Because otherwise, we're going to get stuck on one panel 
and not really get through all of the different issues and all the presentations that we need to get through. So we've timed it out so each of the, each of the panelists will have a set amount of time uh, that's been determined and they're aware of that and we'll, we will mark that. Um, and then that'll be followed by a, a similar amount of time in terms of questioning. Then we'll go to the next panel, questions, next panel, et cetera. And then when it's all said and done, if there's anyone that you want to call back up, you're welcome to do that. So I'm not cutting anyone short uh, on their questions, but, I'm, but I am asking us to keep things moving. And, and as such, we'll ask you to, to limit yourself not to a series of 10 questions, but to one or two questions um, for each panel uh, as we go. And I think it'll, it'll become clear, and I think that will help us move forward. So again, I want this to be a good discussion, a substantive discussion. Uh, the other thing is, throughout this time, I'm going to recognize members for solely for the purposes of, of questions and discussions. We'll not be recognizing members for motions until the appropriate time in this hearing at the end when we do motions. So I wanted to establish that up, up front. With that, um, before we, we get started, if any of my colleagues uh, want to have an opening statement, of, uh, I would, would welcome that. Uh, if any of you would like to start off with a few comments. Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. I, I just wanted to, as the maker of the Rule 245 motion, I just wanted to take a moment to say uh, that your conscientious observations and the way you've um, laid out the plan for this hearing I think very well demonstrates the importance of bringing the 245 in the first place. Uh, this motion is not intended to be an attack on an industry. It's not intended to be uh, disrespectful to the board. It's not intended to be antagonistic to technological developments. Uh, the only point of bringing this motion uh, was exactly to achieve what you just described we will be achieving today, a thorough comprehensive discussion of issues that matter to the people of this city by the people who are elected by the people of this city to represent their interests. Um, it's, um, it's an important step forward that we're taking today, I think, uh, to ensure that the City Council has an opportunity to weigh in on issues involving the safety of the traveling public, issues involving um, fair and respectful access for our disabled community. Um, equal treatment of every part of this city um, in, in uh, being able to uh, have the full range of options of ground transportation. Uh, the environmental benefits or detriments of having TNCs operating uh, in the airport. All of those are issues of fundamental importance to the people of this city and need to be discussed in the context of the city council's deliberations. And so I really very much appreciate the, the way that you have laid out what we're going to be talking about today and the way that you've framed the issues that we're going to discuss. And I'm looking forward to hearing from the experts that we're going to have before us so that we can have the thorough discussion that we need to have as the policymakers of this city. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, too, want to commend you for the way you've structured this, this conversation, this hearing today. Uh, as you know, I wasn't uh, particularly enthusiastic about having this discussion. I was uh, very happy with the, the Board of Airport Commissioner's decision and continue to be. Uh, but it's a valuable discussion to have, uh, and I appreciate that, that folks who have not been um, uh, as close to airport matters or to uh, transportation matters want to have a, a, a say in this and do a deep dive and study it. Um, for me, my prism, because this conversation is easily going to be, once we turn to testimony, going to turn into a conversation between industries or, or a debate between industries. And uh, as Mr. Krikorian outlined, the, 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 the appropriate prism for our discussion, the appropriate um, way of looking at the decision we make is what's best for passengers and what the passengers want. Uh, I'm a strong advocate of making sure that people have as many choices as possible. Uh, the work we've done at LAX over the past few years has all been about creating different options for people to get to and from the airport. Um, but as we have this discussion today, uh, it's a good discussion to have. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's going to be an incomplete discussion because we're talking about one, we're talking about the safety standards or we're talking about the, uh, the diversity standards or we're talking about whatever issue we're talking about. We're talking about those standards for one sliver of the market. And the same rules apply to the transportation network companies as they do to the shared ride vans, 
and the flyaway buses and the courtesy shuttles and the limousines and the town cars and the charter buses and the charter vans. And we should be having this conversation about all of those options so that we're having a, a, a uniform standard. But this is a good way to kick off the discussion and I welcome it and I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Espinosa, uh, if you would please read item two into the record and we will get started. Item two is a Board of Airport Commissioners on July 16, 2015 action relative to approving a non-exclusive license agreement covering transportation network companies servicing Los Angeles International Airport. On August 5, 2015, the Council, City Council approved motion um, by Council Members Krikorian, Blumenfeld et al. Pursuant to Charter Section 245, asserting jurisdiction over the Board of Airport Commissioners action. Thank you very much. So first I'd like to invite uh, Steve Martin, who's the COO of, L of LAWA, and Sean Burton to the table. Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, hoping that you can start by giving us uh, a bit of an overview of the proposed NILA with the TNCs, including things such as the geofence operations, customer service, and trip fees. Great. Uh Chairman Blumenfeld, committee members, thank you very much for having us here today and giving us an opportunity to present. My name is Sean Burton. I'm the president of the Board of Airport Commissioners. I am joined by Deborah Alley Flint, who is our new executive director, and Steve Martin, who's our deputy executive director. I'm going to make just a few introductory comments, and then we're going to go into the presentation, if that works for you. Please. On July 16th, the Board of Airport Commissioners approved a non-exclusive license agreement for transportation network companies such as UberX and Lyft to pick up passengers at Los Angeles International Airport. This was a culmination of a lengthy and deliberative process to address a challenging situation. TNCs are currently picking up at LAX, legally dropping passengers at the curbside and picking up passengers at local hotels in remote parking lots and elsewhere in the community. This is happening today. The only thing TNCs are not allowed to do is to pick up passengers at the terminal curbside. These impacts are real, and we need a, a non-exclusive license agreement, or NILA, to address the challenges. The airline passengers who wish to use TNCs at LAX are already using TNCs elsewhere, in the city, the state, and the world. Passengers are choosing to use the TNCs in the current regulatory environment, and this will not change. The proposed NILA is an attempt to add order to the situation. It attempts to ensure that TNC drop-offs and pickups are done in a reasonable and safe manner, to ensure that local businesses and communities are not unreasonably burdened by airport-related TNC activity, and to ensure that TNCs are paying fees at least comparable to other operators. The NILA will give our passengers the customer experience they want while installing a system that allows LAWA staff to manage TNC operations, insurance, and safety requirements and collect appropriate revenue from commercial operators in the process. If we could go to the slide presentation, please. So this process started for this started, started in September of 13 when the California Public Utilities Commission enabled TNCs. In May of 2014, LAWA proposed a draft NILA for public comment which would permit TNC to pick up passengers at LAX and to subject TNCs to LAWA requirements, operating regulations, and fees. We received over 20 comment letters and emails at the time. In the fall of 2014, we received a letter, I received a letter from our mayor asking us to look at TNCs and figure out ways we could, quote, level the playing field with taxis and other transportation providers. And we took this charge seriously. And in December, the staff recommended to the Board of Airport Commissioners that LAWA proceed with the NILA. Uh, we proposed a new NILA in April of 2015 um, for public comment, which reflected recommendations from, from the wintertime. We received over 15 comment letters and emails received. Steve Martin and other members of the executive staff spent hundreds of hours meeting with the public, meeting with representatives of the taxis, the transportation uh, companies, and others to get their public comments. This was reflected in the final NILA that went before the board that we approved on July 16th. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that the staff has done it, put a lot of time and a deliberative effort. Um, they have reviewed what other airports have done around the country, what other airports have done within California, in an effort to put forth best practices that we could adopt at LAX. 
With that, I would like to turn over, uh, turn over the presentation to Deborah Alley Flint. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, it's very good to be here, in my first meeting with the TCT, so uh, greetings to, to everyone, including the public here for this important discussion. Uh, as, a, as a new executive director, I was very pleased to see the goals that were outlined by LAWA and affirmed by the board relative to this TNC and the NILA. Uh, uh, approval here. And, and those goals are very important for airport operators, um, certainly that are reflective of LAWA specific goals, but also goals of airport and the airport industry across the country. Uh, that includes number one, providing a safe environment. Public safety is always a top concern, uh, and staff works ostensibly with regulators and with stakeholders on a continual basis to ensure public safety throughout all of our airport operations. Expanding the airport passengers' transportation choices. As we look at the evolution of air travel and aviation, our passengers' experiences are continuing to be shaped by the number of choices that they have to make throughout all aspects of their airport and airline endeavors. And, and this is critically important for airports, particularly for LAWA, to continue to modernize along with an industry that's modernizing around it to regulate and manage the TNC use of LAWA property through enforceable agreements. How important it is for us to bring order to the operation. Airport operations, roadways, uh, all the partners that operate on the airport are incredibly complex and dynamic. And a LAWA having a NILA that governs and provides this regulatory framework is critically important for us being able to do the work that's important as the airport operator. As President Burton said, promoting fair competition among transportation companies in both regulations and fees. Important as well for us to level the playing field through the use of our NILA as a regulatory tool. Generating revenue for, from commercial users of LAWA property. We have an important fiduciary responsibility, and this revenue can only be captured through the enforceability of the NILA uh, that was uh, approved by the board. And lastly, our traffic management objectives at LAX. We know that this is an important area for us to be able to manage uh, traffic in a, in a very congested area, reduce the number of private vehicle operations, and this helps to do so. Uh, so with that, I will now turn it over to Steve to go through uh, the details and, the, and again, hopefully responding to and reflecting the thoughtfulness that has been done and the work that has been done over the course of more than a year by staff uh, to respond to public comment uh, as well as uh, elected's comments as well. Hi, uh, my, I'm Steve Martin. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of LAWA. Um, on page three of the presentation, you'll see some background information about how people actually use the airport, and there are two moments in time that have been surveyed here, and these are hold room surveys. The question asked of the passenger is, how did you get to the airport? And as you can see by the chart, um, in the 2011 survey, there were no TNCs. Nobody could have said that I used a TNC to get to the airport. If, if you look at the column for the March 2015 result, 6% of the people use TNCs to get to the airport. So the TNCs, as Commissioner Burton said, are serving the airport. The difference is they can't use a TNC to leave the airport by any means other than a workaround through local hotels or local parking lots or local other ways that are outside the airport perimeter to move this slide. Um, and so the other factor in this chart that you see is that during that period, the biggest change that we've seen in the other direction is the reduction of pickup and drop off behavior at the airport. And from a transportation point of view, being picked up and dropped off at the airport is the least efficient use of the airport. If I'm dropped off by somebody, that person leaves the airport empty. If I'm later picked up by that person, that person goes to the airport empty. The TNCs today drop off at the airport and leave the airport empty. The, to the NILA would enable them to pick up there by making their departure trip efficient. And that's one of the primary goals of the NILA in allowing pickups is to increase the efficiency. And while it's not a scientific result or survey, there's lots of evidence that the pickup and drop off behavior is directly relate, drop off is directly related to the availability of the TNCs whose customers want to use them. So the, one of the objectives here as background data is that pickup and drop off is, is our biggest problem at the airport and this, the TNCs appear to address that problem. They can only address it in half today. The NILA would allow them to address both halves in the future. 
Um, on the next slide, um, we basically go through a summary of the sort of the regulatory framework into which we were fitting this NILA. I think it's important to understand that in the, in the airport today, anybody can drop off at the airport without restriction. That includes taxi cab companies from other cities, um, any limo operator, there's no re regulation of the drop-offs at the airport today, nor are there any fees. So the TNCs are operating legally today, dropping off. They are allowed to do that. Anybody is allowed to do that without restriction. On the pickup side, we have a framework or a regime that's highly regulated. Um, the city taxis are regulated by the city itself. We don't add any additional regulations other than operating aspects to the taxi cabs. There are three shared ride van companies that are also enabled by the uh, California Public Utilities Commission, but they have concession agreements with us. They are restricted in a variety of areas unique to their operation and they pay fees to use the airport for pick up and drop off. There are over 3,000 uh, TCPs, companies that are limo operators that are enabled by the PUC that have permits or their own NILAs at the airport and they pay trip fees on the pickup side and they're allowed to pick up in the airport after going to the limo pool. There are a bunch of scheduled buses. There are a volume of courtesy vehicles in the form of private parking lots off the airport, hotels off the airport. These are the primary way by which people are doing workarounds to get to the TNCs in the absence of permission to come into the airport. The TNCs, as we say down the bottom today, are not regulated at all. They are allowed to drop off. Um, and we know that there are workarounds occurring, so um, there's nothing prohibiting their operation and the framework in the absence of the NILA. Um, the next slide describes, I think, the, the basic framework of trying to regulate the behavior of the TNCs and the NILA. Um, I know it's hard to see on the screen, but the, um, the red box on the right, uh, the, what is called the designated assignment area, once the NILA is enforced, and it is in place. A passenger in the central terminal area can only seek a TNC who's in the designated assignment area. The designated assignment area is an area that by technology will be restricted to the only place a passenger could call for a TNC. This prevents uh, TNCs from being in the community and responding to uh, passenger requests to be picked up, which they could do today. Um, under this regulation, we've basically created an area, a zone that's largely an industrial kind of area away from the community and a setback that says that's where uh, assignments can be gained from. The geofence, the green zone, is the zone into which once entered, whether they are picking up and drop or dropping off, the TNCs would pay the fee. So the fee would be $4, same as other users at the airport. So this is the framework of gaining control over their operation as opposed to have them completely unadministered as they are today. Um, the next slide, next two slides actually, um, as, as Commissioner Burton said, we got a lot of comments, some from council members. Uh, we did consider all those comments. Um, there's a summary here of how the, what those comments were, how we addressed them and how they fit into um, both the CPUC regulations and relative to co competitors. So I'm going to go through these uh, one by one. Um, sort of competition and traffic is the first category. Um, the, t the NILA says that drop-offs and pickups could only occur on the upper level roadway of the airport. That is a restriction that we put in place for a variety of reasons, one of which was to avoid confrontations between the TNC operators and the cabs on the lower level, thereby in effect protecting the cabs pickup zone on the lower level on bad claim, saying to the TNCs, you can only pick up and drop off on the upper level. The TNCs don't like that. They view that as a disadvantage. We uh, thought it was the right thing to do both from, from a airport operations point of view and because the upper level roadway has less traffic than the lower level roadway. So confining um, the TNCs to, a, to zones within the upper level roadway as a way of managing their operation, which we don't have under our control today. We also, as part of the response to comments, created something called a TNC vehicle cap. Um, the NILA says that, only, that each TNC company can only have 40 unassigned, that is people who do not yet have assignments, TNCs in the designated assignment area, the red box on the, on the chart. 
Uh, the purpose of that was to respond to taxicab industry comments of fear of an onslaught or a tidal wave of TNCs um, who would be milling about in different areas waiting for things to occur. Uh, by limiting it to 40 and looking at results and being able to adjust the 40, we think that's a better way of regulating um, traffic in the area and the, the number of TNCs who can be there. Um, the next category is fees. Um, the TNCs, uh, the NILA says that they will pay $4 in each direction, whether they are picking up or dropping off. They would be the only segment of this industry that pays in both directions, pick up and drop off. As I mentioned earlier, anybody can drop off. We do not charge limos, we do not charge shared ride vans, we do not charge taxis for dropping off. In this case, while it tilts the playing field against the TNCs, the, TN the NILA says that they will pay in both directions. And the $4 is the same as a taxi cab pays coming out of the pool. It's the same fee that is paid in San Francisco. It's, I think, identical to what the limos pay in the limo pool. So it is level but higher because they're paying in both direction. That's partly a control mechanism that we wanted. Um, on the insurance side, um, as you may know, there's segments of the insurance coverage for each, for TNCs under the CPUC legislation. For the operational part of the TNCs, that is when they have an assignment and when they have a passenger, those two segments. The requirement is a million dollars of insurance. That's more than the city requires of the taxi cabs today. On driver background checks, which is the next slide, if I can get this to go forward. Um, the CPUC has established requirements. We have gone beyond those requirements and beyond what we require, we require of other prearranged vehicle operators. So for the shared ride vans or the limos or some of the other operators at the airport, we don't regulate their background checks. The companies regulate their own background checks. In this case, we've added two layers of background check beyond uh, what the CPUC requires. Um, that they have to investigate further than they are otherwise required to do that. We did not go as far as some of the comments on fingerprinting, but we don't fingerprint any of the other um, TCP operators enabled by the state. The city does background checks on taxi cab drivers, LAWA does not, and we don't do it for any of the other um, similar prearranged operators. Um, as far as uh, driver and vehicle identification, um, we basically treated the TNCs the same as other TCPs enabled by the PUC. Um, sorry. Um, and, yeah. um, and so we basically adhered to that standard. On the ADA side, we had a number of comments and concerns about ADA compliance. Uh, the city attorney provided us with language uh, in the final draft that we included in the document. I've summarized it here just by taking a cut out of the important parts that says they are obligated to comply with ADA. Um, and they are obligated to report to us uh, complaints on a monthly basis from any disabled passenger and to demonstrate to us that they've adjudicated those complaints or resolved those complaints. So we, a mechanism we do not have today is any reporting of ADA service or service levels and this would be a benefit of the, um, the NILA. On clean feet, clean fleet and uh, fuel. Um, the airport has an alternative fuel vehicle requirement program um, and that is what applies to all similarly situated operators at the airport who are uh, prearranged operators and other commercial operators. Uh, to be clear about that, that program does not affect vehicles that are less than 8,500 pounds. Um, that includes the shared ride vans, the limos and others. But um, we believe it was a a bigger airport issue to address the clean vehicle issue for all operators, not just pick off the TNCs initially and start addressing them as an individual group. So while we think we need to review our own clean vehicle program, we do not want to start it with one group, the TNCs. Um, the city has established the requirements for the taxi cabs on clean vehicles, not the airport. So where we have governance, it's our clean vehicle program that applies to it, which we admit needs to be reviewed and would apply to these operators once adopted. Um, so those are the highest level comments that we received. There are many other comments. I think we, we certainly considered all the comments. Whether we satisfied everybody's interest is, is sort of open to, open to debate. I think we did consider them. 
We do believe that the NILA is a framework that starts regulating. It doesn't prevent us from revisiting, amending, and adding to it over time. But um, we believe that we've done a fair job of reviewing the comments and addressing them in the, in the, in the overall circumstance. And I think Deborah's going to give you some summaries on the final page of why we believe um, the NILA is the right way to go uh, and to have it adopted and put in place. In regards to the, the final slide and, and the over kind of maybe overarching on the discussion here, again, I appreciate President Burton and the, and the Commission's thoughtfulness in looking into all of the issues. Uh, from, from my perspective, in working both at the state level and national level with uh, airport industry associations, we're seeing the migration of airports. Uh, both in California and across the country uh, embrace and have regulations because of the importance of having regulations to conduct orderly business uh, for TNCs at the airport. And I, it's, LAWA has found that the board adopted NILA uh, to be appropriate for uh, uh, LAX and its users. Uh, again, as we have shared before, the reasoning behind that uh, and in giving thought to the many uh, varied perspectives on this is that providing passengers with more choice is important in our modern economy and a modern aviation system. Providing uh, greater efficiency, uh, again, with the private vehicles being the majority of the transportation mode and the opportunity to make more efficient uh, the vehicle access and egress to the airport and thus helping to reduce some of the congestion issues and making the choice and convenience uh, something that uh, our passengers can experience at LAX is critically important. Uh, ensuring that the fees that ought to be collected at the airport for these transactions are being collected at the airport or are not being uh, subverted and, and uh, not being paid as uh, the TNCs are responsible to do. Um, and establishing orderly operations in a very complex and dynamic airport operating environment where it's important for public safety and for airport operations uh, that we are able to have knowledge and manage the transactions that are happening related to the airport. And again, for com providing competitiveness and actually having the regulations that promote uh, equity and a level playing field amongst the ground transportation providers. Uh, and so, you know, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to provide uh, this overview and response to the questions that were raised, uh, to share with you the process that had taken place over the course of over a year uh, on this very important matter, and, and thank you for your consideration. Great. Well, thank you, all, all three of you, for being here, and especially our, our new general manager, uh, Flint, for, for being here. And even though you're relatively new to the airport, you have just dove into this uh, issue and all the issues at the airport, and we're very grateful for your your work and your presence here today at this hearing. So I'm going to uh, start off with a, as I said, a question or two, and then have other folks ask a question or two, and then we may bring you back. So in terms of the compliance issue, I'm just going to jump, jump right into it. Um, you mentioned one of the benefits is that we can ensure uh, that we're getting the fees that are getting it. Could you help, help us understand how we can ensure that we're going to, that there's not an under-reporting of the fees? Is it all? self-reporting, how does that work? And, and similarly with the, the, the geofence and the staging areas, um, how do we ensure compliance with those and, and with the, the fees? And one, of, one of the things, I'll, I'll address this, uh, one of the things that um, is a prerequisite to actually getting a NILA, I mean, the fact that the NILA is structured with the board as a blanket order, it has prerequisites a, that says an applicant Uber or Lyft, for example, would have to come in and demonstrate the veracity of their technology to LAWA, to the executive director in particular, to show that um, the way it works is the way it's supposed to work. And so they have a burden of proof. They have to actually apply an effect to get ANILA and demonstrate that um, passengers in the central terminal area who are seeking assignments they can only be served from the designated assignment area. So before they even start operating, they have to have demonstrated that their technology works. I think that's going to be a challenge because our designated assignment area and our geofence is different than other airports came up with as a solution because of our unique geography. Um, I'll use San Francisco as an example. San Francisco is kind of on a peninsula. There's only one way in and one way out. And the geofence was relatively easy to construct. Because we've separated the fee area from the assignment area and segregated that from other community areas, 
they actually have to go through an application and demonstration process. Thereafter, they have to provide us with ongoing data that allows us to monitor what actually happens, how many trips there are, and so we are, have the ability to monitor those things in pretty substantially real time to see that traffic counting is actually occurring. And we can go out and check by taking my own phone and trying to make an order from someplace other than uh, the designated areas. So we have the ability to test it ourselves almost in a kind of a um, mystery shopper kind of way. So, but I think the hurdle is gonna be, and just to be clear about it, the TNCs have said what we've come up with for a technology solution with these two areas is a challenge that they have to go off and solve because it's different than what they've done at other airports. And when does that hurdle get leaped? When, when do they make that demonstration to you and how do you make that decision? Well, they are, we've opened the window for the TNCs to submit an application to get a NILA. We've said we would not permit any NILA until we finish the process we're going through currently. Um, we had, I don't believe we've had any applications filed yet. I think people are waiting to see the outcome of the process. But I'm guessing that, you know, from what I understand, they're off rewriting programs in order to comply with what we um, have required of them. And once we're through this process, we would expect to get applications that we will review. So it's not just showing up and signing a document. They actually have to demonstrate things to us. Great. Well, that's maybe something in, in the future we'll want to, uh, this committee will want to report on yeah. way de down the road. Um, in terms of the, the, you mentioned the background checks, and this is a very, you know, controversial issue, and, the, and deciding which, you know, whether the, the system that the taxis use or the system that the uh, TNCs used. Did you evaluate the two, the, the different options, and affirmatively decide that the TNC system was good enough or better, or did you make the decision that that is the PUC's decision and we're going to rely on their judgment? Um, we, can, we considered um, the request in particular on fingerprint. One of our board members asked that question. We did go off and look at it. We did consult with the airport police. The distinction here is that we don't do that for shared ride van operators. We don't do that for limo operators, of which, as I said earlier, there are 3,200 companies. Um, so we have not imposed that on others. I think Councilman Bonin has raised the question, should it be imposed on others universally? But we didn't feel that this was the place to, to start that. We're, we added some things, uh, an advice from the city attorney, that went beyond what the PUC requires. Um, but we decided that the fingerprint threshold was not really one that was, you know, beneficial to us or consistent with what we're doing with other state-enabled entities. Okay. And I think, can I add one other thing, which is I, I do think that a difference that we've, I think, uh, come to grips with is that Uber and Lyft and others have pretty regular customers who use them going to the airport, and if we don't have this NILA, they'll continue to use them going in the airport. So the risk profile is sort of adopted by the regular customers. It's, it's a different kind of framework. It's more, it's more like a limo operation than it is like a taxi operation at the airport. Within the city, it may be that um, TNCs operate more like taxis, but at the airport, they operate as much like limos as they do by, uh, by taxis because they're prearranged rides although the prearrangement based on the technology is a quicker prearrangement than otherwise. So uh, we did evaluate that and we went with the decision to uh, not go to the additional level. Okay, keeping to my, my own rules, I'm gonna now move <laughs> to other members. I may come back and ask some additional questions either during this panel or at the end, but I'll move to Mr. Bonnet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the Commission and to the airport staff for, for, again, what I think has been tremendous, thoughtful, progressive, forward-looking work on this NILA. Uh, I think you have uh, given passengers and customers what they want. Uh, they want a range of choices, and they clearly want this one. Uh, I have heard loudly and clearly from folks that they want this one, and I, I think the policy that you put together puts a premium on what passengers and customers want, uh, but it also does a, a hell of a lot, thank you, 
for neighborhood protection through the geofence. I think it's a smart policy. Um, for congestion and for congestion relief at the airport. Thank you, Steve, for, for bringing up that point about uh, the, the efficiency uh, factor of people not leaving with, with, with an empty car. Um, and thank you for framing this as being about solving problems at the airport, um, a number of them, and I think it does that. I wanted to ask, to, to tease out a little bit of what Steve was asking about the, the different background standards, because I've, I've heard that issue a lot. And uh, I respect that issue, uh, although it has bothered me that I haven't heard it raised when other industries have come up, the other different companies at, at the airport. The, the first question I, I want to ask is, when, when testimony came to BOAC, or when one of the commissioners raised the issue of fingerprinting, did anybody articulate what problem they were seeking to solve in asking for the fingerprinting standard? Um, it was, I think it was more of a general uh, statement about public safety. I mean, the, in discussions with the airport police, it's certainly not a, you know, airport security issue um, that, that is being addressed by the fingerprinting request. It's a perceived to be a public safety issue. Um, I think that kind of is no different than any of the other state-enabled operators at the airport. And was any testimony provided or evidence provided indicating that uh, the background check system used by the TNCs and required by the CUPs, which checks multiple databases and, and updates frequently, uh, that that is somehow inferior as opposed to different than fingerprinting? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it, it was sort of the city does this for taxi cabs, and so while the PUC does this for the um, TNCs and the TCPs, um, the, you know, we don't do that. We don't do fingerprinting for the airport um, for those operators. So as you indicated, there's a range of different prearranged transportation options at the airport, uh, and none of them are, are currently required to have that fingerprinting standard. Correct. So there, this is a conversation that's really just singling out uh, TNCs. Correct. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a separate question uh, about the trip fees. Uh, you mentioned that the TNCs will be uh, basically paying double. They'll be paying for pickups and drop-offs. I also understand, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, when a TNC pays a trip fee, LAWA gets a bigger chunk of that money than they do when the taxis do so. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, the taxis, a taxi cab driver who leaves the taxi pool today pays $4. What LAWA realizes of that $4 is about $1.70. The rest of it goes to the taxi pool operator, which is a consortium of the taxi cab companies. So our net of two four dollar charges is much greater on the t would be much greater on the TNC side once adopted than we realize from the taxi companies today. So if we were going to be uh, applying a consistent standard for security, one presumes we should be applying a consistent standard for the trip fees as well, and we should be asking the taxi consortium to pay us that. Uh, $2.30 per trip, shouldn't we? Um, we permit the taxi consortium today to put their costs in the $4 fee pursuant to our lease agreement with them. And we, to answer your question, to level, to level it and have us realize the same amount, we would have to change that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Gaynor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you um, for the comprehensive re report. Um, can you explain to us the other airports, other airports across the country, um, which airports have um, this uh, NILA in place with the TNCs and how they regulate uh, the TNCs in other airports across the country? Well, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> between you I've and Deborah. She's got more industry experience recently yeah. than I do because I've been here. So sure. maybe you can answer. Sure. Well, I can certainly speak for uh, the Bay Area where both San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland International Airport uh, have similar. They're not called NILAs, but they you know, essentially permit through their ground transportation regulations these operations. Uh, I would say they're all very similar. They have a little bit of range of difference in terms of the fees. And typically those fees have some relation to what the uh, other ground transportation fee structures are, and so they relate somehow economically to that. So there's no consistent fee 
across other airports that we've looked at. Um, I, I would say there is one difference in that at San Jose, which uh, offered its permit structure a few months ago, uh, there were additional requirements that are seemingly very difficult and are viewed as obstacles, so they haven't had any permits issued under their ground transportation hmm. um, options for NILA at, uh, at the, till this point. Got it. And to clarify, the TCPs, the limos, town cars, charter buses, that re as it relates to background checks, these operators um, fall within the same guidelines and requirements through the uh, PUC. Is that my understanding? Yes, and I, th I think um, by secondhand knowledge, the um, different companies have different standards, either equal to or above whatever the PUC put on them. So different companies have different standards, but it's basically. So some get fingerprinted and others don't. We don't know whether they do or you they don't. You don't know. Yeah. We, we don't require it. We only require the background check. We I'm sorry, Mr. President. Yeah. We require the same as everybody. For background check. Got it. Um, and we're actually proposing to require more. Can you turn on his mic, please? Sorry. I'm sorry. I was saying we were we try to be consistent across the um, across the portfolio. So we actually require the same background checks from everybody. Some firms may choose to do more on their own, but that's not a requirement of the airport. I see. Thank you. Great. Ms. Martinez. Um, thank you. I, I have a question, uh, Mr. Martin. The agreement talks about a vehicle cap of 40 vehicles. Does that mean 40 vehicles per TNC? Or how, how are you defining yeah, the, the cap? Um, yeah, the, the, the way the NILA is written, each TNC that has a NILA will have a cap of 40 unassigned vehicles in the designated assignment area. Um, that cap can be reviewed and adjusted by the executive director based, based on results. Um, just so you know, the way we got to the 40, there are today in the current cab pool, 120 cars in the taxi cab pool. That's what is staged in the nearby area. There are 50, over 50 cabs at the curb at the airport, just staged at the curb, but there's an additional 120 about to go to 230 when we relocate the cab pool. But we're trying to derive a number, assuming there might be three TNCs who have this permit. We didn't want the number of across all these companies to be wildly greater than the number of cabs that are in the pool. At 120 today, if we have three major companies sign up, it's about 40 each. But we'd like to look at results and decide if that could be modified. But do you have the discretion to change it? We have, the executive director has the discretion to increase it. I think the criteria would be um, after monitoring what's going on, do you know what's the demand relative to the supply? And the way we've set up the re reporting requirements, we can determine whether we should increase that number. So uh, my, the reason I'm asking this question is this is a non-exclusive agreement. So are we going to allow any approved PUC agreement um, for a TNC to come in and operate? Um, I mean, my understanding there's what, about 320 that have been submitted? So how are we going to be able to sustain um, all of them if they get approved? Are they going to all be able to operate in the, at the airport? Well, we don't know how many will apply or how many can pass the requirements. And I think the technology requirements that are in our NEEL are particularly regarding to the designated assignment area are not going to be um, as easy to for, for new companies to comply with. And so we don't really know how many companies there will be. Um, Certainly at some point, unlike the TCPs, where we have 3,200 companies who have permits, um, all of whom use our uh, taxi limo holding lot, um, you know, we could decide, well, if we've gotten to X number of permits, we could freeze them. We have in the past frozen NILAs in terms of the number to be issued, but... Is that uh, how you're going to determine which 40 get a spot? No, the 40 is for each company, so okay. a company that gets a NILA can have 40 unassigned vehicles in the red box that we've shown in the exhibit. Um, and if you have a permit, you can have that, you have that permission. And, and how many needlers are we anticipating initially? Realistically, I mean, I think two, maybe three. So, um, you know, we have a, you know, a very high hurdle for people to actually get these needlers. Um We know Uber and Lyft are looking at it. We do not have any applications yet. Sidecar had expressed interest. We haven't heard from them in a while. Um, so we're not really sure 
uh, notwithstanding what the PUC has done, how many will actually apply? And uh, my second question was, uh, you know, we keep going in circles about these additional background checks. Uh, you know, it seems to me that instead of, it just seems to me like we've taken the, the, the city or uh, the department has taken sort of a position uh, not to necessarily answer this question, but wouldn't it be um, more prudent in our part to do all the additional backgrounds to ensure that our passengers get to the airport safely and back home. It just seems to me like we keep having this argument about background checks. I mean, we're policymakers here. Shouldn't we do everything in our hands to ensure that our passengers are being um, uh, picked up safely and you know are, are back home safely? It, shouldn't that be our, our duty? Well, they, the, as we said, the TNCs drop off today with no background checks. Please, I just please, no, please no. limit the. Please limit I don't the need an applause. I, I really. I, it just seems to me like we just keep going in circles and in circles right. about what well, do we really need additional fingerprints? Do we really don't? I'm a mom of a six-year-old. I am not comfortable with anybody but myself or somebody very close to me to be transporting my child. That's a personal decision that I've made. But if people in our communities choose to go other routes, shouldn't our objective here as policymakers be to ensure? that we are double or triple checking that people who ride in these vehicles are people who haven't committed a crime somewhere else. I mean, I just, I just keep, I don't understand at what point we, we, we become a society where that just sort of, if, it's, if it means waiting too long for somebody to get processed, well, never mind, we're just not gonna go that route. That's, I think, to me, ultimately, what I'm having a difficulty with. The answers don't seem to really um, satisfy my sense of trying to do everything we can to protect the public, quite honestly. Uh, we have looked at this from a matter of being consistent. So, you know, when we think about it, you know, I would say this, and relative to the airport and how we view all the different ground transportation providers, there's some considerations we've made for the existing operation, which is that the, the roadways and public access, including other ground transportation operators, come right now regulated under the PUC and we follow the PUC requirements and, and we don't impose additional requirements. So the question you raise is one of, you know, should there be additional requirements and where should those come from? Uh, the airport has uh, taken the position of being consistent uh, with doing and requiring the existing level of uh, background checks or permit requirements uh, that we do on all of our ground transportation operators. So does LAWA possess any additional administrative processes to try to change the agreement to add additional background checks? Can you do that administratively without changing the agreement too much? I mean, you, you have the power to do that, right? Well, but the, the, the NILA as approved requires more background checking than the PUC requires. The fingerprinting I'm talking it about. Does not okay. the, it does so not require I mean, the fingerprint. Let's, again, let's, that's my, that everyone keeps talking about the fingerprinting and additional background checks. That's what I'm referring to. So do you have the power to do that administratively? If we, do, if we change the NILA and said a precondition of the NILA is you do fingerprint checking. So that which would is what, change the agreement? Right. That, if, if the NILA, I believe if the NILA was in place, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, if this, is, if this current NILA as drafted were in place and at a later time we decided we wanted to ratchet up the requirements or change the requirements, we would cancel the existing NILA, which we can do on seven days notice, is that yes, correct? correct. For any reason and negotiate a new NILA. That would have to come through the board and the council would have an opportunity to, to comment on it as well as they have in this process, but that's, that's what would happen. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Martinez. And, and indeed, there, most airports have, have approved NILAs without those requirements. San Jose approved it with the fingerprint requirements. So either, either way, it can be done, um, but there, there are consequences to that. And, and you know, in your judgment, that was not the judgment that you made in terms of whether we should. Um, next question by Mr. Krikorian. Chairman. Please turn to this. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me see if I can put a point on this uh, fingerprint issue because um, I think I can bring Mr. Bonin's position and, Mr. and Ms. Martinez's position uh, closer together here. What I heard um, the three of you say 
was that you're striving for consistency and you don't currently do fingerprint um, background checks for cab drivers or anyone else. And so you are treating TNCs in the same way, correct? Correct, the airport does not do, require those of anybody. The there, city does the, the city does the taxi cabs. Exactly, so if we were to uh, accept Mr. Bonin's invitation to take a broader view of what the city should mandate in terms of uh, ground transportation requirements, background checks for ground transportation providers, and if we were to adopt the broadest possible fingerprinting requirements subject to state preemption laws, then certainly the airport would have no objection to the city's mandating a fingerprint background check for TNCs or taxi cab drivers or anyone else that we could do subject to state preemption. Is that fair to say? I think our goal is to treat the similarly situated companies equally and if that was an imposition on the limo operators and the shared ride van operators, we would accept the city's position and recommend it. And, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, just it's a fine point, uh, Chairman Burton, but the specific language of the NILA right now provides expressly uh, for additional background check requirements that are mandated by law. Um, so there would not need to be a new NILA adopted if there's a new background check mandated by the city or by the state or federal government or by the PUC or by any other government entity, that background check would apply to the TNCs, would it not? I, I, I know if the PUC adopted that, it would flow through the NILA and be an obligation. I would have to yield to the city attorney about whether if the okay. city passed an ordinance, there would have to be an amendment to the NILA, I don't know. Okay. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about the specific elements of the background uh, checks that are provided at page 13 of the NILA. Um, because um, I'm confused about why there's two different categories of disqualifying offenses for TNC drivers. On the one hand, um, if someone commits, say, an armed robbery, and pistol whips uh, the person that they're armed, uh, that they're committing a robbery against, and they are incarcerated for seven and a half years in the state penitentiary. The day that they walk out of the penitentiary, they can become a TNC driver eligible to come into the airport. But if someone drives with a suspended or revoked license, they're barred for life, for example. I'm not sure if I understand the reasoning by this, uh, of the seven-year category of disqualifying offenses compared to the lifelong categories of influences. For example, another example, the seven-year category includes driving under the influence, but then the lifelong exclusion includes driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol and hit and run. So what was the reasoning in, in having any limitation? I mean, if somebody commits an act of violence or a fraud um, or drives under the influence, what's the reasoning in having a seven-year limitation on their disqualification? I mean, the, 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 the classification into the two categories that you've identified was really a response to the comments we got. Um, and so we tried to reflect in this what generally people commented on in terms of level of severity and it is greater than what the PUC requires, both in terms of duration and classification, but it was a judgment call based on comments. So those would have been the comments from the TNC operators who use private background search companies that are subject to the fair credit reporting requirements that go back seven years, same as a credit check agency rather than, is, 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 was that at their request then? They, they did, they objected to the seven year, and I think the PUC. They want to have even th less. The PUC, I believe, is a three year, and we went up to seven based on some comments received from others. Okay. And advice of the city attorney. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I have time for one more. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, page 14 prohibits um, unauthorized drivers. A TNC vehicle shall not operate in the geo fence area by an unauthorized driver. How can the airport enforce that? And, and I'm going to put it into a context of a personal story. Um, the other day, I and my staff summoned a TNC driver to pick us up here at City Hall and take us to LAX. 
and uh, we got the picture and the name of the driver who was coming, and it was a young woman, probably in her 20s or early 30s. And we accepted that ride, and then within about 10 seconds after we accepted the ride, we got a text message from that driver who said, oh, I, just added, I was just added to my wife's account, and um, so I'm not going to look as pretty as she does when I pick you up, but you know, I'm just confirming the ride. So when that happens, and when a, when a TNC operator whose background has been checked without fingerprints uh, comes to pick a passenger up, and then somebody entirely different is driving that car, how will the airport ever know, number one? And number two, why is it that the agreement provides for one free bite at the apple before disqualifying drivers who commit things like that? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the second part of the question. On the, on the first part, it's going to have to be spot checked just like we do with taxis and limos. Um, but mostly limos and shared ride vans. We have the same challenges with the other prearranged operators to make sure that they have the proper licenses and they um, are operating according to what their agreements say. But it is, a, it is a spot check kind of a circumstance, just like with limos and shared ride vans. Okay. Do you have the resources to do that kind of spot checking? Um, I think we have some of the resources today. I, I will use San Francisco as the example. The fees that are generated from the TNCs are substantially being plowed back into putting the resources in place to do enforcement. So it is a little bit of using the fees collected to do the enforcement. Okay. So in my situation, if that were found, the driver would get their warning. And if it happened more than once, as is provided by paragraph 10.3 on page 16, if it happened more than once, then the TNC driver could be disqualified from access to the airport. Uh, just one change. I think it, it's a violation of, for the TNC, the NILA holder. So the, the, the enforcement mechanism for us at the end of the day is to take away the privilege of picking up at the airport by terminating the NILA. Um, we have fines in this, but we also have really strong termination rights. And I think as opposed to the way the world is operating today with no regulation, where these things can happen with no supervision, we would at least argue that by putting this in place and then having the ability to find them or take this away, we have some teeth. Great. Right. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Corn, I would just, sorry, I would just add that we had a lot of similar concerns uh, on the board, and we know that this is not a perfect NILA. This is a rapidly changing technology and industry, and so we gave some discretion to the executive director. We put in very stark termination provisions at our option, and we required the staff report back to us in six months. So if we have to make changes to this NILA at a board level, we can do that. Great. So. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hopefully you'll stick around because we may want to have some <laughs> yeah. questions uh, at the end as well. Mr. Chair, could I just make a point? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Bonner. Uh, I just wanted to uh, tease out something. It's okay. it's okay. I don't think you need to sit. Is um, I, I appreciated what others on the committee were saying about we should do everything for security, so why would we argue against everybody doing fingerprints? I am absolutely fine with that. But if we're going to follow that premise, then the taxi industry should also have to do everything that the Uber and Lyft and all of those companies are required to do. Uh, they have to themselves check the National Sex, Register, Sex Offender Registry. They themselves have to check for national criminal search and other databases. So if, if, if you're going to require Chipotle to have certain rules, then you have to require McDonald's to have them. I appreciate it. I don't want to get into a back and forth on the members at this point because yeah. I'd like to get, we have a very long agenda with a lot of stakeholders coming forward. Uh, we spent a, an extra long time with LAWA, but that, that makes sense. They are the, 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 the primary folks here. Um, so I'd like to, to move on and bring up our next panel. I've also, there's been a request, uh, I guess some folks, Mr. Kawa and Mr. Herman have been gesturing with their hands and I've had a couple of complaints here. Please do not uh, wave wildly and, and distract people during the hearing. Thank you very much. Um, so, or clap unnecessarily, please. Um, we're going to move on to the next panel, although um, as a, a courtesy with one of our colleagues, he had asked, uh, he's also one of the seconders of this motion. He's not on this committee, but he asked to have two minutes to, to, uh, to speak. And uh, so, Mr. Koretz, we're happy to have you here. If you'd like to take two minutes to, to make some comments, and then we'll move on to the, the next uh, panel, which will be the, the folks that regulate 
uh, the TNC. Specifically, we're going to start with um, the LADOT and CPUC next. Before I start, any chance I can get a little more than two minutes as a council colleague? Uh, I, I, won't, I won't time you, but please be very brief because, as you can see, we've got a lot of stakeholders. It's a, the committee will afford you the courtesy as a colleague and as a seconder, so please speak your piece, but don't, don't outline the whole issue because we're going to have discussion later on, unless you want to come at the end. Um, well, I might as well speak now. So I think our job is to make sure that all our transportation providers have a fair chance to compete while protecting the public's broad interests. So I'd like to offer up a few reasons why I think we shouldn't just say never mind, but we should actually take some action. I think it begins with protecting the public safety through more rigorous background checks, the same that we require of cab drivers. LAWA puts tens of thousands of people through some of the most rigorous background checks possible, including fingerprinting, because LAX is considered one of the biggest terrorist targets in this country. Um, I find it alarming that the department seems so eager to say never mind when it comes to many additional drivers coming into the central terminal every day. A little over a decade ago, BOAC, the city council, and the mayor actually approved a plan to close the terminal to all private autos. Although we determined that wasn't, a, wasn't uh, it practical, uh, we realize that we have a situation where we have the ability to be more rigorous without significantly inconveniencing the public, and I believe we don't have the luxury of just shrugging that off because not too many TNC drivers are bad actors. It only takes one, and we have seen many. Another of Lawa's biggest challenges as it strives to modernize LAX and make it the jewel of a transportation hub it should be is meeting EPA, CARB, and AQMD standards for air quality. This congestion, and also dealing with the congestion that uh, 70 million plus passengers cause. This congestion has motivated LAWA to impose sensible regulations and access controls on taxis, shuttle vans, hotel shuttles, and buses. There's also a tangible need to control congestion and its accompanying air pollution. Air quality is why the city has had our taxis green their fleets. So after decades of trying to mitigate congestion and air pollution, BOAC has approved a proposal to go in exactly the wrong direction, to allow anybody with a TNC-linked vehicle to clog up and pollute the terminal area because somebody thinks that these variations on bad cabs are somehow sexy, convenient, and emblematic of the changing times, not to mention sometimes cheaper to use than a taxi. I also don't believe the virtual fence process will actually work to mitigate the number of TNC vehicles. I don't think this is the time to undo some of our not most notable accomplishments in the areas of fighting congestion and mobile source emissions, and certainly not in the overly permissive manner of the proposal sent to us by BOAC. I'll also refer you to the letter to LAWA of May 14th from several taxi companies. Among its salient points, it rightly points out that inviting quasi-commercial vehicles and their emissions into the central terminal area is unfair to taxis and every other commercial transportation service that must uh, adhere to LAWA's clean vehicle requirements and strict limits to their access to the CTA. It's also an action that threatens to amplify LAX's considerable air quality challenges and should be at least subject to a thorough CEQA review. Additionally, I'll refer you to a thorough letter to LAWA dated May 15th from the Alliance for a Regional Solution to Airport Co Congestion for their logical analysis of this and other aspects of the potent, potential impacts of TNCs at LAX. They get it, and so should we. Now, after two unsuccessful years of pursuing more rigorous regulation of TNCs by the PUC, Councilmember Kerkorian and I have submitted our own letter to the Airport Commission asking them to apply a regulatory framework to, on TNCs that is substantially similar to that the city has imposed on taxicab operators. When I testified at BOAC back in July to remind them, I felt our concerns were almost completely ignored. Our suggestions include requirements for company purchased insurance, meaningful ADA compliance, meaningful clean vehicle requirements, live scan fingerprinting for drivers, registration with the State Transportation Commission, 
and identifying decals so that passengers would know that their TNC driver was legit. We've seen that lack of accountability and self-discipline already with the reports of TNC drivers committing crimes, companies violating labor laws uh, regarding how they treat drivers, and most point pointedly, the recent judicial ruling saying that one major TNC operation should be fined and suspended. And despite that, we're counting on TNCs themselves to regulate themselves in terms of ADA and environmental requirements. Now, what Mr. Kerkorian and I asked for goes appropriately beyond the PUC's fig leaf of requirements and represents how LAWA should handle TNCs while it continues to modernize LAX in an environmentally sustainable, increasingly passenger-friendly manner. And El Lawa has also expressed a concern that the following, admiral exa uh, following the admirable example of the San Jose Airport and imposing more rigorous requirements on TUCs than the P TNCs than the PUC did will just lead TNCs to reject the whole licensing requirement, which they did in San Jose. But I think everything's relative. San Jose is San Jose, not LAX. And I don't think that any TNC is going to pass on doing business at the largest airport in the Western United States. I think we should find out whether they're serious about trying to legitimately grow their business at the airport or whether they'll just continue flaunting the rules because they can. Frankly, I think Lawa just thinks they'll flaunt away, and that's perhaps so but I don't believe we should refrain from doing necessary regulation just because we think it'll be violated. I think it's time to call the TNC's bluff. At last week's T Committee hearing, uh, Councilmember Bonin made a compelling point that if we're going to hold the TNC's to a higher standard and hold the taxis to a higher standard, we should require shuttle, limo, and flyaway drivers to also do that, and I certainly couldn't agree more. Um, one thing I, th I think we should point out, just being a disruptive technology isn't necessarily a positive. You can look at Napster, for instance, and while not every single person agrees that Napster utterly destroyed the music industry, there certainly are thousands of local musicians in California, in Southern California especially, who felt their professional I uh, existence was devastated and their livelihoods wrecked in a manner that, that they haven't recovered from. So just because something's a disruptive technology, just because it's new and shiny, doesn't mean it's a panacea or that it possesses some, some kind of blessed innocence. I urge you to tell the full council to send this matter back to, to BOAC with a clear message that we expect them to impose a consistent standard of safety, security, and regulatory oversight for all transportation operators at LAX, beginning with TNCs and following up with other operators when the opportunity, opportunities present itself. And one very last thing, um, when we had our council hearing, we had folks in the, in the blue shirts, we had folks uh, in, in the red or purple shirts, and the one thing I noticed, all of them were here to argue that we should serve they should be allowed to serve LAX. But when we talked about some of the actual regulations, they couldn't hide it. A lot of them were nodding their heads in agreement. And so I think that was the perfect testimony. Let Uber into LAX, let Lyft into LAX, let all the rest of them into LAX. But there are places where we have to protect our residents and our visitors. And I asked uh, you as colleagues to consider that and to add that um, and send that back to BOAC with some instructions. Okay. Thank you very much. Please hold your applause. Please hold your applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not that you don't deserve applause, but I'm trying to keep this hearing going because um, we're, we're moving slowly here. Uh, also, that reminds me, the last call for uh, comment cards on this item. We have quite a number of them, and we're going to close the, the, the comments in a moment. Um, so thank you, Mr. Koretz. And other housekeeping items. Oh, the other thing is you, you said something that reminded me of another housekeeping item, which was about CEQA review. Uh, this committee will take up CEQA review, but not in this hearing. That, will be, that is a council obligation to review uh, 
CEQA issues, and this committee will look at the at the issue of, of CEQA and uh, and this NILA, but that will be a separate discussion. So moving forward, we uh, we have the California Public Utility Commission representative Denise Tyrell. If you'd please come forward, I'd like to invite you to the table, Mr. Spindler. Please, um, no unnecessary distractions. Thank you. Um, come first. Ms. Tyrell, thank you for flying down from San Francisco to join us here. Uh, we appreciate that, that you're, you're doing that. It's an important decision. We appreciate uh, that the PUC is a big part of it and that, that you've made time in your day to, to address us and help us uh, understand the relationship with, with the PUC and to make an informed decision. As everybody knows, PUC regulates the TNCs, and so we're going to ask you to, to summarize the current process for a TNC to operate in the state, what's required for TNCs in terms of all the major issues, insurance, ADA compliance, uh, clean fleets, background checks, vehicle inspections, uh, grievance processes. So, so please go forward and, and, and thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that our uh, rulemaking on TNCs is now in phase two. So there could be within the next few months new rules or additional rules that will affect not only TNCs, but limos, uh, buses, other passenger carriers that we regulate. We are concerned that the regulatory scheme across all of these platforms is fair and consistent to all. The one thing that I understand is a major issue for everyone is the driver insurance and what the PUC regulations are on driver insurance. Uh, the ins there are two periods that we recognize for a, a TNC, and there's separate insurance for each one of these periods. Period one, from the moment the driver logs onto the app until the driver accepts a request to transport a passenger, the TNC insurance shall be primary. $50,000 for death or personal injury per person, $100,000 for death and personal injury per incident, and $30,000 for property damage. During period two, from the moment the driver accepts a ride request on the TNC app until the driver completes the transaction on the, on the app or completes the ride, insurance shall be primary, $1 million for death, personal injury, and property damage. Now, this insurance is to cover, uh, the TNCs must, must cover this insurance. They have to have this insurance in order to receive a license to operate in the state of California. On ADA compliance, which is a major issue with us as well, uh, the existing regulations provide very few provisions to ensure equal access for passengers with disability. Therefore, we are requiring the TNCs to allow passengers to indicate whether they require a wheelchair access vehicle or a vehicle otherwise accessible to individuals with a disability. They must submit a report detailing the number and percentage of their customers who requested accessible vehicles and how often the TNC was able to comply with the request. Describe any, they must describe for us any instances or complaints of unfair treatment or discrimination of persons with disabilities and file an accessibility plan and a plan on avoiding divide between the able and disabled communities. Uh, these, these plans are available on the PUC website. We have no specific clean fleet requirements. On the background check, the commission requires TNC to perform criminal background checks on each TNC driver before the driver begins offering service. The P the CPUC does not require fingerprinting of drivers, although we are revisiting this issue in phase two. Drivers are ineligible if convicted for driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol, fraud, sexual offenses, uses of a mo motor vehicle to commit a felony, a crime involving property damage, theft, or acts of terror. The DMV pool notice. The CPUC requires TNCs to participate in a DMV employer pool notice program, which provides notice of change to a driver's records. However, the DMV does not currently allow uh, participation because TNC drivers are not classified as employees. 
there is proposed legislation that we expect to pass and that would change the rules for TNC providers to be able to get a full notice from the DMV. Right now, we require them to manually pull these notices quarterly on each driver. Vehicle requirements and inspections. TNC drivers may operate street legal coupes, sedans, or light duty vehicles, including vans, minivans, sports utility vehicles, and pickup trucks. Hatchbacks and convertibles are acceptable. Each vehicle must pass a 19-point inspection conducted by the TNC or a licensed mechanic. Drivers may transport up to seven passengers on an, any given ride. If a TNC carries 1.5 million in insurance, they can carry up to 10 people, including the driver. We require the TNCs to give us zip code drop-off pickup location data and geographic equity data. This data is filed as proprietary and confidential under PUC code 583 and General Order 66C. And this information cannot be dis disclosed, but we use this information to see if the TNCs are, in fact, um, refusing to pick up fares in certain neighborhoods, refusing rides, redlining a district, for instance, and this is how we check to see that that is happening or not happening. So we, our regulatory scheme was put into place in September of 2012. It's an ongoing process in which we hope to have improvements soon. We believe these TNCs were operating, at least in the city of San Francisco, two years before any regulatory scheme was in place at all. Our main concern as the Public Utilities Commission was the safety of the passengers, the safety of the public, and the safety of the driver. Uh, that we felt as a government agency that it was not our place to pick the winner in the marketplace, that it was our place to protect the community we serve, which is the state of California. That concludes my uh, presentation, unless there are questions. Yes, well, we'll have some questions. Thank you again for your, your presentation and for, for traveling down to be with us. Um, Absolutely. You mentioned the reporting requirements. Could you elaborate a little bit more about what, what are those, what is that data that you're, you're getting? Zip codes, what, what else? We receive data on, uh, on the zip code of every single TNC ride within the state of California. So we can then um, evaluate the data to see if there are gaps in service. C can you share that data with LAWA? Is that accepted for, with another government agency? We cannot share the data. It's proprietary information to the TNCs. What about aggregate? Uh, what I'm thinking is as a check and balance to ensure that, the, um, that there's no under-reporting, seeing as the airport is its own zip code, you, uh, have, you have the data of how many pickups and drop-offs there are independent of the reporting of the TNCs. If you were able to share that data, that would provide another check and balance to the system and would, would help deal with some of the issues around transponders and whatnot. There may be a way to do that by use of a non-disclosure agreement between ourselves and, and uh, the airport authority. Great. Well, that's certainly something uh, as, a, as a foreshadow that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend in the committee report that we ask PUC for. But that sounds like an interesting, interesting move. I'll move to my next colleague. Uh, we're, not, we're not taking any motions now, so no <laughs> seconds. I was <laughs> very clear, just, just foreshadowing. Yes, okay. <laughs> Corian, would you like to, you went last, last time, you want to go first this time? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tyrell, thank you very much uh, for uh, sure. coming down. Uh, I guess I, I have to start by saying um, that I recognize the challenge that the PUC has in trying to regulate a rapidly changing new technology oriented industry. Um, that's always a challenge and it's always going to be a work in progress. Um, as a local public official, I very much wish that the PUC had left much more room for people who are elected by this city to regulate issues that affect this city. Um, and the broad preemptive effect of the PUC's order when really the regulations, you know, by everybody's acknowledgement, I think, were not 
fully cooked um, because it's a changing industry um, is, is a deep disappointment to me as a local elected official. Um, in many respects, you know, people in Stockton know better about what the people of Stockton need and people in Los Angeles know more about what the people of Los Angeles needs. That being said, I was very pleased to hear you just say that you're, the PUC is revisiting the issue of fingerprint background check requirements. Um, because I noted that in the rulemaking process for phase two, there is no mention of fingerprinting in the public documents at least. And so if, if that is the case, I'm very pleased to hear that and I, I won't have any further questions about that. Um, on the ADA issue, um, I, I'm pleased that there will be an option for a passenger to make the request, but I'm not sure how that helps if there's no ability to comply with that request. Um, because the TNCs claim not to be employers and claim not to, or, or they're actually prohibited from owning vehicles, um, how is it that there could be compliance with that kind of request? Unless one of the TNC drivers just happens to have, uh, you know, a full service handicapped lift van or something. It, 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 I'm not sure how those requests will be complied with to the same degree they could be if they called another kind of ground transportation company. And in that case, I'm concerned about the discriminatory effect that has when a disabled patient, uh, a passenger, excuse me, is left, you know, having to pay a higher fee, um, you know, left with fewer choices, because we're all interested in broadening the number of choices. But if one category of people who suffer disabilities are left without those choices, I'm very concerned about whether there's a violation of the ADA or certainly the spirit of the ADA in depriving the disabled community of those choices. So, uh, and then let me get to the, my last question and then I'll, uh, you can respond to all of them uh, in mass. Um, finally, since we're in the discussion phase and phase two of additional regulations, I have to s point out that the regulations that are already in place are being blown off by at least one of the TNCs. And the PUC has already found uh, Uber to be in non-compliance, um, subjected to a more than $7 million penalty. And that company is, from the outsider's viewpoint at least, uh, seeming to take the position that the PUC can go to hell. And so I would like to know what the status of uh, Uber's non-compliance with the PUC's regulatory uh, mandates is, um, what's going to be done about that, and why we can assume that a company that blows off the existing mandates is going to be any more responsive to the regulatory scheme that the PUC puts in place in phase two, or that LAWA puts in place under ANILA, or that the city of Los Angeles puts in place under its regulatory authority. Please, please hold your applause. Hold your applause. Thank you. Ms. As far Ms. Terrell, as uh, Uber and your question about Uber, uh, they are in full compliance uh, as of yesterday. We did receive all of the material that was requested. That does not uh, change the fact that there's a $7 million fine that's been uh, held against them for not giving us the information when it was due, which is in September of last year. So uh, there are compelling economic forces. And if Uber wants to go to uh, the city of Los Angeles's airport, they're going to have to comply. In the state scheme of things, we could have removed, at, at the, as an end result of not complying with our uh, orders, we could have uh, removed their license to operate in the state of California. Now, Uber's uh, offices are actually located in San Francisco. I do not think they want to have their license to operate in the state of California yanked away from them, and they realized how close they were coming. So they turned over the information, but it is a problem, and uh, compliance with ADA is a challenge that all its TNCs are facing, and several have given us 
their plans and how they're going to deal with it. One of the problems with the TNC scheme is that the use of private cars and that people who have private cars that are equipped with wheelchair access are not inclined to become TNC drivers. So uh, several of the TNCs are looking at a method by which they could perhaps break off a small group and purchase the vehicles on their own. That was one of the schemes that was presented to us. How we will solve this problem, I do not know. We don't have the full picture yet because we only got all the information yesterday. I don't remember question one and two. Um, well, the other one was about fingerprints, and I think oh, you already covered that in your introduction. Uh, the reason the fingerprints wasn't, the scoping memo has, has been adjusted perhaps since you last saw it. Uh, and the reason we were waiting on that was both uh, the uh, carpooling situation as well as the fingerprint printing situation. There was legislation that we thought the legislatures would give us a direction on how they wanted us to go. If there is no legislation, then it w we will pursue the issue in phase two. Okay. Well, thank you again, and I'm pleased to hear that one of the largest TNCs in the world seeking to do business with the fifth largest airport in the world has uh, managed to come into compliance with the PUC the day before this hearing. So thank you very much. <laughs> it was so one, one, one accomplishment of a hearing, get, get things done, right? Uh, Mr. Bonney. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, for flying down for this. It's, it's very much appreciated. You're very welcome. <clears throat> uh, just a, uh, a couple questions. Uh, the question of fingerprinting keeps coming up, uh, and you indicated that in your phase two regulations you're looking at that. If the Los Angeles City Council were to take an official position, uh, one uh, that became the official position of the City of Los Angeles, uh, would uh, that, that have any weight with the PUC as it considered uh, whether or not to do fingerprinting? I assume it would, of course, have a great deal of weight with the PUC. I, uh, I represent the commission. I'm not a commissioner. I try to be very careful about getting ahead of them and what they might decide to do or not do. Uh, these, all of these things haven't been decided yet. However, it is completely within the, the power of the city of Los Angeles uh, to regulate its own airport. There's. I don't see any way that the PUC would interfere with how the, uh, how the council chooses to regulate LAX. Oh, I totally get that. I, for me, it's a little ludicrous to have a system for people who drop off passengers and a different one for pick up passengers, which is why I'd like to see the PUC create a uniform standard throughout the state so that it, it's a uniform standard both ways at, at, at the airport. So uh, I'd be looking to see if the council might take a position to encourage the PUC to do that. Um, on the, the, in lieu of fingerprinting, the PUC came up with a, a background check system. Um, how did you come up with that to put the various component parts into it? Well, we went through a series of workshops and hearings uh, very similar to what you do here. We spoke to a number of, of the people in, who were affected, the stakeholders, to try and see what was going to be a reasonable method of checking. Uh, at the time, fingerprinting was thought to be a huge barrier, and I, I honestly don't know why that is. <clears throat> I don't see why the fingerprinting is a huge barrier, frankly. I put a fingerprint on my iPhone, so I'm pretty much uh, come across with the idea that this technology can do almost anything. Uh, I, th I think it has to do with the part-time nature of many of these uh, TNC drivers. So, so what measures, what, what background measures did you put in place in lieu of fingerprinting? Well, we do have to, you do have to have a background check. You have to use a person's social security number as well as check with all the federal registries for sex offenders. So uh, presumably anything would come up in that. In so in, in lieu of uh, the live scan system, it's a, it's a nationally used consumer criminal database system that they use, right? There is a public register of, of sex offenders. Not just sex offenders, but other crimes as well. Other, other crimes as well, yes. Right. Okay. Um, the concerns that, let, let me ask this. You, uh, the, the PUC regulates a number of different transportation or transit systems, does it not? Yes, we do. Could you tell us again what those are? Uh, we regulate uh, the safety of passenger 
trains and uh, what we would call light rail. We regulate light rail as well as uh, limousines, um, passenger carriers, which would be uh, transits, not tra not your municipal municipal transit, but for instance, your charter bus buses and things of that nature. Town cars and limos. Yes, so that would be all passenger carriers for uh, profit. So like courtesy shuttles at the airport for the hotels and stuff? Correct. Uh, when the PUC was considering regulations for that, did the PUC hear uh, as much or as intense a level of public testimony over um, background checks and security or insurance as they have on this issue? No, I, I think the... Uh, it's a completely different customer. An individual who is renting a limo or a town car is not the same person who is, who is purchasing uh, services from a cab or a TNC. So the competition in the field is pretty severe. It kind of runs its own checks and balances. The competition in which industry? In the limo industry? Uh, in the limo industry. There, there's a significant amount of competition. So if a bad player comes before us, uh, and of course if they lose their license, then they lose their license. And that we have the ultimate whip, whip hand. We can shut their organization down. Right. All right. Yeah, I'd submit that the level of testimony has more to do with the fact that there's a certain industry, the taxi industry, which feels threatened by uh, the TNCs uh, in a way that they don't feel threatened by the, the limos and the other services, uh, and that has a lot to do with the, the nature of the discussion. But thank you again for, for coming down. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Remind members, we still have a lot of, a lot of panels to go. Ms. Martinez. Actually, Mr. Kukorin asked two of the questions that I wanted to ask, but, um, but I do have another question. So for those TNCs that are not blowing you off, who in your operation is conducting the audits to ensure that the TNCs are conducting um, the background checks? This is done through our uh, safety and enforcement division. We have a transportation unit that checks on, there's a, a significant amount of checking that goes into the background of these organizations before they're granted a license. And then we also audit them. Uh, Throughout the, throughout the year, we do spot audits to make sure they haven't allowed their um, standards to drop, for lack of a better way of putting it. Mm -hmm. I want to go back. I don't know if you answered this or not. Um, the question that Mr. Kukorin had asked earlier regarding the, the, the TNC that you're currently under dispute for not filing the proper records, where is that in the process? Has that has that, I don't know if I read if it's been resolved or not. It has not been resolved. Um, it, it is resolved in the sense that they did finally uh, give us Turn the over the records? They did turn over the records. Uh, they have been ordered to show cause why they have, why they should not be fined $7 million for defying uh, the PUC's order. Okay, so you have the records and how long do they have to make those findings? Uh, I'm not sure of what the, what the case schedule is. Thank you. I, I did want to tell you one thing, though, because you mentioned your, your daughter. Uh, any carrier that uh, carries children is a completely separate set of rules that applies to that carrier. That a, a regular TNC may not carry a children unless an adult is present with that child. Hmm. I thought I saw a commercial of a carrier who shows up, picks up your kids, and then you put them in someone's car, and then they're off to wherever they're off to. But I mean, I've, seen, that, oh, I've seen it many times over and over again online, and in fact, I saw it in the news uh, one evening of a carrier who you, you literally use the app, and, and a stranger shows up at your doorstep to pick up your child, if that's the kind of service you're looking for. Unless I'm wrong, did I did I dream uh, this? No, no, I did that, not dream. Just to clarify, that that is true. There, are, there no, is a none service of those, like that. None of those services are uh, applying for NILAs, and I understand, and wouldn't be allowed under the. You have a requirement about having to be 18 years old or. We have specific yeah. rules for carriers that pick up and drop off children. It's a right. separate set of rules. So. But the service exists. The sir, if the service exists out there, we would certainly like to know about it because we would, 
If they are not licensed through us, they are violating the law of the state. Wait a minute. Then who is regulating the service that I see on the internet? That we would. It was be, on Channel Seven. I know I saw we it. We would be the regulator. That's even more concerning. Okay. But I Thank don't know. Uh, I, I don't know exactly which. I don't want to mention. Well, I can look it up now, and you can see the video. Okay, it, but it is a separate set of rules that applies to okay. children. It's not like a regular adult pay. I, 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 we're talking about two different things, but the service okay. does exist as far as I know. Thank you. No, de definitely, because I've seen the you, same seen thing. The video? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Miss uh, Ms. Reynolds, um, Tyrese, sorry, Tyrell, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if you're around, we, we may have additional questions at the end, okay. uh, but we really appreciate your, your, your candor and the discussion that you've that you brought with us, so thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna bring up uh, Ms. Salita Reynolds, who is the general manager of the Department of Transportation right here in LA. And she's gonna speak on taxi regulations within the city. Uh, so Ms. Reynolds, you can join us. And if you could give us a description of the city's current regulations, requirements for taxi cab companies, vehicle owners and drivers, um, you know, and, and specifically what's, what's required for cabs in terms of insurance, ADA, all, all the issues we've been talking about, green fleets, background checks, vehicle inspections, uh, grievance processes, et cetera. Sure. And uh, thank you so much for inviting us here to speak. It's on? Great. Um, I'm going to go over, I'm going to start with the background checks. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the ADA and green fleet requirements that we have in place, as well as the insurance requirements. Um, I did want to clarify what DOT regulates and does not regulate. So we permit drivers for taxis, for non-emergency medical transport and private ambulances, um, for DASH drivers and Computer Express drivers, and also for drivers uh, of a handful of miscellaneous shuttles that we have, hotel that serve hotels, uh, a couple that serve car dealerships and neighborhood markets. Um, so that, those are the, the drivers that come through our permitting counter. Um, we do permit about 167 or so drivers a month on average, um, close to 2,000 drivers on an annual basis. Um, when those drivers come to us, we screen them in three areas. Um, the first is we do take fingerprints. We use live scan uh, for that background check to be done through the California Department of Justice um, and the FBI. Um, the second thing we take a look at, oh, and, and just on that point, um, we look at um, convictions, and we have two different buckets. Um, there are convictions, felony convictions. Uh, you are never going to be allowed to, to drive a taxi cab um, in the, the city of Los Angeles. Misdemeanors, uh, certain categories of misdemeanors, um, if they have not occurred in the last seven years, you may be allowed to drive um, in the city of Los Angeles. So we have two buckets. Um, those rules are set by our taxi commissioners, um, and those are part of the, the set of regulations that govern um, the, the taxi drivers uh, in the city of LA. The second thing we look at is a driver's uh, driving record. So they are required to bring in a driving record that's been pulled within the last 30 days. Um, we review it for um, any infractions, and then uh, that driver, once they pass that check, is put on uh, what's called the DMV pull notice, which means that if they commit any infractions, um, the DMV notifies uh, the um, department and the companies, um, and then if the companies are required to let us know uh, within 24 hours. Um, the same applies for any future arrests and convictions through the background check. Once they are part of our system, um, we get notified if any of those individuals are arrested or convicted. Um, we usually do not uh, deny um, a license based on arrests, except in rare uh, instances if the crime is particularly heinous, uh, we will pull a driver just on the basis of an arrest and not necessarily a conviction. The third bucket that we look at is substance abuse. So drivers are required to undergo a substance abuse test, um, and then they are after, if, uh, assuming they pass that, they are required to um, be tested randomly at least once a year after that. So those are the, um, the set of uh, reviews and evaluations that, that we do for all of the drivers um, under our purview. Um, the cost of that is about $88. Um, so it's a, a somewhat nominal cost um, and uh, give you a sense of how many of the volume that we currently process um, at the Department of Transportation. 
The second question was about um, insurance. We do have minimum insurance requirements for, for taxi cab commercial insurance provided by admitted California carriers or policies administered by California licensed surplus line brokers. Um, auto liability minimum coverage are 100,000, 300,000, 100,000 split level or 350,000 combined single limit policies. There is a maximum of 25,000 deductible allowed. Um, and the first dollar coverage is required, meaning they pay the full claim and then go after the taxi company for the deductible, if any. Um, no self-insurance or self-insured retentions are allowed, and all operators must carry a minimum of $1 million uh, general liability insurance um, for business and operation premises uh, purposes. So um, ADA compliance, uh, just shy of 10%, about 9.8% of the overall fleet. Um, is considered accessible, and there are about 46 accessible cabs that serve LAX on a daily basis. Um, so that's about 226 of the, the full fleet um, is uh, accessible. As far as the relative uh, green quality of the fleet, 72% um, of the fleet was required to become green um, by the end of this year, which is about 1,700 out of the 2,300 or so cabs that we have. Um, as of August the 1st this year, there are uh, 1,820 green cabs in service, which actually surpasses the goal that we set. So about 77% of the fleet um, is, considered, is considered green. Um, green cabs have to meet the smog emission status of uh, at least super low emission vehicle, um, as well as reductions in carbon footprint through high mile per gallon fuel efficiency or alternative fuels. Um, and then the last category is about um, vehicle inspections. So LADOT, does a physical inspection of all of the vehicles, and then we also use uh, mechanics that are certified by the Automobile Club um, uh, of uh, America to do mechanical inspections of the cabs as well. Um, so that's how we sort of do the inspections of the, the vehicles themselves. And then um, as far as the question about, we had a question about zip code pickup and drop off and geographic equity. Um, currently, we look at the percentage of response times within 15 minutes for each of, we have, we divide the city into five areas. Um, all of the areas except for South Los Angeles have an 85% or higher rate of all calls being met within 15 minutes. South Los Angeles um, un underperforming there, only about 75% of the calls are met uh, within 15 minutes or uh, sooner. So that gives you uh, an a sense of kind of the service across the city. Um, there were about 2.8 million total trips by all companies um, provided by phone dispatch in 2013. We estimate about 2.4 million trips generated by walk-ups and flag downs, and about 1.6 million trips originating at LAX. Um, so I will stop there, because right. I think I covered at a high level at least all the things that you wanted us to to touch upon. You did cover a lot of ground, and we very much appreciate that and appreciate you being here. Um, talking about the processes, and, and part of this whole discussion is, is the level playing field. And uh, are there things that, that LADOT can do to make it easier for the uh, taxis and, in effect, level the playing field that way? And specifically, one of the things you mentioned was the, the physical inspections you said are done by LADOT uh, inspectors, whereas I believe under the, the TNCs they can, they can go to a third party mechanic certification. Is that correct? We do sort of a combination. Is, is that an area or are there, I guess, two part question. Is that an area where, where there could be a shift to a um, third party certification similar to the TNCs to give the taxis more of a, a level playing field? And, whether or not that's true, are there other areas? And if so, what are those areas? Um, so I'll take a shot at an initial response. And then I have Tom Drischler, who's the taxi cab administrator for the city here, who I'm sure has some, um, some things to add as well. So um, the mayor did ask the, the Board of Taxi Cab Commissioners to level the playing field between TNCs and taxis. And um, as part of that, um, the first thing that the board did was to try and examine and perhaps simplify the broad set of regulations that currently govern um, taxi cab drivers. We, we make rules about everything from the color of their socks um, to whether or not they can smoke in their cab. Because, and this is something that is important to understand, taxi cab drivers, like Uber drivers, are not considered direct employees 
of the cab companies. That set of regulations and rules is the only way that the cab companies have to ensure, uh, to regulate their employees. So when we did that, um, in the interest of leveling the playing field, perhaps deregulating, maybe lowering some of the fees, we got an across the board negative response from the cab companies because that would um, immediately in impact their ability to regulate the people who drive their cars who are not direct employees of the cab companies. Um, the second thing we did and are still doing um, along with the Board of Taxi Cab Commissioners is to try and get all of the cabs in Los Angeles in a single app um, or at least require that they use an app-based e-hail system or have that available to their customers. Um, currently, if you pull up one of the many apps that's available to call a cab, the entire fleet will not be at your disposal. One of the things that is most powerful for consumers is that their customer experience is markedly improved when they use an app to call a TNC versus picking up the phone to call dispatch. It gives them predictability, and because of the density of cars that is available, it also gives them a reliably short period of time from when they ask for the ride than when the ride shows up. So our goal was to try and have some kind of platform where that could be provided uh, for the cab companies as well, so that consumers could go see that density of cabs, know that they could reliably get a ride within five minutes, and see that cab actually coming towards them where they were. Um, that is something that is still underway. There is a, not a uniform agreement um, among the cab companies that that is necessarily the best way to proceed, and so there's a process in place for us to sort of work through that. Um, I will point out that when, when UberX first launched in Los Angeles, um, they actually cost more than a taxi cab. But because they had improved the user experience, um, they captured and actually created a new market for their trips. And they really took trips not just from cabs, but from transit, from biking, from walking, from driving, from everywhere. Um, so we have a lot more to understand about how to continue to help the cab companies be more competitive and level the playing field. The other bucket of places where we are focused is improving the driver onboarding process and the overall process of um, participating in regulation. So the, the software that we use at DOT um, was literally installed during the Reardon administration, I believe. Yes, during the Reardon administration. Um, it is quite out of date. Um, it is uh, no longer, uh, we can no longer get updates on it. Um, and so last year we made a request through the budget um, to get an allocation to improve that system. Um, we were not successful in that request, but we think we have found a bucket of funding to at least improve the driver permitting portion so that as much of that can be done online as possible and people don't have to come and stand in line um, in, the, in the plaza um, over at 100 South Main Street in order to be onboarded. Um, we have not taken on the issue of uh, vehicle uh, sort of um, certification, evaluation, inspection, um, but there are certainly, I'm not sure that um, from a liability perspective we'd want to outsource all of it, but there are certainly ways that we conduct our current business that could be improved. For example, cabs are currently required to come down and be inspected. We might change to uh, one idea that is um, out there that we could report back on, is that um, DOT inspectors might go to the cab companies and just say, today's your day for your vehicles to be inspected. We have a stack of decals. We're going to do it all in one shot. You don't have to send your drivers down here to wait in line, sit on the street. Um, out on Los Angeles Street. So those are the things that, those are some of the things that, um, that we're currently, currently looking at in order to level the playing field. Good afternoon. I may add that um, we're reviewing a lot of our rules right now to bring them up to date. We're going to have meetings through the Tax Cap Commission and with the industry. And we have a lot of rules on the books that have been there since the 70s and the 80s. And they need to be reviewed. Uh, currently, right now, a high priority is, is redoing our taxi cab driver exam, which still um, requires drivers to go through uh, a, a map book, <laughs> which you can't even buy anymore. So, so uh, there, we are reviewing all these rules all the time, and we're going to be updating them as well. I, I did want to point out one other thing um, that we do have for 
for the cabs, we do require them to have either uh, safety partitions or security cameras in every vehicle. Right now, they're up to about 80% of the cabs have uh, uh, cameras. Uh, prior to the, the mid-90s, when we asked them, we forced them to uh, put in partitions, we were losing a taxi cab driver once every year and a half. That was the average going back a couple of decades up until that point. So you know, driving a vehicle for hire can be, can be a very dangerous occupation. So it, it's important. We've always thought, and the, the commissions have thought that uh, it's important to protect the safety of the drivers as well as the public. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions from my colleagues for our Department of Transportation? Uh, sure. Mr. Mr. Bonner. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you again for your testimony. It's a, uh, a little sense of deja vu since we talked about this a little bit in Transportation Committee Sorry. last week. Uh, no, it's all good. Uh, I wanted you to revisit what you said about the uh, period of disqualification again for uh, offenses when a background check is done. Uh, I, I understand you to say that there were two different buckets, um, just as there are two different buckets in the NEVA. They're for different stuff, but two different buckets. One is for a, a ban for life, and another is for how long? The other is just um, if you have had a misdemeanor conviction in the last seven years. You cannot drive a cab. Okay, seven years. Which seven was years. A, also a time frame for some offenses in the airport in Ewa. Correct. Um, uh, there was some talk about the, the issue of leveling the playing field. Um, taxis and uh, rideshare companies, the uh, app-based companies, are different but similar. And there's been talk about the need to level the playing field. We just approved a, an extension of the concession agreement uh, with uh, the franchise agreement with the taxi companies by three to five years, did we not? Two years at least, yes. Two, two years at least, but an option to go to, to five, I believe. And uh, sort of central to that was efforts and plans and studies to help level the playing field for the taxi industry, wasn't it? That's correct. Uh, and you mentioned a number of different things that we can consider or that we can do. Um, other than the allowing the rideshare companies to pick up at LAX, is there anything we have done to level the playing field for the rideshare companies? So we have not um, asserted jurisdiction over the rideshare companies in any way up until this point. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is there are ways in which the taxi industry has competitive advantages, and there's ways in which the rideshare apps have competitive advantages. We're now spending a lot of time and energy trying to uh, help level the playing field for where the taxis have a competitive disadvantage. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, but uh, we're, we haven't done anything other than this airport action to help level the playing field for where the rideshare apps have their competitive disadvantages. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Corcoran. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. Um, so the TNCs have said often that their private uh, background check system is, makes them the safest rides uh, available um, and are, that they are at least as safe as a taxi cab ride. You're the general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. Would you support replacing the Department of Transportation's background check system with that used by Uber or Lyft? Not without significant uh, review and evaluation and comparison. Our uh, background check is consistent with what peer cities do. It is what we consider state of the practice. And so to step away from that um, and do something different from our other peer cities would require um, some significant justification and also uh, a very high bar of reassurance that we would be getting the same or better service by making that change. Thank you. Quick follow up for Mr. Bonner. Go ahead. Um, if we were to, uh, it's sort of the, the opposite of that question, if we were to tell all of the rideshare companies are regulate so that they have to add the taxi background check standards, so that they have to do both. Um, what would you think about us putting both sets of background checks on the taxi industry? 
Please. Well, I would say that currently we don't ask the taxi companies to perform any of their own background checks. We do that service and we charge them for it. And so I would argue that um, there's always a, there's a positive aspect to having checks and balances and having a third party involved um, that is a public entity in doing those kind of checks. So I would say um, I'm not sure what the material value would be of asking taxi companies to do in addition to the fingerprint check that we already do, um, doing uh, what I understand the TNCs do is a social security number check um, of uh, various databases. So, um, you know, I think that, that if we were going to do that, that would be something that to be consistent, we would, we would decide to take on. Well, the background checks are conducted by the California Department of Justice and the FBI. Great. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate you being here and uh, being part of the discussion. We may, may bring you back up at the end, but uh, uh, thank you again for, for your time. Thank you. Please hold your applause. Thank you. Um, next, we've invited several ground transportation operators to provide testimony. Uh, before I ask anyone to the table, I want to remind all presenters, this is an opportunity to discuss your operations. Uh, it's not a time for making disparaging remarks toward other operators. Um, in the, the idea for equity, we have, we're going we're gonna to bring up for 15 minutes representatives from Uber and Lyft who are in support of the BOAC decision. Uh, and we're going to give them 15 minutes to make their presentation and divide it equally. Uh, and then after that, we are going to have 15 minutes of presentation from uh, the taxis and the limousine folks, representatives. We'll have public comment at the end. Uh, and that's going to be divided with 10 minutes for the cabs and five minutes for the limousines as, as previously agreed to. So first, I'd like to, to bring up um, we're going we're gonna to start with Uber, but why don't I have the representatives from Uber and Lyft all come to the table to save a little time, and we'll do the, the questioning after both, of, both, group, both parties have made their presentation. So I'd like to ask uh, Ial Gutentag, I may have mispronounced that, the uh, LA General Manager, as well as Steve Seiger, the Uber Policy Council, and Derek Seibert, Safety Strategy and Planning Lead, uh, to join us at the table from Uber. And then also we're going to have the Lyft folks, which is Joe... Akpaku, who's public affairs, and uh, Bakari Brock, the airport manager from Lyft. So we'd like to start out, uh, and if I could get the, the clock to be set to seven and a half minutes. Um, we'll, the members will have time to, to ask you questions afterwards, but for your presentation and for, uh, as previously agreed, and for equity, I'm going to have to limit you to the, to, to the seven and a half minutes and limit Lyft to their seven and a half minutes. Uh, I can't see the clock. Is there a way to make it pop up? The timer. It, the, t the presentation will be seven and a half minutes. I can't see the clock. But I can't see the clock. So if you could flip the clock up so we can see it. The, the not not you, not you. The, the, the sergeant. The sergeant will. So we can see the timing on the clock. Mr. Chairman, we also submitted some slides. I just want to make sure that those are available. The, they're they're available, I believe. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCosser. Thank you, Chairman. It's right. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, is the slide presentation ready? Yep. Okay. Great. So, we'd, we'd like to. Uh, the clock says eight. If we could set it for seven and a half minutes. Uh, so I have to be. Uh, otherwise, I have to give both sides sixteen. I have to be fair on on this. We don't have the ability. Okay. We're going to go for sixteen minutes for both sides. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, go yeah. ahead. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, appreciate the time. I'm Eyal Gutentag, uh, the general manager of Uber here in Los Angeles. Um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you stated at the outset the objective of having a substantive discussion. Uh, certainly to meet that, uh, I will address the suggested topics that you raised around rider access, safety and background checks, customer service, geofences and data accuracy, should we have the time. Certainly my colleagues and I would welcome additional questions on topics we don't have time to address. Um, so if you advance the slide, first just some quick context regarding Uber's impact here in the city. Here in LA alone, there are over 30,000 driver partners earning an income on the Uber platform. Uh, in just one year, those drivers provided over 25 million safe and reliable rides to people in our city. 
And almost magically, they did so with an average wait time of under five minutes. Next slide. Thank you. Uber was created to ensure access to a reliable ride anytime, anywhere, for anyone. Our technology ensures that drivers cannot discriminate based on where a rider is going because drivers do not receive that destination until the trip is started. So here on screen, you can see this in the samples of what riders and drivers see on their phones. The driver's app on the right does not show the ultimate trip destination until the trip begins. We are committed to serving every part of this city. As you can see on this slide, although it's a bit hard to read the numbers, our trip completion rates are consistently around 90% across every district in Los Angeles. And frankly, we are proud of the way this fairly new technology is able to reliably serve all 15 council districts, including South LA and other places that were referenced earlier by the Department of Transportation as being more challenging. In our efforts to serve anyone, we're also taking a number of steps to serve those with disabilities or special needs. We have introduced a number of products to serve these individuals, such as Uber Assist, which offers drivers who are trained to assist older adults and people with disabilities, and Uber Wave, which offers rides with wheelchair accessible vehicles to those requiring them. We're proud of these advancements. We've also launched other advancements for those that are vision impaired, deaf and hard of hearing, or need service animals. And we look forward to continued innovation that serves all of our fellow Angelinos and certainly all visitors to our city via LAX. So a few council members have asked questions about Uber's approach to safety. I'd like to take a few minutes to address those, because I believe there may be some mis misinformation floating in the room. At Uber, a background check is just the beginning of our holistic approach to safety. Our system builds in safety before, during, and after every trip. To ensure safe pickups, when a driver accepts a ride request, the rider sees the driver's first name, their photo, their license plate number, and a picture of the vehicle. If the riders and drivers need to contact each other, their phone numbers are anonymized. This is important as it protects both rider and driver privacy. When the trip starts, the Uber app allows riders to easily share a map with their location in real time with friends or family. We use GPS to keep a record of where a driver goes throughout the trip. And this monitoring creates accountability. Accountability that creates a strong incentive for good behavior by all parties. There's also no cash involved in the transaction which as mentioned earlier, is particularly important for driver safety because carrying cash can make them a target. But we don't stop there. After the ride, both the rider and driver will rate each other, creating a continuous feedback loop. And customer support is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for any question or concern. Now that you better understand our holistic approach, I'll address background checks specifically. Before a driver can use the Uber platform, they go through an extensive screening process. That background check is similar to the process used by other companies you know well, like UPS, Care.com, the largest provider of in-home childcare services in the country, and the Girls and Boy Scouts. It goes through several steps. Step one, a potential driver begins the sign-up process by providing their full name, their date of birth, their social security number, a copy of their driver's license, their vehicle registration, proof of insurance, and proof of a completed 19 point, sorry, 19 point vehicle inspection. Step two, a background check company that is accredited by the National Association of Professional Background Screeners runs a social security trace to identify the addresses associated with the potential driver's name during the past seven years. Step three, the background check company runs a criminal background check to search for his or her name and addresses in a series of national, state, and local databases for convictions in the last seven years. These include the Department of Justice's National Sex Offender Registry, national criminal search, and several different databases used to flag suspected terrorists. Shown here on the screen is a list of the factors and offenses, most of them, we couldn't fit them all on a, on a slide, that disqualify a potential driver from using our platform. This is not an exhaustive list, but as you can see, the primary criteria for disqualification are extensive. And we certainly share a hard copy so you can see those better. Step four, if the check identifies a potential criminal record, the background check provider sends someone to review that record in person at the relevant courthouse, or if possible, pulls the record digitally. This is important. I hope you remember this. Verifying criminal records at the source helps ensure the records match the identity of the potential driver and that any arrest truly resulted in a conviction. Step five, the background check also pulls the MVR or the motor vehicle registration file associated with that driver's license number. And this is provided to check for driving violations and incidents. 
So only after the potential driver applicant passes all of these checks are they given access to the Uber platform. While we believe our system stacks up well against the alternatives, no system of background checks is 100% perfect. That's because first and foremost, past behavior may not accurately predict how people will behave in the future. And second, no system in the US has a 100% accurate record of the past. It does not exist. As the LA Times recently editorialized, quote, just as Uber's background checks aren't foolproof, neither are those done by taxi companies. Next slide. Sorry for the interruption. We see this firsthand when taxi drivers who have been through a fingerprint background check using a technique called LiveScan, which many of you have referenced today, apply to use our platform. So what does the data show? Last year, at least 600 people 600 people who told us they previously drove taxis in California, and over 200 of them were here in Los Angeles, failed, failed our background check. These drivers were not given access to Uber's platform, but may continue transporting passengers via taxi to this day. Additionally, the FBI database and the state databases against which live scan fingerprints are matched include arrest records for people, as noted earlier, who were never charged, let alone convicted. This known issue often flags innocent people unfairly discriminates against them, and prevents them from earning a living. As the data shows, live scan fingerprinting is far from a perfect solution. As I wrap up, I wanted to address some of the technical questions raised by the committee and the chair about the NILA. I'll do so quickly. As you heard earlier from the airport, LAWA will require TNCs use advanced geofence technology to accurately record all trips to and from LAX using the platform. And our technology will work with the geofence to ensure that only those partners within the airport waiting area will be matched with travelers who request rides at the airport. This will help to minimize congestion and ensure compliance. The NILA also contains several provisions that outline how LAWA can audit TNCs and ensure the accuracy of the data that we provide. In short, they're not just trusting, but they are verifying as necessary. We believe that the NILA permit passed by the LAWA board is a tough, stringent, but generally fair agreement. Okay. It's onerous in parts, I'm almost done. No, you, you've got, you got your time. We'll, we'll have a chance to ask you questions. I'm just saying we urge the council to approve the board's decision. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have the representatives from Lyft. Again, it's not, not that I don't want to cut anybody off. It's just otherwise we add up the time for, for everyone. But we will ask you questions, and you will get a plenty, uh, plenty of chance to speak. Uh, so now we have the presentation from our, our Lyft representatives. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Good afternoon, council members and Chairman Blumenfeld. My name is Joseph Okwaku, and I'm the Director of Public Policy for Lyft. On behalf of Lyft, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Los Angeles is one of Lyft's first markets, and we are very proud of the service that Lyft drivers have provided to countless Angelinos and visitors, and we are excited about the prospect of expanding the service to Los Angeles residents and visitors at LAX. My colleague, Bakari Brock, our airports director, is also here today. He has been integrally involved with the discussions with LAWA, and he'll be speaking after me on some of the specific details of the NILA agreement. I'll be focusing my statement on how Lyft accomplishes its commitment to safety as well as broader operational issues. I'd like to start by briefly discussing Lyft's mission, which is to mainstream carpooling. Our goal is to fill all the empty seats that go unused in cars, especially here in Los Angeles, every single day. Carpooling is firmly embedded in our DNA going back to Zimride, the company that preceded Lyft back in 2000, 2007, which allowed college students to safely and efficiently share rides with each other for years. After launching Lyft in 2012, we have already seen this mission become a reality with Lyft Line, which allows different passengers to share a ride to a common destination or along a common route, and particularly with driver destination, which allows drivers who are already going to a specific destination to receive ride requests from people, from only the people who are going the same way with a minimal detour. None of these benefits or other benefits like reducing instances of drunk driving would have been possible if our rides were not safe, which is why safety is Lyft's number one priority. Lyft takes a comprehensive approach to safety and we firmly believe that combining historically proven security measures with innovative new approaches, Lyft has set a new bar in terms of passenger safety. One aspect of Lyft's comprehensive approach to safety is the background check of Lyft drivers. Lyft is contracted with one of the foremost background check companies, a company known as Sterling Back, Back Checks, to implement a screening process that is extremely thorough. This process includes 
an enhanced nationwide criminal search against hundreds of millions of records from all over the country, a search of the federal criminal court records, something that is rarely, if ever, required in the for hire vehicle industry, and something that is critically important given the nature of federal crimes like kidnapping, drug trafficking, and bank robbery. The search also includes the US Department of Justice sex offender registry, and very significantly, we also search county court records. And I'd like to focus on this for just one moment because this is critically important. As was mentioned a little bit earlier, national criminal, criminal databases like the FBI fingerprint database are passive collectors of criminal disposition information, which basically means that their reliability and accuracy depends upon counties and states to transmit timely and accurate arrest and conviction data to them. And to that point, I'd like to quote an excerpt from the 2006 US, Attorney Gen uh, U.S. Attorney's Report, which said, and I quote, common, contrary to common perception, the FBI system is not a complete national database of all criminal history records in the U.S. Many state records, whether from law enforcement agencies or courts, are not included or have not been updated. Because of inconsistent state reporting requirements, some criminal history records involve offenses that are not submitted to the FBI. Other records that were submitted to the FBI do not have fingerprints of sufficient quality to be entered into the system. Moreover, many criminal history records may contain information regarding an arrest, but are missing the disposition of that arrest. Currently, only 50% of arrest records have final dispositions. So in order to make sure that we get the most up-to-date information, our background check goes directly to the source, to the county, to validate anything detected during the search of the National Criminal Database. And then we'll do an additional social security number trace to generate a history of where an applicant may have used that social security number using things like utility bills, vehicle registrations, property deeds, things of that nature. And that will generate another list of counties and we will run the county search again just to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Lyft also does a DMV search on all, on all applicants. We screen out any driver who has three or more minor moving violations within the last three years or one major violation within the last three years, a major violation being something like driving on a suspended license or reckless driving. There's no question about the importance of a background check, but we also believe that a background check is not the only component of a holistic safety process. Because a background check cannot and does not deter or prevent, prevent future misconduct. This is where Lyft has used technology and innovation to set a new standard for safety. First, Lyft provides a level of transparency that previously has never existed. Lyft does this by providing the rider with a picture of the driver, the vehicle, and the license plate number of the vehicle before the rider ever sets foot in the car. Lyft uses GPS tracking for every Lyft ride, and Lyft now allows passengers to give their friends or family members the ability to track their ride while it's in progress in real time. Lyft also has a real-time rating system that allows the reporting of any safety issues. This includes a database of thousands of keywords that trigger an immediate review by our 24-hour-a-day trust and safety team. As an example, if a, dri if a passenger were to leave a comment saying, I had a great ride, my driver took me to the drugstore, the word drug would trigger an alert. The point is, is that Lyft can respond immediately in real time to a potential safety issue. We can suspend a driver from the platform quite literally with the push of a button. And because of these systems, drivers are strongly incentivized to provide a safe, enjoyable ride. With these innovations, Lyft has removed the anonymity typically associated with for hire transportation and has implemented a system that promotes a level of responsiveness and accountability that has never existed before. This is why less than 0.004% of all rides have resulted in an investigation. And to be clear, an investigation would include the drugstore example that I gave, the drugstore example that I just gave you. This is also why 60% of our riders are women and 30% of our drivers are women. Lyft also uses the in these innovations to ensure that drivers are providing equal access to all neighborhoods. When a Lyft driver re receives a request for a ride, the driver does not know the destination until the rider is in the vehicle so that the driver cannot simply choose to refuse a ride based upon the destination. Ben Jealous, the former president and CEO of the NAACP, recently made the following comment while discussing the continued prevalence of discrimination in ground transportation, and I quote, the most exciting alternative is ride sharing. Ride sharing companies like Uber and Lyft manage to be both more efficient than traditional taxi services and more colorblind. Using an app, anyone can get a reliable ride whenever and wherever they are. 
So in closing, as I stated at the outset, safety has been and always will be Lyft's primary concern. Lyft drivers have provided millions upon millions of rides in 29 different states, and our record speaks for itself. It is our hope that we can expand these benefits to LAX so we can serve the millions of people, both Angelinos and visitors, people who are accustomed to being able to request a lift at other airports in California and across the country. Thank you for your time, and Bakari Brock now has a few words as well. Good afternoon. My name is Bakari Brock, and I'm the Director of Business Development for Lyft and Head of Airport Operations. Uh, in our brief few seconds, I would just like to thank the committee and the staff for, act, for, for allowing us to discuss this issue today. We look forward to providing additional options at the LA airport. I'd also like to emphasize how hard over the last 18 months, President Burton and the commissioners, Mr. Martin and staff, Ms. Lindsay and now Executive Director of Flint have worked on the NILA process. And we believe that the compromises made on both sides reflect the commitment that Lyft has to bringing safe, affordable transportation to the airport. Great, thank you. Thank you all for your, for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to get us, please hold your applause, thank you. Uh, I'd like to get us started with sort of the, the one of the big questions that's out there that people talk about, you know, wearing a belt and suspenders. While it's a, a fashion faux pas uh, in the scheme, when you're talking about safety, sometimes it, it makes sense. And there have been the folks who have suggested, well, since neither system is perfect, why not have folks do both? If you could address um, the efficacy of that and, and, and whether or not it's something that consider or think is good. Thank you for the question, Council Member. My name is Derek Seiber. I work with Uber on the Trust and Safety Team out of San Francisco. Adding to our already thorough background check, the live scan fingerprint process would largely be duplicative. Um, you know, when comparing background check records, when comparing the two types of processes, you're looking at arrest records on the fingerprint side, and you're looking at courthouse records on our side, with the type of background check that we're actually doing. We believe that using those courthouse records is the most accurate, fair, and just way to do a background check because you're not clouding the air with potentially, dis, dis, um, potentially discriminatory uh, data. Okay. Any additional comments on that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yes, I'd like to add on to what Derek just said. Um, I think, you know, one of the things he mentioned is that there is a very real, you know, cultural issue with respect to fingerprint background checks. Uh, this is something that um, the Green Landing Institute, uh, which you may be familiar, has recently opined on about the fact that the fingerprint process does have a, a tendency to disproportionately impact communities of color, and that's something that we are concerned about. I do repeat the point that Derek made that we believe the uh, search to be duplicative of what we're also doing. But the other point that I'd like to make is that um, and it goes back to the original point that I made it in my statement that Lyft is really trying to mainstream the idea of carpooling. 78% of Lyft drivers across the country drive 15 hours a week or less. And here in Los Angeles, 60% of our drivers drive five hours a week or less. People are really doing this on a part-time basis, whether it's between jobs, while going to work, coming home from school, what have you. So in order to have services like Lyft Line and Lyft Destination work, you need to have a critical mass of drivers available to provide that service. And adding unnecessary restrictions and barriers to entry, such as the time it would take to go to the DMV and wait in line and get your driving abstract, or the time that it would take to go and get a fingerprint background check, would have a disproportionately negative impact on the ability to add drivers to the platform with very little corresponding, if any, public safety benefit. Okay. Um, separate, another question about the reporting requirements. Is how hard would it be um, to add a, or not reporting requirements, but the feedback mechanisms that you have, to add a feedback loop that, um, from the app where you could directly uh, comment to LAWA as well as comment directly uh, to your respective organizations? Is that something that is, technologically uh, possible and desirable on your end? I, I can take a crack at that, uh, um, Council Member, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Steve Sager. I'm a policy counsel at Uber. Um, there are obviously engineering challenges with uh, making adaptations to um, our application. Um, one thing in that direction that we have done in, in other, uh, other cities and states around the country that have had a similar interest is to uh, include contact information for LAWA directly within the app or, or on our website or both. 
so that uh, in addition to providing feedback to us, they can provide, uh, riders can provide feedback directly uh, to the regulator, in, in this case, Lava. Okay. So I've, I've learned uh, in this position to always assume that something uh, that requires a technical change is always harder than I think. Uh, that being said, um, I know there are other jurisdictions where we have been able to include a link on our receipt, uh, which is sent out to passengers immediately at the end of the ride to whatever the agency may be. So I, I feel comfortable saying that. With regards to actually programming the app, um, that is probably but something that's been done, certainly could be done in LA if we wanted to, but it's, it's something you're saying that has been done in some cities. Yes. Okay. Mr. Bonnet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thanks to uh, both Uber and Lyft for, for coming here today and, and testifying. Uh, appreciated the information you provided. Also got to say, appreciate the service you provide. Uh, as a member of uh, uh, the Metro Board, as we expand the rail system, I really think that both of your services are going to be an integral part of first and last mile to get folks to and from a lot of our transit stops. Uh, folks are sort of hungry for the service you provide. Uh, I know Mr. Kokorian had an odd experience with uh, a driver on one of your services, um, and maybe you want to address that, but um, uh, I'll say my experience has been different. When I got married last year, my aunt came to town, used Uber all the time. She said it was like having a different tour guide. My mom and my sister were just in town. My mom took Lyft to the airport, was a little baffled why she couldn't take it from the airport, told her I was working on that. Uh, my niece used it to, to get around back and forth to the Grove. I could track her progress and make sure she was safe and stuff like that. So really appreciate what you're doing. I wanted to ask Uber to elaborate a little bit more on the, the stat you listed in, in one of your final slides about over 600 people who told you they drove a taxi previously, uh, 200 of whom said they did so in LA, uh, failed your background screening process. Can, can you tell me a little bit more uh, about that? How, how could someone have passed a live scan but get dinged by your system? Where do you have a higher standard? The, the fails are due to a number of different reasons. We listed some of those reasons on our blog. Some of them were for moving, moving violations. Some of them were for more serious types of crimes. We have turned over all 600 plus of those background checks to the CPUC. We're not releasing any specific details yet for privacy concerns. But basically what you're arguing is that in some cases you have a, well you have a different standard, in some cases yours is higher. Correct. Okay. Uh, at Lyft, have you had, uh, oh go ahead. So I, I was just going to say, if I may elaborate, um, a, a second point here is that, uh, to circle back on what Ayal led with, bluntly, no background check system is ever going to be 100% perfect, and that's why we don't rely solely on the background check and have built in these other aspects of our system, the real-time feedback, every track, every trip being tracked uh, uh, by GPS, and, uh, and it sounds like Lyft uh, has something very similar in place. Uh, you both mentioned that there's a problem with the live scan service. I think you both mentioned it, in that you can be arrested and it'll show up, but it won't show that you were acquitted or exonerated. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, have either of you had uh, particular examples of that, screening a, a driver uh, who, who you dinged and they said, no, 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 I was not convicted of that? Council member. Our vendor, when providing us with background check results, is not going to show us simple arrest records. They're going to do their diligence. They're going to go to the actual courthouse and make sure that they're providing us with a record that has an actual disposition date and conviction. So we don't encounter that problem. And, and what do you do if, say I've recently moved to California mm -hmm. from Massachusetts. You're not checking the Suffolk County Courthouse in Boston. So what do you do about an offense I may have had out of state, say, three years ago? We would actually check that courthouse. It's, it's a very, very detailed process. It starts with the Social Security trace, as they all mentioned. We're going to pull address history dating back seven years. And once we have that address history, our vendor is going to either tie into the courthouse electronically, but in most cases, they have to send a court runner directly to that courthouse to pull those records. So no matter where you live, especially within the last seven years when applying to drive on our platform in California, we're going to visit those courthouses and pull those records. Okay. Uh, what if I... Uh what if I committed a felony while I was vacationing in Florida? I don't have an address there. How would you catch that? 
It's a great question, Councillor. We use several databases to close the loop there in case you're traveling through a county or a place where you do not establish residence history. The National Criminal Database is one of the databases that we use. It is subscribed to by all 50 states. There's over half a billion records in it, and it's considered an industry standard for that type of search. And in addition to that, we also tie into the federally maintained PACER database, a database also subscribed to by all federal courts to, again, close the loop on that type of scenario. The answer is very similar for Lyft. The, there's a term of art in the industry known as the vacationing criminal that describes the situation that you described, and our background checks are simil similarly designed to ensure that we are checking for that as well. And are there instances where uh, the live scan system doesn't catch a lot of that stuff? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can think of at least two offhand. One is the live scan system is, of course, fingerprint based. So for many uh, violations in certain jurisdictions, uh, people are cited but never fingerprinted. That could happen at, for example, a DUI checkpoint, which is very relevant to this kind of, uh, in, in this line of business. Um, the second e example here is that um, certain disposition uh, records are, are never updated. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bonnie. We'll sure. Want to keep it moving? If you have additional questions, I'll come back for a second round. But uh, Ms. Martina. Mr. Chair, do your drivers pay for the background checks or do your individual companies pay for them? We pay for the checks. Both, both of your companies? And my second question, so I saw that your companies recently decided not to register with the San Jose Airport. Can you talk a little bit about what kept you from, from entering into or agreeing to their terms, I should say? Sure. Um, so let me start by stating that you know San, the San Jose Airport decision was a relatively recent one. Prior to that, we've had successful negotiations, and my colleague Bakari can speak to this, with numerous airports, not only in California, but across the country. Um, the San Jose Airport decided to impose uh, a couple of requirements, not only a fingerprint-based uh, background check requirement, but also uh, another requirement that was frankly very much overlooked that was very burdensome, which would require each individual driver to get a city business license. If you look at the Bay Area market, there is no specific San Jose market. It's a broader market than that. So we're talking about people who may live as far as 50, 60 miles away who would have to drive uh, along the 880 or the 101 or the 280. These are highways that, that, if you're not familiar with them, are fairly crowded. It would take a long time to get this business license just for the opportunity to be able to drop off or pick up at the airport. As a company, it is more important to us that we provide good service. We would rather provide no service than offer a service that is going to be poor because the system is set up in a way that the majority of our drivers are not going to have the time or be able to afford the time to go through that process. So we had to draw the line with San Jose and not apply for that permit. I would only echo uh, what my colleagues uh, from Lyft uh, I just said. I, I would also add that, as has been pointed out several times today, um, we are, of course, uh, a fairly new industry, um, and things in this area continue to evolve, um, and, and things change day to day, so we're always open to uh, additional conversations with the San Jose Airport and other airports around the country. Um, we just launched uh, at Oakland Airport last week. Um, we reached an agreement with the Albuquerque Airport uh, after that. Uh, we're at Portland, we're at uh, San Diego, we're in San Francisco, uh, and the list is growing nearly by the week. Um, so we're very hopeful to uh, continue to engage in discussions with San Jose as well. You. you mentioned all these different airports. Are there requirements, maybe outside of California or others, that are more onerous than what we have in California that we should know about? That, that's a fantastic question. So just to be very clear, we operate at over a dozen airports uh, around the country, um, including uh, San Francisco. Um, uh, actually, I, I do have a list for you guys, but just for the record, uh, Oakland, John Wayne, um, and outside of California, such as Portland, Denver, Austin, and Nashville. We, we do believe that while we've made some compromises with LAWA, and, and that's been challenging on both sides, um, it is one of the more uh, restrictive permits that, that we've agreed to um, around the country. Is there one that was, is more restrictive? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Uh, not to mine uh, either. I, there are always differences in these airport agreements. Uh, the airport counterparts at SeaTac said the other day, once you understand how one airport works, you understand right. how one airport works. Um, yeah. and, and, and that does hold true. I think there are sort of 
nuances to each airport, for example, where the holding lot should be set up. But um, the, the general setup is, is very much in line what, with, uh, with what Lawa proposed here. Right. Mr. Kerkorian. I'm still struggling a little bit on the fingerprinting issue because I heard you say you think that it's duplicative. Okay. Why not just announce great news, public? Uber is now using duplicative security background checks and we're going to do fingerprinting. In other words, why does Uber and Lyft refuse to have fingerprinting background checks as part of their business, to, even to the point of losing the ability to participate in the airport that is the center of Silicon Valley. While it may seem that there would be a benefit of adding yet another background check vendor, we believe that by exposing ourselves to those arrest records, we're just putting our applicants in a position to be discriminated against. And instead of investing time and resources into yet another background check vendor, we're investing that time and energy into innovating with safety in providing safety features that occur you know, both during and after the trip. I would also add, just reiterating the point, the background checks are where safety begins, but certainly as you've heard from us, it should be far from where it ends. And this holistic approach to safety, much like earlier, the Department of Transportation was telling you that there are elements of the TNC business model that they are now encouraging taxi to adopt for efficiency purposes or other things, we hope that one day we'll have a conversation where there are elements of our screening process and our safety process they're also adopting. One last point. In, in, many, mar go ahead. No, go ahead. in, in many markets where, where taxi companies do do fingerprints, there are outlined appeals processes for these situations that arise where just an arrest record is shown and not a conviction. Right? These appeals processes direct the applicant to go to the courthouse, spend their time, spend their money to get the actual courthouse records that determine or that show whether or not a conviction was, was had or a disposition date exists. We believe that we're doing that at the get-go. We believe that we're going straight to the source. We don't need to insert an intermediary that has our applicant take on a lot of that process on their own. We believe that we're, we're taking a comprehensive approach in the beginning. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, um, I'd already spoken about the, the potential barrier for entry, and so I reiterate that response, but I, I also mentioned uh, another aspect of this that I would like to elaborate on a little bit. I had mentioned um, the Green Lining Institute and um, a letter that they had written to uh, the San Jose City Council and Mayor on this very issue. And if you don't mind, I'd just like to quote a couple of excerpts from that letter. First of all, they note that about half of Lyft drivers self-identify as a member of a minority group. And then they go on to note that the US Justice Department has found that African Americans and Hispanics were approximately three times more likely to be searched during a traffic stop than white motorists. And while different racial and ethnic groups use illicit drugs about at the same rates, people of color are far more likely to be arrested. They also noted a 2013 National Employment Law Project report that estimated that errors with respect to criminal disposition data, quote, affect 600,000 workers a year. It can be expensive and take several months or longer to get mistakes cleared off your record, disproportionately burdening, burdening low-income applicants. So the, this is a very real issue in terms of the impact that it can have on, on the disparate impact that it can have on different cultures. So I just want to make sure that that is, uh, that is fully stated, that that is a legitimate, that a real concern of ours. Sure, and that's a legitimate concern about you know, fairness. Um, but I, I think what I'm really hearing here is it slows down the process of bringing new drivers in because um, you know, you're having to do these additional steps. It's inconvenient for the part-time driver to have to go through that. I, I think that's what I heard, heard you say a minute ago. If they're only doing 15 hours a week, it's going to discourage drivers to sign up if they have to go through these extra steps. Um, but I guess I have to say, you know, the city of Los Angeles, if, if somebody, if you want to go and volunteer in my neighborhood park five hours a week, you're going to get a live scan. You're going to get a DOJ background check, and you're going to be fingerprinted to volunteer uh, to help out in my city's parks. Um, if 
you know, that's good enough for us to do within the city. And by the way, the Department of Transportation spends 88 bucks for its full live scan background check and everything, 88 bucks. I've got to believe that instead of going out and spending hundreds of dollars in bonuses to sign up new drivers so you can add more drivers in anticipation of your IPO, it might be a better idea to spend a little bit more money on background checks to make sure that my constituents are safer. That's my view. Any response to that? Okay. Is there a question? No, I think it's a comment. Mr. Bonin, you said you had an additional question? Mr. Buscano, any additional questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, please stick around. We may have additional questions uh, afterwards, but we appreciate you being here and taking the time. Thank you for taking the time. Um, Thank you very much. Please hold your applause, Mr. Spindler. Um, next, we have, uh, we're going to bring up uh, folks from the taxi uh, industry and from um, the limousine industry. So I'd like to invite representatives from the taxi industry to the table. Tim McCoster, attorney for City Cab and Yellow Cab. Bill Rouse, the general manager of Yellow Cab. Frank Campbell, the security consultant for LA Legitimate Transportation Companies. And as well, to come take the table, um, although we're going to first hear from the taxi folks, um, do I have a list here of the representatives from? I don't have the names from me, but we'll have the, the representatives from the, the limousine company can come up. Well, since we have well, one of the limousine company folks, why don't you come up as well and take the table? That way we'll, we'll parody the way we did it with the others. So combined, we're going to have 16 minutes. Um, we're going to have 11 minutes for the taxi cab, five minutes for the limousine to create parity. And we'll start, um, again, it, you report to us about how the taxi industry handles operations of waiting lots, the accuracy of transponders, data, trip fees, driver passenger safety, social equity, uh, customer service, all of those issues we, we'd love for you to address. Sure. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Tim McCosker, Glazer Weil, representing City Cab and Yellow Cab. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here as, uh, as part of this important discussion. I appreciate the way you've set up this, this uh, discussion. You're going to he hear from Bill Rouse in just a minute about some of the operations, and you all know Bill. You're also going to hear uh, from Frank Campbell uh, so much of this debate, who is sitting here to my right, my left, your right. Uh, so much of this debate has been about, about public safety and about background checks. We thought we'd go out and get an actual expert uh, to speak to these issues. Uh, Frank is an attorney and a, and a, safety, and a, a, a public safety consultant. He was the uh, five years as the assistant general counsel to the FBI, and he served nine years as a deputy, uh, deputy assistant city attorney general for the United States in Washington, D.C., has testified before Congress numerous times on issues such as background checks, public safety, counterterrorism, and, and, and other issues. He will be available, of course, to present and also to answer questions. But I will turn now to Bill Rouse. Good uh, afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Council. William Rouse, Yellow Cab, and here authorized to speak on behalf of the nine franchise taxi cab operators in the City of Los Angeles. The letter submitted by Council Members Kerkorian and Koretz lists a number of important uh, issues that the NILA should address before being finalized. We agree with all of them. However, I would like to draw your attention to two points. First, the, the NILA's allowance of app off, app on insurance guarantees that sometimes no insurance will be in place uh, for TNC drivers and LAWA will be totally exposed. This happens when, the, uh, when drivers turn the app off. In addition, where multiple uh, carriers may be involved, those carriers will disclaim coverage and we will see coverage battles leading to uncompensated uh, individuals. Requiring uncompensated uh, injured parties, requiring 24-7 insurance while on airport property is the only way to protect LAWA. That is the reason why LAWA requires it on every other vehicle authorized to pick up at LAX. LAWA re should require the same certainty and documentation uh, of the TNCs that it requires of every other vehicle. 
Second, the geofence system that has been authorized by the NELA is deeply flawed and has been shown at SFO, and it has been shown at SFO that one company manipulates it to, to violate the rules for its own advantage. Requiring transponders on all TNC vehicles is a low-cost alternative, $40 a vehicle for the right to operate at LAX, that law, and guarantees that LAWA will have an independent means of tracking TNC vehicle movements just like they have with the thousands of other vehicles authorized at LAX. This independent, verified source of data will ensure that LAWA gets properly paid for all TNC trips under the NILA, that LAWA will have accurate data for traffic management, and that will also allow LAWA to evaluate the accuracy of TNC reporting. I will now turn it over to Frank Campbell, who is one of our nation's leading authorities on background checks. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the tremendous value fingerprint checks of the FBI's National Criminal History Record System uh, add to licensing and employment screening programs. The FBI fingerprint check has two big advantages over other background screening solutions. First, the FBI check offers nationwide coverage. The FBI's master criminal file has fingerprint supported criminal history records on over 70 million unique individuals. And it's the world's largest biometric database. The records come from all 50 states and territories and all 3,000 counties in the United States. The information submitted by the states relates primarily to felonies and serious misdemeanors. The system has access to not only records maintained at the national level, the FBI system, but also automatically retrieves additional information kept at the state central repositories. A civil fingerprint check for licensing and employment typically also includes a check of the records of the central state repository in the state where the check originates. Simply put, the FBI's national system is the most comprehensive single source of criminal history information in existence. The FBI's average response time for civil fingerprint checks is three hours and 32 minutes, and its fee for the check is currently set at $12.75, in addition to the state fees for processing the check. The FBI system now ha also offers what it calls a wrap back service that can notify licensing agencies of criminal history activity involving a licensee, such as a subsequent arrest or conviction occurring after the initial fingerprinting check. It is important for criminal history checks to have nationwide coverage to avoid possibly missing a relevant record in a different state. Testimony before Congress in 2008 by the private security guard industry noted that when California implemented FBI checks for security guards in 2003, nearly 15% of guard applicants were denied licenses based on criminal convictions for sex offenses, robbery, and battery outside of the state. Even when the FBI check returns an arrest record without a final disposition of the charges, that provides the adjudicator a lead to finding relevant conviction information that might otherwise be missed by a non-national check. And I might add that uh, the, the uh, comments about the FBI systems uh, having arrest records with no disposition uh, the, the report that mentioned it being at the 50% level at the FBI level doesn't really take account of the fact that it, that also the, the check, FBI check also pulls disposition information from the state level, and many of the states have uh, disposition completeness levels of 70 to 80%. The other important point here is that when the FBI record goes um, it goes to a government agency, not to a private employer in these kinds of circumstances. And, uh, and the FBI rules require that state or local officials making the licensing or employment suitability determination give the applicants an opportunity to complete 
or challenge the accuracy of the information contained in the FBI record. Um, and and they're, they're also advised that they cannot deny the license or employment based on information in the record until the applicant has afforded a reasonable time to correct or complete the record or has refused to do so. The other major advantage offered by the FBI check is the positive identification of fingerprints. Professional background screening firms like the ones mentioned by and used by the TNCs are limited to checks using names and other non-unique personal identifiers which present the privacy risk of false positives, which is when a person is incorrectly matched to the criminal record of another individual with a similar name or other identifiers, and the security risk of false negatives which is when a criminal record is missed because of incorrect identifying information used in the search or, or is in, in the criminal record itself. False negatives occur when name checks fail to find a record uh, because the individual provides inaccurate information at the, uh, either at the time of arrest or when applying for the job. In response to pressure from users of the FBI criminal history system to allow name checks of its records because they were cheap and fast as compared to fingerprint checks. The U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI did studies in 1997 and 1998 to determine the accuracy of name checks of the FBI system as compared to fingerprint checks. The studies confirmed the vulnerabilities of name checks. The DOJ study found that name checks produced a 5.5% false positive rate and an 11.7% false negative rate. For the false negatives, the study found that the names on the applications were sufficiently different to indicate intentional use of false names to avoid discovery of records. This use of false names were confirmed by two studies of the, that the FBI did in 1997 and 1998, comparing the names on a year's worth of fingle, uh, civil fingerprint cards with those on records matched by a fingerprint check. In contrast to the matching errors that can result from name checks, the FBI's recently upgraded fingerprint system has an accuracy rate of 99.6% in matching a person to their record, regardless of the name and other identifiers used on the application or at the time of booking. Thus, the positive identification of fingerprints yields accuracy and integrity and record matching that name checks can never equal. In short, fingerprint checks prevent fraud. To wrap up our, our comments, thank you very much. To wrap up our comments before we turn to the other providers, there's nobody here saying that TNCs are not going to the airport. They are going to the airport. And there's really nobody in this part of the table saying it's going to be a level playing field. It won't be. What we are saying is that when the PUC adopted this self-enforcement rule that's very, very light, they appropriately carved out airports because of the significance of this asset. When they carved out airports, they said that you could regulate. And you are regulating. And the staff has done a, a, a valiant effort at providing regulation. And we come down to a few key issues. And one of the key issues we spent a lot of time on today is background checks. And the information you've gotten on the validity of the other background checks is just not true. And the answer to the question, why not do it? With the live scan, you go back farther than seven years, and you also go forward. You go back farther than seven years, and you go forward. If somebody decides to become a bad guy after the first check, you find out with live scan. And you owe it to your mother, you owe it to your daughter, you owe it to your spouse. Thank you. Please hold the applause, and now we'll hear from the other providers of limousine folks. And uh, we'll, we'll have five minutes on the clock for them. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Joey Phelps, the executive vice president of Empire CLS Worldwide Chauffeured Services. I appear today on behalf of Kevin Illingworth, president of the Greater California Livery Association. Today, I urge you to vote in support of the motion to send the LAX NILA proposed for TNCs back to the Board of Airport Commissioners for significant modification and to direct the airport authority and administration to crack down on the TNC's ongoing illegal operations that are compounding the gridlock traffic conditions at LAX. This has been a tough summer at LAX. The central terminal area has often resembled one giant sig alert. 
The parking structures we depend on for connecting premium travelers with their chauffeured vehicles are frequently filled to capacity. Drop-offs uh, of our clients on the upper level roadway are equally difficult. We often find the access ramps to the upper level closed due to gridlock traffic conditions as well. My point here is that LAX cannot absorb the additional congestion and confusion resulting from TNC serving LAX under the conditions and procedures set forth in the NILA. Precious roadway curb space must be reallocated and vehicle access to the central terminal must be reevaluated in line with <clears throat> what the roadways and parking structures can realistically accommodate. We want to work with the new airport administration on development of a NILA based on real world conditions present at LAX. The new executive director of LA World Airports was not on the job when the proposed NILA was drafted. We think it's unfair to impose on her a TNC permit program that begs for fresh eyes and a collaborative development process. Moreover, the NILA in its current form does not accomplish Mayor Garcetti's goal of a level playing field. Limousine companies cannot accept having to, pay, having to buy paper trip tickets from a cashier in an off airport holding lot, while TNCs drive in and out of the airport through an untested, unenforceable geofence scheme. Until and unless we have the level playing field Mary Garcetti promised, it is not reasonable to move forward to permit TNCs at this airport at this time. I trust we share a belief and concern that all passengers departing and arriving at LAX be provided safe, convenient, customer-friendly, and responsive ground transportation companies permitted to operate here. We believe any TNC permit program should be strictly limited, to, limited as to the number of vehicles and drivers, and such a program be a temporary a pilot program in order to assess its impact on safety, security, law enforcement, and the environment. I urge yes votes on the motion before you today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Richard Druyan. Um, I'm a partner in the Los Angeles law firm of Shepard, Kim, and Harris. I was formerly the chief of the criminal division for the U United States Attorney's Office here in Los Angeles. I've also served as general counsel of the Rampart Independent Review Panel and the Citizens, Citizens Commission on Jail Violence. I've been the president of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners, and I was a member of the Mayor's Blue Ribbon Panel on Airport Security. Um, based on my law enforcement related experience, and my review of LAX security issues as a member of the Mayor's Blue Ribbon Panel, I believe that all drivers who pick up passengers for hire at LA should be required to undergo a background check that includes fingerprinting to uncover criminal histories and that provides LAWA and the uh, Los Angeles Department of Transportation with immediate notification of any future arrests. Background checks for sensitive government positions have always involved fingerprinting to ensure that government agencies have the most accurate information about the backgrounds and criminal histories of the persons they hire for these positions. In my law enforcement related experience, I've never heard anyone question the accuracy or reliability of fingerprint checks. The standard that government agencies use for sensitive positions should be the same standard that the city should require when the issues are passenger safety and the security of LAX. It is imperative that passengers be protected from un unknowingly accepting rides from drivers with criminal histories who will jeopardize the physical safety of these passengers. In addition, these drivers will frequently be driving around the horseshoe, which many security experts believe is the most vulnerable part of LAX to a potential terrorist attack. Although it is impossible to eliminate access to the horseshoe altogether, knowing the criminal histories of drivers who frequently pick up and drop off passengers at LA, LAX provides an added layer of protection for the airport, as well as for the passengers who hire these drivers. For these reasons, I believe that all drivers who for hire at LAX should be required to undergo fingerprint-based background checks. Thank you. My name is Cheryl Berkman. I'm president and CEO of Music Express Worldwide Limousine. I'm actually here. They both have pretty much summed up everything I was here to talk about. The last month, um, we have been in accidents with Uber. And unfortunately, both of our, the accidents that we were in, Uber was not insured. They were uninsured. Okay. I know my time's up. Thank you. No, I appreciate that and appreciate the comments. Um, I'm going to start questions with the, uh, the limousine folks because um, we're talking about background checks. Do, do, are the limousines currently required to provide background checks? Uh, I mean, not background checks, uh, fingerprint, live scan fingerprint? We are not currently required to, um, but unlike 
the TNCs, we're more than happy to do it. But are, are you currently using LiveScan? We are not using LiveScan. So do you feel that your service is currently, uh, that the people who use your service are in danger? Uh, no, the, the business is a very different business model from the TNCs. Uh, the proof is in the fact that for 35 years in business, doing over 3,000 rides a day, we've never once had a criminal activity with one of our chauffeurs and a passenger. Um, it's a very different business from the TNCs. However, again, as, the, um, as was discussed earlier with the PUC, there is right now some talk about that going into place, and we are completely on board with it and ready for it to start and ready to implement it company-wide and industry-wide. So to date, it hasn't been a problem, but you're saying prospectively it's something that you would, you would welcome if it were done across the board. But you're advocating that it be done specifically to TNCs and not to all the other NILAs? Uh, to date, it hasn't been a problem for our segment of the business, which is an extremely different segment, segment of the business than the TNCs are serving. Okay. Um, wanted to give the, the taxi folks a chance to respond to something that the, the Uber uh, and Lyft folks talked about. They, they talked about 600 drivers uh, failed the, who passed the taxi test failed the, the background test, and if you could uh, respond to that. Um, thank you, Councilman. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you raised that and gave us an opportunity for a response. Uh, you know, this uh, it has been uh, a, a campaign of sort of sleight of hand uh, where we've seen the TNCs uh, and the taxi industry and their PR machine. Uh, no details are coming forward. No actual facts are coming forward. When our industry saw Uber first come on the road, we protested to our regulators that some of the, some of the drivers who had been disqualified as taxi cab drivers because they had had a criminal conviction and then therefore became disqualified as cab drivers eventually went on to drive Uber. And many of those uh, uh, of their earliest drivers were, uh, were rejected from the taxicab industry. Our own drivers could name them by name. We categorically deny that, um, that uh, these drivers came out of our fleets. Why do we do that? Because all of our drivers are fingerprinted every two years by, uh, by LADOT. Um, Uber should be required to provide those names and, and, uh, and allow this this claim to be investigated or the claim should be completely disregarded. What has gone on, in fact, is that drivers who should have been, uh, who should have been disqualified from the TNCs have gone on to assault passengers. It's happening over the last year and a half at a rate of about three per month. And the problem here is, is multiple. There's four different points of failure. One, which we've all focused on, is the sufficiency of the background check. Um, the, um, a background check that only checks for seven years is insufficient. The next is the question of whether the, the local manager ever even ran the background check. There is no guarantee that the background check was ever run. The next is if the background check was run, did the local manager actually apply the proper standard? There's no guarantee of that. And the final one is their standard in the first place, which is this seven-year bar. So, so, uh, so we've had uh, drivers who are uh, third strike felons whose convictions are more than seven years and they're allowed to drive. And uh, that has been documented, uh, well documented, unlike the, uh, the claims from the other side, which are wholly undocumented. And so that's where the problem is. On, on the seven year, is there, I've heard different things and it's really a point of information. Is there a state law that prevents you from uh, prohibiting someone to be employed if, it's, if the crime was seven years earlier? So Im importantly is, uh, for, um, for the committee to realize is that we are not our own gatekeeper. And, and um, Ms. Reynolds referred to it earlier about the value of having a third party do the evaluation. We are not our gatekeeper. LADOT, this city, and ultimately you on the council are the gatekeeper for our drivers. We, do, we may have an incentive to get a driver into, into the system, but there's gonna be a third party, we care about safety as well, but there's gonna be a third party watching this who's executing it. That is not the case on the other side. But if someone had been convicted of a crime eight years ago, can you legally bar them under the current regulatory schemes? 
if the um, if the, the the government is running the background check for licensing purposes, it can go back as far. Uh, as far as they want. If it is a private um, background check uh, along the lines that Councilmember Kokorian referred to, perhaps there's a law, I don't know, that, that limits it to convictions of seven years. But, but, but the question really in front of us all is what does a prudent company do to reduce risk to its passengers? This is about reducing risk. It's not about eliminating risk. And, and Hireese's we website, the company that Uber uses, says that they will be more effective at screening out drivers if you use a fingerprint in addition to the name-based background check. That is a system that, that, that their own website says is more effective, yet that company refuses to adopt that. Can I add? Um, my, my understanding is that the um, the commercial background screening companies have to comply with the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act as well as State Fair Credit Reporting Act. <clears throat> and generally speaking, I think for physicians that pay under a certain dollar amount, you can only go back seven years under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And uh, also under the, under the uh, California uh, law, uh, a credit reporting company cannot supply information about arrest without a disposition in, as part of a um, uh, report. Now, when, when a, a municipality or state passes a law that authorizes an FBI fingerprint check, that is not subject to the fair credit reporting laws. That there is no limit on how much or how far back the information can go. So they can see old uh, older arrest information and older conviction information. They can use the arrest information to find more complete conviction information that might be relevant, just as was described by the Los Angeles. Um, and, and they can legally partner. bar somebody because of that information. Yeah, based on the criteria that they set. And, and each agency that is the authorized agency for purposes of getting the FBI fingerprint record uh, has to have their own criteria that they use for adjudicating a person's qualifications. And as I understand it, the LA Department of Transportation has created its own set of criteria. Yeah. Mr. Campbell, you, you were talking about the disposition, I thought it was interesting, disposition completion level in various states. Um, and I think you said it was about 70 percent on average. Do you know what it is in California? I do not. I don't know specifically what California's is. Because it's a it's a relevant fact in in my mind in terms of you know we're trying to avoid the false positives uh, for some of the green you know some of the things the Green Line Institute mentioned um, you know and the lower that number is the more dip, the more false false positives you'll have and the higher that disposition number is the the more security we have around around the fingerprint so I don't know if I, I'd like to get that information at some point in the future but it's well actually I think the fingerprint eliminates the false positives because. It's not going to take a, a similar name and use I, it to I mean in terms of, identify it with In terms the of um, having somebody who was arrested but not convicted, so you don't have the dis disposition of that crime known. Uh, when you ha if you're capturing a lot of people who are arrested but not convicted, um, you're capturing a lot of people that, that maybe should be allowed to be drivers. Um, well, and I think the process described by the L.A. Um, Transportation Department indicated how they handle arrests. They generally don't um, dis disqualify a person based on an arrest alone. Uh, right. and, and I assume that if it's for a, an offense that might be disqualifying if there was a conviction, they do try to find out whether, in fact, there was a conviction because, let's face it, it would be irresponsible not to find out whether the conviction took place. Sure. I, I would add it's a, it's a problem that the city manages thousands and thousands of times a year. Let's not forget that at the airport, everyone who is serving in the terminal is fingerprinted. For every single police permit issued in the city of Los Angeles, every single police permit, you do live scan fingerprinting. The outlier is the circumstance where you're willing to accept an outside vendor called Hiree's to run a name and a social security number. That's the outlier. Let's not mistake this. The outlier is not that you're trying to treat TNCs like taxis. The outlier is this circumstance where you have the authority, where you have the legal authority. It would be the only instance I know in the city 
where you do not do live scan fingerprinting. Following my own rules, I'll now turn it over to one of my other colleagues, Mr. Kikori. Thank you. So I, I just want to make sure I understand some of the differentiation here. In the live scan process with a DMV employer pull notice uh, situation, that's, that's what I think the, at least the cab drivers uh, are subjected to. Is that right? I don't know about the, the limo drivers, but you yeah. have... You have a DMV pull notice so that if, there, if after you do the initial background check, two years later somebody gets a drunk driving conviction, you know about that. So th there are two completely different um, systems. Um, unlike the background check where we're not, uh, um, we're not authorized to receive the background check information that LADOT does for permitting, um, each, uh, each uh, taxi company has what's called an employer requester code. Uh, and then we uh, include the driver's name and driver's license number identifying information on the pull notice. We receive those notices directly. Perhaps LADOT receives um, those notices as well. But that's similar to the wrap-back service. So once the driver's in the system, if there's any activity on the motor vehicle record, then, then we receive immediate notice of it, uh, any, including um, uh, serious arrests such as DUI or reckless driving. Um, similar to the background check uh, fingerprint, which is that wrap back thing where if there's a subsequent uh, arrest or other criminal activity, then but uh, we wouldn't receive that LADOT would. Okay. And if you don't mind me to jump yeah, sure. in um, quickly, the, the limousine industry is on the poll notice program as well. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the reason I asked that is we heard earlier that uh, Uber uh, said that there were these several hundred uh, former cab drivers who failed their security check. So, and we don't have any specifics on that, but is it at least possible that some portion of those cab drivers qualified to be cab drivers because they had no criminal convictions or other uh, blotches on their record at all at the time they became cab drivers? And then some amount of time passed and they got a DUI or they got a subsequent conviction that was caught by this background check and security system that is in place for cab drivers, and that's why they are no longer cab drivers. Is that at least possible? Well, we think that's actually highly likely. Um, other likely scenarios would be that the driver was, uh, was not licensed by a locality that actually exercises any scrutiny. Another possibility is that the driver was never licensed at all. In other words, he was a bandit taxi cab driver. And another, uh, um, uh, another possibility is that it's really actually not really true. But even if it is true, I mean, even if it's entirely true, um, it seems to me that probably some significant number of those cases, and we'll never know because we don't have those cases, but it's because the system is working. Because the background check system is working in eliminating people from driving cabs who are convicted of subsequent offenses or yeah. have other DUIs or something. And those scenarios would be those similar to what I reported on, which was where in the early days of Uber, our drivers were coming back and reporting to us by name those individuals who had been disqualified from driving taxi cabs who were now driving for Uber. So Thank exactly. You. Thank you. Mr. Bonner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple questions. Uh, there was a question asked a little bit earlier of the, by Mr. Kikorian of the representatives of the ride sharing companies about belts and suspenders. Uh, if we have two different standards, why is it so difficult, or, or why do they oppose adding the fingerprint checks? Um, would uh, the uh, taxi industry have any problem adding the same background screening process, having the city add the same background screening process uh, that the PUC requires for the rideshare companies for the taxi industry? Well, uh, the, the short answer is absolutely not. This city makes those policy decisions for the taxi industry. We are regulated by you and we comply with all your regulations. The, the longer answer is that somebody needs to really examine what exactly the Public Utilities Commission does. Well, because what happens is that, is that a, a company will apply for a TNC license, make all the promises required by the TNC license, but the TNC has very little scrutiny okay, about but, the actual execution. But, but, but that's, that's not my question. There, there are two different screening standards, uh, and I, I submit that they 
are different and that one is not qualitatively uh, uh, better than the other. Some people will disagree with that. But some people think fingerprinting is better, better so the rideshare companies need to have fingerprinting as well. Fine, I'm cool with that, uh, as long as we do it for everybody else who operates at the airport. By the same token, then, uh, you'd be okay then with me reopening the franchise agreement that we just did so we can add in the same requirements for duplicity and belts and suspenders for the taxi companies. Uh, um, council member, I, I'm not sure it's required to reopen the franchise agreement uh, to deal with background checks. The background checks are covered by the taxi cab rule book and uh, so I would imagine that a rule book uh, changed by the commission would be sufficient to accomplish that task. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll look into that. Wanted to correct one thing that was said earlier by one of the witnesses, uh, and Lawa can add to this if, if they're called back up later. Uh, but I was heard that um, uh, Lawa is liable if a TNC operator turns off their app and gets into an accident. Uh, I'm told that's not true. The TNC's private insurance kicks in when they turn off the app, uh, and that Lawa is not liable in those cases. So I wanted to correct that. Um, I wanted uh, to ask a question uh, I, I'm to sorry. Mr. Campbell, um, if I could. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Campbell, thank you so much for being here. I yes, understand you welcome. came all the way in for, from D.C. for this. Yes. Uh, I assume you're not here as a volunteer. You're being paid to be here? Yes. Uh, and your flight was paid for? And okay. Yes, I'm, I'm a paid consultant. Okay. He still gets the, the furthest travel award. He I does. want to make sure that you got that. So you get the furthest travel award. So uh, your firm is Highland Strategies. Yes. And uh, on your website, you tout that you're accredited by the National Association of Professional Background Screeners. I partner with a, um, because my firm uh, works in the area of background screening, I work with both um, the government sector that has the ability to access FBI fingerprint checks uh, in the authorities that are govern th that access, which is fairly limited, as well as the private sector, which has, does not have, generally does not have access to FBI background checks. Right. So I, I partner with a, uh, a company uh, in, here in California that uh, provides uh, finger, excuse me, uh, consumer reporting agency checks for private employers. Okay. Uh, but your website does tout the accreditation from... Yes, the absolutely. Okay. Uh, so uh, I wanted to mention then, because uh, they've been brought up in this discussion, uh, that the executive director of that organization wrote uh, an opinion piece in Roll Call newspaper in December, uh, disputing the idea that fingerprinting is the gold standard for employment screening, uh, saying they take issue with that assertion and that in reality the FBI database is far from perfect and should never be regarded as the most reliable source for comprehensive or accurate background screening says the FBI database was designed to generate investigative leads based on fingerprint evidence, not to produce employment screening reports. In addition, the FBI repository is neither universal nor considered reliable as a single source for background screening purposes. In a 2006 report, the FBI acknowledged its fingerprint-based repository is limited. It's missing disposition information in about 50% of the records. The low number exists because many counties don't consistently report their, their records to the state law enforcement. It says the majority of the records in the FBI system are for minor infractions, and the FBI's database does not contain up-to-date sex offender registry information. Importantly, the FBI report also acknowledges, quote, users may not want to reply, re rely exclusively on an FBI and state repository check and may also want to check other record sources such as commercial databases and local courthouses to obtain more complete and up-to-date information. Goes on to talk about the risks of relying just on fingerprints as, as a system and says the same risk does not occur with searches completed by professional background screeners who are required to adhere to the Federal Credit Reporting Act and go directly to the courthouse to ensure that they have complete information, which sounds to me a lot like the system that the rideshare companies were talking about they're using. Well, um, I, there are a number of um, observations there I would take issue with. Um, I mean, the idea that uh, the FBI database ha is made up primarily of non-serious offenses is really the opposite of the truth. Uh, most of the information that was, has, is submitted by the states is for either felonies or serious misdemeanors, and that was the rule 
uh, for a, a long time because uh, non-serious offenses, uh, they, they wanted to limit the, the amount of information they were receiving because it was all based on paper cards. Now that uh, you have electronic um, fingerprinting and uh, record keeping, they'll take it all. Um, but uh, primarily, the, the information in the system is for uh, felonies and serious misdemeanors. Um, sex offense, as far as a sex offense registry is concerned, uh, the sex offense registry uh, has information about individuals who have convictions for sex offenses, and those convictions are going to appear in the FBI rap sheet. Uh, so, uh, you know, to say that you have to check the sex offender registry uh, doesn't mean you're, you know, because you're, and one of the reasons you'd be doing that in, in the, the non-FBI check context is because the, the sex offender registry may have a, a record that you're going to miss because you're going to jurisdiction by jurisdiction checks of, uh, of counties. So there's, there's certainly a value add w for the commercial industry to check the sex offender registry, but the FBI check would include it in, in the rap sheet. Um, and as far as the, I think I mentioned before that the FBI disposition completeness, um, it, you know, as far as what's at the FBI level uh, itself, it doesn't tell the whole story because it does have a system for uh, retrieving the more complete disposition information available at the state uh, repositories. And a recent GAO study indicated that at least 20 states have in, in excess of 75 percent completeness of uh, dispositions associated with their arrest records. Uh, and, um, and finally, uh, I think the FBI has observed it was observed in that GAO study that you'll never have 100% complete dispositions because certain arrests are pending. They're, they're always um, going to be open until uh, a conviction actually occurs. So um, uh, I think that, and, and the other thing I think you really need to uh, focus on here is this whole question of name checks. Uh, and, and if you take a look at this name check efficacy study that was conducted by um, the Department of Justice, um, excuse me. It did a study that uh, compared name checks to fingerprint checks. It, it used as its sample 93,000 public applicants, uh, uh, applicants for public housing in the state of Florida. And they did a parallel name check of, of, the, of the FBI records and a fingerprint check. And they found that of all the hits that they got identifying a record, 11.7% of those criminal records uh, would have been missed if by a name check only search. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that's very significant. And the other thing to remember is that the name check presents privacy um, hazards as well because of similar names you can have false positives where you get incorrectly associated with another person's criminal record when you have common names. And that was 5.5%. And my, also my understanding, having worked with individuals who, who work uh, with ex-offenders and help uh, individuals in the employment situations, a lot of litigation uh, in, uh, involving the consumer reporting agency industry is for misidentifications of an individual with uh, a wrong cr criminal record. Um, so uh, that is one of the main benefits that the positive identification the fingerprint provides. Um, Significantly, the, the FBI uh, also did their own studies uh, where they looked at their rap sheets for a year. And uh, they had 6.9 million in 1997, 6.9 million fingerprints submitted. They got 600,000 hits from for fingerprints. Um, 70,200 of those, or 11.7 percent, reflected names that, that were different than those listed on the criminal record. So, uh, which suggested there's a certain amount of intentional um, uh, uh, use of false names to avoid detection. Uh, they also did another survey of a hit, hit survey, uh, and they found that 14% of child care applicants uh, found to have a criminal record used a name on the application different than listed on their criminal history. And 11% of school-related applicants found to have a criminal record 
use the name on the application different than that on a criminal history. So I, I think that's just really compelling uh, reason to try to incorporate a fingerprint-based check of criminal records because you're going to find records that name checks simply will not identify. Thanks. And it, it can be <laughs> not just because of the application, the, a false name put on the application. It could be a, because of a false name given at the time the person ar is arrested. They give a nif different name and go through the whole system under a different name. Th thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate the testimony. I appreciate your, 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 your comments. Okay. Uh, I, I find more compelling the written unpaid testimony of the National Association of Background Screeners. Uh, and I will be uh, printing uh, that uh, commentary and article by them and submitting it to the record and making sure it's available for the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Talking about the, um, the background checks, uh, another question. One of the, the criticisms that's made of the live scan has to do with the speed in which states report and uh, the, the TNCs are saying, well, their system is better because they proactively go to those courthouses and get it, and that the fingerprints group, you have to wait until they actually report it. What, what is your feeling about that? Well, uh, I'm not sure what they're, whether they're, re they're referring to waiting for a conviction, a piece of conviction I think uh, for data, re or reporting whether it's the, the arrest uh, a record in, in the fingerprint associated with the arrest record. Um, but my understanding is that uh, the current system is that when, when a police agency or law enforcement agency arrests and fingerprints someone, they, they upload that information into the state central repository, and that information is almost immediately sent up to the FBI to, to, to give a national access to that information. And, and obviously there's a, there's a strong interest in, in doing that because law enforcement officers, when they encounter people during their, their uh, job on the streets, they want to have accurate information about individuals they encounter. Um, now, I mean, we've had a discussion already about the issue of, of com completeness of disposition information. And um, as I mentioned, the FBI check will check not only what's at their level, but will pull information that's available at the state level as well, which is generally more complete. In addition, when you do a check such as the taxi drivers do here, they check what's at Cal DOJ, and they'll get that information as well. Um, and, and then there's a process, a process that requires the governmental agency, the third party governmental agency that's receiving this and doing the licensing. They have, to, they have to give the individual an opportunity to um, uh, challenge the accuracy and completeness of the information before they deny the license or employment opportunity. Um, one other question having nothing to do with background checks, the transponder issue. Um, in, how does the city know that the transponders in your vehicles are actually transmitting accurate and, uh, data and accurate feeds? Um, the taxi cabs are each equipped with a transponder, but the uh, taxi industry has a very extensive and accurate trip monitoring system that uh, where the taxi cabs pass through the holding lot. It's all um, totally electronic in real time. Uh, the dispatch process uh, involves the issuance of a ticket. That ticket is checked by the starter. Um, and then um, that ticket is ultimately given to the passenger. Uh, if you've taken a taxi cab out of the airport, um, you would have received one of those tickets. Um, what the reason we know that the airport's um, uh, transponder system is accurate is because the number of trips that they count approximates the number of trips that uh, that the taxi industry reports. As it turns out, the taxi industry system is actually more accurate and reports slightly more trips each and every month. But LAD, uh, uh, um, but LAWA still nevertheless requires this secondary system just to make sure of the accuracy of our reporting. And that's why we're saying uh, that that is a low cost, uh, would be a low cost benefit to LAWA uh, for requiring the same system uh, with, uh, with uh, the TNCs. Thank you. Members, are there any additional questions for um, the, the providers, existing providers? No? Uh, j just curious if um, 
if uh, representatives of the taxi company uh, know whether or not any of the uh, taxi companies have uh, made appeals to the Board of Taxi Cab Commissioners to uh, overturn denials of someone's license uh, due to a felony conviction? Um, I'm not aware that the cab companies have ever made an appeal to overturn a felony conviction. I am I'm personally aware of an instance where Yellow Cab went to bat for somebody who was several months away from the seventh anniversary of a petty theft conviction. Uh, and um, it was just months away from the seventh anniversary and, and uh, we made a in, sort of in, in the interests of justice uh, um, argument um, that this particular driver, given his character, uh, should be allowed and the, and the commission uh, granted that and, and we believe that that is a, a great part of the due process that's there. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you, thank you all very much. Um, we're, we're moving along. We've been, it's been a very long hearing and I, I appreciate uh, everybody's indulgence in that. I want to give uh, all the members a chance if there's anyone you want to bring back to the table for a follow-up question, although we had plenty of opportunities to discuss it. I want to, I want to now offer that opportunity to members. If anybody has a follow-up question, wants to bring up any of our expert witnesses, you're welcome to. Mr. Buscaino. And, and <clears throat> if I can, Mr. Chair, thank you, sir. And by the way, Bob, great program. Um, really um, acknowledge um, your, your effort here in bringing uh, these key testimonials before our TCT. Um, Would you like representatives to from Uber, if I can have them come up. I had a question. So we, we could have the Uber, Lyft representatives come up, the TNC representatives. And forgive me if I miss this, if you already addressed it, but um, out of uh, all the applicants, um, what's a percentage of those uh, that do not clear the background check in the state of California? Council member, it's roughly 25 to 30%. And what are the main purposes of the, of, of those, of the 25, 30% of why they don't clear? I would say that roughly 20% of those are on the motor vehicle report. Uh, five to 10 are a result of criminal convictions. Very good. That's, that's the question I had, thank you. Okay, well, while you're here though, a, a second question. It was brought up the issue of transponders by the, uh, by the other providers. Could you respond to that issue of whether you're open to having transponders, whether you think it's a good idea, a bad idea, redundant, or what have you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I can take a crack at this, and I suspect Kari may have, have something to add. Um, the issue of transponders, from our perspective, is not whether transponders themselves work. It's whether they're appropriate for the TNC operation where an individual is driving his or her personal vehicle. So if you think about your average TNC driver, they could be at the airport for any number of reasons. They could be at the airport because they're picking up their brother or their sister or their mother or their father. They could be at the airport because they're driving uh, on the Uber app. They could be on the Lyft app. They could be on the sidecar app. And if the transponder's in the car, the transponder doesn't know the purpose of uh, why the individual, why the driver is at the airport and can't distinguish between the, the different uh, purposes. So the geofence system that LAWA has built into the permit and that has uh, proven itself to work well at other airports solves that problem by using the applications that we're already using that already track trips and ensuring that each, uh, each trip on an individual application, whether it's the Uber app, the Lyft app, is recorded by that TNC and then reported at the end of each month um, by the TNC to the airport. And of course, um, with any self-reporting system, there needs to be a verification mechanism. And LAWA has uh, built in uh, significant and stringent audit provisions to the NILA that would allow them to uh, ensure that we are, in fact, accurately reporting our trips. Great, thanks. Thank you. We'd also like to uh, echo uh, Uber sentiments. Um, our primary issue with a transponder is, is that it truly is agnostic as to the purpose as to why you're on the facility. So as, as they just mentioned, whether it's a personal trip, whether you're on our platform, whether you're on the Uber platform, the transponder just frankly doesn't know. And I'd, I'd also like to um, sort of set the record straight necessarily with, with regards to the geofence. Now, given that there are some issues that, that both, I think, companies have with the SFO 
uh, data reporting structure, but on a high level at all of our 14 airport partners, we from the TNC standpoint have established a geofence and, and we believe that, that that accuracy is, is, is uh, more than enough for the airport to, uh, to properly assess fees and we've not received any negative feedback uh, as to our monthly re self-reporting process. Okay. Thank you. Uh, members, any additional questions for uh, any of our expert witnesses that you want to call up? Um, see, just, uh, quickly, Mr. Corian, go ahead. Thank you. Quickly for this panel, uh, first of all, on the geofence, I think this is a, is, I think that the geofence is a great idea, and I especially want to applaud Mr. Bonin for you know, helping his constituents in the area of LAX by um, working with the airport commission to develop this concept. I think it's a great one. Um, the, the one question I have on the waiting area, I don't, don't remember what, we, what the term of art that we called it was, but the waiting area um, before the geofence is penetrated, um, would it be your understanding that drivers in that waiting area would be in um, the uh, phase one, I think, uh, for, uh, for purposes of insurance, they, they're, um, uh, the phone is on, they're waiting for a call, they haven't received a call yet. That, when they're in the waiting area, in the area adjacent to LAX, I assume that they would be subject to the lower insurance level than they would after they've gotten um, a ride request and confirmed it. Is that right? So, so that's actually another piece of misinformation that you heard. Uh, from no, I haven't heard earlier. it. I'm asking the question because oh, okay. I don't know. I thought of it and I don't know the answer. I haven't heard anything about it. That's why I'm asking the question of you. But thank you, sir. And, and I was actually just responding to the gentleman who said that um, we don't have insurance necessarily on property during that period one. Uh, for what we do for all of our 14 current airport partners is that we endorse a million dollars from the, the time our wheels are on the property until we depart, regardless as to whether the app is on or off or regardless as to whether we're in periods one, two, or three. Okay, but in the waiting area, you're not yet on the property. You haven't entered the geofence. So that's why I'm asking the question, because when, you, when, ride, when drivers are waiting in the waiting area, mm -hmm. they haven't received a call yet, but presumably they're driving in and out of there. If they run somebody over and the city gets sued, um, the driver's basic insurance will apply, I assume, and um, I don't know whether your indemnification obligation would kick in or not. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how, how that works compared to, inside the geofence, I think it's crystal clear. Um, but it's in that waiting area that I'm worried about. Uh, absolutely, I'm happy to take a crack at this question. Is, is this on? Uh, it's just a little bit closer uh, to you. No, there you go. Thank you. Um, happy to take a crack at this question. Um, a minor technical issue is that I think some part of the winning air actually is on airport property, so the million dollars would apply there as well. Okay. Um, but assuming some of it is off of the airport property, then background state law would apply, and under AB 2293, which is a passed last year, um, as the representative of the PUC said, uh, TNCs are required to have uh, coverage of 5,130. Uh, she didn't mention that they're additionally required to carry $200,000 in excess of that. Okay. Um, and that 100,000 plus 200,000 is pretty comparable to the 300,000 that uh, taxis in LA are required to cover. Well, okay. Isn't it entirely, the waiting area entirely on LA, off, maybe Lawa can answer that. The, the staging area, is that not, you can give us a thumbs up or thumbs down, is that not entirely on airport property? Or is it more comfortable? Actually, why don't you come to the mic? I, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> not fair to give you a thumbs up or thumbs down, but go ahead. Um, there are properties owned by the airport inside that area, but there are a lot of public streets that are not Lawa property. To be crystal clear, I, I think the, the biggest point is that there is insurance in effect, regardless of you know where a car is, you know precisely whether it's airport property or a public street. Right. And when it's on the airport property, it's in the, the highest level, is that correct? Yes, sir. Correct. Yes. So if you turn off your, you drop your, you drop your passenger off, even on that drive out of the loop, if you get an accident, that's the highest level. Correct. Yes. Okay. Additional questions, members? Great. Thank you very much, panel. So um, we're now moving to the, the, the next phase um, of this, this year. We're going to move to public comment. Before we move to public comment, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, what's going to happen after public comment and, and to spell out a few things and, and offer members a chance to put forward ideas that they might want to have because 
what we're required to do under the 245 is to vote up or down on the, um, to reject the BOAC decision or not to reject the BOAC decision. That will be the last vote that we take on this item. Um, however, along with that, um, we're going to have a committee report. And a committee report um, which, which can have all sorts of recommendations that are related to the 245. The decision on the 245 uh, is not contingent on those recommendations uh, in any way, shape, or form. The, 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 the decision on the 245 is an independent decision, but the committee does have the ability, and we're going to exercise that ability, to uh, offer recommendations as part of a committee report. But what we need to do is get those recommendations stated out publicly prior to public comment to be absolutely in compliance with the Brown Act. We're still in compliance either way, but it makes it crystal clear. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I, I've been writing down a number of, of uh, motions that I'm, I plan on making after public comment that would um, be part of the committee report if a majority of the members approve it. Now, you can approve these items on the committee report and vote yes on the ultimate 245, or you can approve this, these ideas and vote no on 245. So voting yes or no on the motions that we put forward is completely independent of how you vote on the ultimate question of the 245. But what it's important, so I'm going to mention the ones that I have. If other members have other ideas that they want to include in the committee report, we're not going to discuss them now. We'll discuss them after public comment, but I would ask that you make them clear now so that the public has that chance to respond to them. Um, and ultimately, I mean, when I have about six of them, uh, and what other members have them, we can vote on them all on block if it's a consensus item. In fact, I'm going to propose them all on block, but then uh, any member who wishes to pull any one of them out for any reason will be granted that, that privilege, and we will pull uh, any one or all of them out and vote on them individually. So that's the, the general form, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by, by letting you know the ones I've written down, the motions that I plan on making uh, as part of the committee report. But again, we're not going to discuss them now. We're going to discuss them after public comments. So some of the ones I'm going to, or the ones I'm going to break. One is to request that LAWA come back to, to TCT in six months and one year with a status report on how ground transportation operations are going at LAX, including the geofence, TNC, taxi, limo driver citations, and NILA infractions. So that's, I think, is a fairly much of a no-brainer, but you never know. So that's a report back that we're going to request of LAWA. Uh, a second one is going to be to direct LADOT to draft a plan. Uh, well, I skipped that one. I'm going to come back. The, the second one is to direct LADOT to draft a plan to streamline taxi regulations, uh, something that they indicated they may be already doing. Um, and that's, that's fine, and that could be part of what they're, what they're already doing direct them to do that and, and to look into some of the issues we discussed. Third is uh, a recommendation that, that the council formally support AB 1422, which is the bill that allows TNCs to participate in the DMV pull notice program, something we discussed um, that would be good for TNCs to be able to do that so they can keep up. Uh, another one is to request the CPUC to provide ITA in the city with the zip code information on pickup and drop off locations for TNC rides in Los Angeles so that we can post it in our open data portal. Uh, either post it in our open data portal or if we're not allowed to do that, we can at least use it as a, uh, a way to check um, to make sure that we're getting accurate information. Another one is to ask LAWA to report back with a third party audit of revenues from TNC drop offs and pickups at LAX. Another is to request LAWA to work with TNCs to include a pop-up or link button on consumer receipts from rides originating and ending at the airport to contact uh, LAX directly, something they indicated that they have done in other cities that I would ask them to do in, these, in, in our city. So those are some of the ideas that I'm going to put forward in, in my motions, and I want to open it up to members not to make motions, but to identify motions that they may be making uh, post public comment. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I like those. Um, I would add um, that I would like us to ask the council to make it an official city position uh, to urge the PUC to add a fingerprinting standard for uh, uh, transportation network companies and all of the other companies 
uh, or firms or technologies that they regulate that all operate at LAX. Um, uh, encourage BOAC to create a uniform standard for all the transit operations that operate at the airport. Um, and the final one would be to um, direct a DOT to report to a T committee on how we can add the uh, transportation network company background check process to taxi companies as well. I'm sorry, repeat the third one again. Uh, direct DOT to report to Transportation Committee uh, on um, adding the background check requirements that the TNCs are required to use to the requirements that taxi cabs are supposed to use. Belts and suspenders. But on the taxis, you're saying take the TNC yes, requirements and, and put them on the taxis. Yep. Okay. And that would be for T Committee, as would presumably the one about the streamlining taxi regulations. Yeah, and sorry, I'm going to ask just, just to be clear, you're asking them to do that or to report on? To report to T-Committee on the first step. On the pros and cons of it. On what it would take to do it. On what it would take. Yes. So we're not directing them under your proposal right. to do it, but to report on how to, what, do, it. How to do it and what it would take. So yep. it's, not a, it's not a position of we're saying that they should. We're saying that we want to look at it. Yes. Well, my position is we should, but we're not there yet. But that's not what you're <laughs> recommending. I just want to be clear. Okay. Other members? Mr. Krikorian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would move that the committee report should include a recommendation that the council impose to the fullest extent that the city is not preempted by state law or regulation, a background check requirement that applies to all charter party carriers, including limos and shuttles, transportation network companies, taxi cabs, and any other transit provider. Uh, with a non-exclusive license agreement or other similar instrument with LAWA, and that that background check should have at least the following features. Enrollment in a DMV employer pull notice program, participation in a fingerprint-based background check done by the California Department of Justice, and participation in a drug testing program. Okay, any other members have motions that they think they may offer after? All right, uh, um, I may have a, a few others. One is to ask the CAO to identify funds to update LADOT's taxi permit software, an issue that came up in the discussion. Um, and another is uh, to ask LAWA to report on the clean fleet requirements for all transit NILAs. There's going to be another one that I may put forward. So that uh, appears to be the, the sum total of the motions that we would, that we are going to consider uh, as part of the report. And now we're going to move to public comment on these items. And we have about 50 cards. We're gonna do uh, one minute a piece. And, and I should say to folks that if you feel like you're, because we've had representatives from all these, most of these cards were submitted prior to, um, to our discussion. And we've had very extensive discussion. We've had representatives come up from the different groups who may have said what you were planning on saying. You certainly have the right to come up, but you don't need to come up to do so. And I know you want to show your strength. In fact, I'll do, I'll do something here. Anyone who is here specifically because they want, they believe that TNCs should be allowed at the airport, raise your hand, please. Anyone who believes that TNCs, that we should be re rejecting uh, the 245 believes that they should not be allowed. Please raise your hand. So we can see that there's a lot of folks in the room on, on both sides of the issue. Um, that being said, anyone is welcome to come up, and we're gonna, I'm going to go through the names, but you're welcome to pass as well if, you're, if your points have already been made. And we may lose members. And we, we may lose folks. So that being said, I'm going to go straight into that. I'm going to call up folks. Uh, basically, I'm going to name someone, then the, the two people behind. If I call your name, please line up. If I call your name first, come to the podium, and I'm going to name the two other people you could line up behind the second rope as we go forward. So we're going to start, uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce a lot of names. Uh, um, we're going to start with Michael Buhaks, Buhaka, uh, who's with Uber Lyft. Well, Michael Buhaka, followed by David Geffen, followed by Israel Todesi. Yeah. 
And so please, when, you, when your name is called you know, and you come to the mic, you know, state your name and, uh, and then and let us know what you, what you want to tell us. My name is Michael Bushusha. Well, I, I butchered I, uh, that one, sorry. I have a very brief story to tell you. Please. I'm one of those drivers who has, uh, who's, my uh, personal number has been stolen and been used by Uber driver. I left the country, I came back, and I found out that I have a major tax payment to the IRS. So all this stuff that I hear about them, they do background check, incorrect. I'm the example that they have not, they will not do that. So my personal, my social securities were stolen, I don't know how, somebody drove for Uber, made a lot of money, and I'm stuck with that bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, David Geffen, followed by Israel Tedesi, followed by Geraldine Stapleton. So that the folks I mentioned could go to the secondary rope if your name is Israel and Geraldine. Have you heard? We can hear you. Okay, great. I'm David Geffen. I'm a civil rights attorney for 27 years and now a mediator. I've litigated against the MTA before relating to improper driver training and failure to pick up um, individuals. Four of my clients were injured when their wheelchairs were not properly secured. I haven't heard, heard here today anything that gives me any assurance that I can get a ride from the airport and that anybody in a wheelchair can call and get a ride from the airport from somebody who's properly trained in how to secure a wheelchair and, and somebody who is properly trained on how to treat people with disabilities. Can they come by and look at you and see that you have a service dog or a, a seeing eye dog or a signal dog and leave? Who's going to make sure that they don't? I do hear that Uber says they want to comply with the ADA, but I think they're thinking of themselves as complying as an, with the ADA as an application and not as an employer. And as an application, maybe their website and their application is accessible, but what about the individuals who are providing the services? What, in, what agency is enforcing the ADA against them? You're asking individuals to make complaints, but that is after the fact. We're asking Thank you to plan now, consider the rights of people with disabilities Great. right now. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, Mr. Geffen. Uh, Next, Israel Tedesi, followed by Geraldine Stapleton, followed by Veronica Juarez. My name is Israel Tedesi. I'm driving yellow car for, for a long time. I'm a by, this is the uh, taxi industry's uh, rules by DOT, and I have a badge. I'm a professional. And Blue Uber and the Lyft, they try to get away from the law. I tell you one thing. The bro uh, one lady, she went to rent her house, and the broker went over there, uh, sent her the uh, tenant, and the tenant uh, said, I want to rent my, your house. Okay, uh, so my son, this is living room. You have two doors. This is a restroom, has two doors, and this is a ch kitchen, two doors. All has access to get out. And if you need more, I'll give you another door. And the guy said, Mom, why do I need all these doors? Because the, the broker told me you are a thief and you need a way to get out. That's why, you know, and over and the leaves, they are trying to get out from this law. They you know the bandit changed the name to Uber. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tessie. Next, we have Geraldine Stapleton, followed by Veronica Juarez, followed by Hillary Norton. Well, it started out with good morning, but now I think it's good evening, yeah. <laughs> Chairman Blumenfield, and also the committee members. I'm Geraldine Stapleton, president of the California National Organization for Women. I believe that in, in hearing everything, that pretty much everything I had to say has already been discussed. Uh, we are concerned about uh, violence against women and girls, and the lack of having fingerprint checks included in, with the background. Did I hear you say that you are going to recommend that fingerprints uh, be included in the background check? Is that what, going to be one of the recommendations? We, we can't really have back and forth during public comment, but okay. Ms. Mr. Bonin suggested that that would be one of the recommendations he's going to put okay. forward. Okay, that that's what our major concern was after 
hearing and reading about all of the stories of uh, sexual assault and full well knowing the ramifications of that. So, also children. Th thank you very much. Stapleton. Uh, Ms. Juarez, followed by Hillary Norton, followed by Stefan Freeman. Good afternoon. I'm Veronica Juarez, Director of Gover Government Relations for Lyft. I'll keep this short. We've talked a lot about women and safety. Um, we are most definitely committed to that. That's why over 60% of all of our passengers are female. Over 30% of all the folks who are approved to drive on the Lyft platform are women. And over half of our executive team inside our headquarters are also women. Personally, as someone who has taken over 800 lifts in most of the cities across the country, I can say that I have always felt safe, and I, I am even further confident about what we're doing to make sure that this is a safe experience for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Uh, next, we have Ms. Norton, followed by Stefan Freeman, followed by Melvin uh, Gracia. Good afternoon. My name is Stefan Freeman, and uh, I'm working on behalf of the Open Doors organization. We are an organization that helps uh, businesses succeed in the disability um, arena in the market. And currently, we help train uh, Uber Uber drivers in their assist program. I'm actually going to do one in about an hour and a half. And I um, I believe that given more options for people with disabilities to ride at the airport is a better thing for, for us and for folks with disabilities. It's a work in progress. It's not perfect. It's not perfect on any level. Um, but uh, it's a great, great place to start, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Ms. Norton, followed by Stefan Freeman, followed by Melvin Grasso. Ms. Norton. I do not see here, so we will move on to Stefan Freeman. Stefan Freeman, not here. Uh, Melvin Grassi, or any last name that's close to that. Melvin, from, and uh, representing Lyft, it says. Mel is, are you Melvin coming up? Great, I must have mispronounced your last name based on it. So followed by Igor Carbe followed by uh, Jovan Grombel. Uh, is Grace. <laughs> okay, well, handwriting. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, Mr. Grace. I didn't do it. <laughs> well, it's a shame we only have women to do this, and um, you know, it's a, lot to say, it's a lot to be said about the organization and how it's run, and also, good evening to everybody. Um, I'm a security officer. I chose to do this on the side just because I believe in one thing, and that's safety. Um, I, I deal with a lot of nightclubs. Uh, I, I um, help uh, help people understand to call uh, Uber or Lyft to make sure they get home safe and sound because I'm like you, I don't want to see on the news some drunk driver on rent into somebody or kill somebody on the freeway. Um, I don't want to get emotional about this because like I said, I only got 30 seconds left, but um, I appreciate the councilman and his family using this, using the service. Also, um, Ms. Martinez, I understand about the safety of of uh, you know you're saying about the children, but um, you would have to be the parent to come with us in order for to provide the safety to get from A to B. Um, I had an incident with a, a gentleman that um, he was using a service. He was drunk. Um, I had to get him from Hollywood to Sherman Oaks. He uh, he went to sleep. Um, I had to wake him up, pull him on the side, say, "Sir, wake up, please. Uh, where's your destination?" He tried to tell me. He finally got a chance to tell me. But the problem, the thing is. Instead of you know just keep going and using the service or using the time, thank, uh, thank I wind you, up getting them. Thank you. I, 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 again, I, not not personal that I have to cut people off. I just it, it's not a lot, but this has been a long hearing, as you know. Uh, but appreciate you being here. Next, next we have Igor Carbe, followed by Yovan Grombo, followed by Nina Eddington. Good afternoon. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Good afternoon, member of council. My name is Igor. I am a driver and a member of the Lyft com community. Here's one of the concern, traffic. Um, in my own experience, is, is one of the big reasons of traffic congestion at the airport. Driving to the airport to pick up a friend. The friend is not there, waiting for luggage, for instance, and I can't park. 
It will be interesting to see how many vehicles make multiple cycles until their friends is ready to be picked up. I guarantee you that if you allow TNCs for pickups at LAX, an increasing number of those lost passengers will use our service instead of asking their friends to pick them up and having them driving in circles. Um, I finally would like to share what ride-sharing companies bring to our cities of Los Angeles. Connection. Passengers connect with their drivers. LAX welcomes a very large number of tourists every year. TNC's community are made from individuals from a myriad of different backgrounds who are ready and willing to welcome their passengers Great. and connect. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Again, hate to, it's not personal when we, when we, when you turn it off, but we have to keep um, equal. Next is Hovan Gamble, Nina Eddington, Tracy Porter. Hovan? And if, if the, if the next people who I mentioned could line up at the rope, if, you're, if I've mentioned your name, please line up at the secondary rope. But starting with Yovan. No? Okay, then Nina Eddington, that's you. Please come forward. And if Tracy Porter could come to, this, to the rope behind the second rope, and, and Martin Manihan behind Ms. Porter. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Nina Soleil Eddington, and um, I've been a stay-at-home mom for many years, and I couldn't get a job because of lack of resume. Lyft gave me the opportunity to um, have support my family, my son. I'm a single mom, and I believe in free and fair, um, I'm sorry, I'm nervous, yeah, um, competition. And I think LAX is a big market that we, it can be shared by taxi drivers and drivers like us. And I would like to add a fact that I understand your concern about the safety and terrorism in this country. But I want to remind you that the head of uh, the 11, September 11 attacks was Mohammed Atta. And he was a naturalized US citizen that not even the CIA could do anything about these attacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Tracy Porter and uh, Martin Manhaya and Bonita Smith could line up, please. Okay, good evening, gentlemen and ladies. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of cab drivers, and I'm wondering about the thing about the background checks. I don't see what the problem is. I've had to have three. And for the gentleman that said that because of people of color are having an issue of about being able to become cab drivers or whatever because of the background checks. Um, I'm black and I'm a woman and I'm driving a cab and I took three background checks and it did not prohibit me at all from um, being able to drive a cab. So that I, I find that um, argument pretty um, phallic, oh not phallic, fallacy. <laughs> but also the fact that it only takes 10 minutes of my time to go and get a background check. I went to a live scan place right down the street from my house, in and out in five minutes, and also about pulling my driver's record. That didn't take me long either. I called DMV, I made an appointment, I was in and out of there in five, 10 minutes. So all these things about, oh, it takes too long. I'm sorry, is there anybody here uh, that drives for Uber or Lyft that couldn't buy as a background check? Okay, that's thank, all I'm saying. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Martin Manahai, Bonita Smith. Good afternoon, Council, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, council, council members and committee members. Uh, well, we, we talk about Rule 245, but about the public safety and security, we never indicate about uh, safety of our city, primarily LAX. Uh, this federal government spends millions of dollars to secure our airport, but basically, uh, I can imagine how many police officers has to be hired to make sure everyone goes into that proper uh, property is safe. And uh, when you go from your home two hours early, now we have to go like six hours for the traffic uh, congestion. Uh, Lava said uh, they, they like uh, Uber, yeah, because they are cheap and they reach a little uh, earlier. But that will create in the future monopolizing in California one of the transportation company because eventually taxi uh, transportation companies, some limousine stuff, they will collapse in some degree and the public will pay triple. 
I would Thank say you. so many other things, but uh, if Thank I may, one. Th Thank you. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next, Bonita Smith, followed by Doris Starling, followed by Jorge Lara. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bonita Smith, and I've been an Uber partner since March of 2015. Being part of the Uber platform has truly been a blessing as it has allowed me the opportunity to balance my work schedule around my personal life as I am a single mom raising an amazing son. The flexibility of the Uber platform has given me peace of mind, hope, and stability. Ride sharing is an innovative way for people to travel to and from their destinations. I believe ride sharing should be allowed at LAX because it allows people a safe, quick, and easy option to travel to and from the airport. As an UberX partner, I hear daily feedback from riders. Riders participate and value the affordability of ride-sharing services. LAX is a world-class airport that strives to deliver exceptional service. Passengers should be allowed to choose and have ride-sharing services available as an option to them. Our city leaders can make this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Doris Starling, followed by Jorge Lara, followed by Ruben Gonzalez. Good afternoon, and thank you. Um, let me just say this. I work for Uber, and we're talking about rules and regulations. I couldn't drive today because my insurance wasn't right. Um, and so they're constantly monitoring everything that you do. And I'm saying this today because it was, it's just a minor thing. I gave them the wrong insurance card, but still they cut it off where I could not drive today because everything was not in order. So they are monitoring us, they are monitoring what we do, and, um, and so I just wanted to share that with you. The other thing I wanted to, to share with you too is that when the presentation of the taxis were up here, then they broke down the areas in which they work. One of the areas that were not receiving services was South Central. I want you to know that Uber does not uh, discriminate against areas, and we're in South Central. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Jorge Lara, followed by Ruben Gonzalez, followed by uh, Jahan Ovisi. Hello, my name is Jorge Lara. I live in West LA and a council member of Corrid's district. And I would like to share my reasons why I chose to leave my job as a limo driver and partnered with TNCs such as Uber and Lyft. I've been driving with Uber and Lyft for two and a half years. My main reasons, I, don't, I do not have a set schedule with uh, them. I've been able to spend more time with my family. When I drove with the limo company, I had a set schedule of 12 hour shift and I, it was very exhausting. It is very important for me to be able to drive with TNC. Please allow the ride sharing at LAX. And at the end, of, I wanna add something else. At the end of the day, I think customers should have options. That's thank, it. Thank, thank you me. very much. Uh, Mr. Ruben Gonzalez from the LA Chamber, followed by Johan Ovisi, followed by <coughs> Benjamin Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ruben Gonzalez. I'm here on behalf of the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. It, uh, there is no doubt that the taxi industry in the city of Los Angeles is at a competitive disadvantage. But the reason they're at a competitive disadvantage is because the regulatory structure that they're under is an ancient one, and one which is, which is based on the premise that taxis are a monopoly. It's obvious through this many hours of discussion that that's no longer the case. Because of the many different options that folks have and customers have from LAX or throughout the city, uh, it, is, it is now a competitive market. As such, the right move, and I'm heartened by several of the motions made by members in this committee, is to lift the regulations on the taxi industry to allow them to adjust their model to be more competitive in the city of Los Angeles. That is the process, that is what should be done. However, the 245 action is not the tool or the avenue to reach that goal of creating a truly competitive market for the taxi industry. Thank you. Thank you. Johan Ovisi, followed by Benjamin Howard, followed by Jennifer Frund. Hi, my name is Johan Ovisi from Encino, California. I'm a partner with Uber more than two years. I just want to share the story about some passengers are picking up around the airport. They said they're coming from different states, overseas, to the LAX, and <clears throat> they opened the app, they said, no UberX available. They get very upset, they said it's like a disaster. 
and they have another processing to take the luggage with the, some transportation, get off the airport, takes another 30 minutes to find the UberX to call and to get home. Why we don't do something to make that easy for this passenger? Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, next, Binyamin Howard, followed by Jennifer Frund, followed by Sarah Mitchell. Good evening. I wanted to just uh, thank Councilmember Martinez for her emphasis on family. I'm also a father of eight, and it's, it's very important to me that my children are safe. Uber is a very family-friendly uh, company. I've, I just the other day I drove a mother and the child. It was secured in the child seat from Hollywood to San Diego. It was one of the most pleasant experiences ever, and uh, I I have my children take it. I can look at them. I can track them, and I I also um, I served our nation. I have a I was in the official ceremonial unit to the president. I had a White House security clearance, so I'd be happy. I'd be honored to. Uh, you know, connect with you if you wanted to experience. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to experience that with you. And we just wanted to thank the council and people for allowing Uber to be in the community. And uh, you look at our, our rates and our records and the timing of when we get there, an average of five minutes, you know, 30,000 drivers. And it's, it, it's very strategic in this city. You got to know what you're doing. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer Frund, followed by Sarah Mitchell, followed by Kimberly Aguirre. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Freund, resident of Shadow Hills and president and CEO of Corporate Impressions, a printing and packaging company in North Hollywood. I'm also a mother and wife and mother of four children, ages 29 to 16. I'm a board member of NABO LA, the National Association of Women Business Owners, a member of Women's Presidents Organization, a member of the Valley Industrial and Commerce Association. For me, safety when riding a ride share service is of utmost important, and I use Uber and have always felt safe and comfortable. I'm aware of Uber's vigor rigorous background checks. Their added safety measures uh, share my ETA, rate your ride, uh, and the brilliant cashless transactions. Uber is safe, is a very safe option for women as passengers and drivers. My ch children recommended Uber to me, and I would and have recommended Uber to my family, friends, and employees. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Sarah Mitchell, followed by uh, Kimberly Aguirre, followed by Antonio Cardenas. Good evening. I'm Sarah Mitchell. I'm with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, but I'm going to take my time to speak as a single 25-year-old female. Um, I use Lyft and Uber on a weekly basis at the least frequent. In fact, two weeks ago, I took an Uber at 3 in the morning from North Hollywood to LAX alone. I was not afraid. I've never been nervous being in a car with someone from Lyft or Uber. And even if I did, I know that I have the resources in, to send in my GPS to my roommate or to report it or anything like that. I'm not saying that I feel uncomfortable in a cab either. I'm just saying that we are spending all this time discussing the minute differences between two, two different background checks when, in the end, we should just be discussing how it's 2015. We use Uber and Lyft, and they've done their due diligence to make sure that they're creating a safe policy, and I request that you do not veto this agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Kimberly Aguirre, followed by Antonio Cardenas, followed by John Doherty. Hello, my name is Kimberly Aguirre. I live in the city of Pacoima in Council Member Nuri Martinez's district. Uh, I've been driving for Uber for a little over a year now, and uh, I quit my full time job in order to be able to spend more time with my daughter mm -hmm. and uh, see her grow up. And this has allowed sure. for sure. that, for me to I be know. present for my daughter. I am very much in favor of. Uh, us being to pick up at LAX because uh, I believe we would provide uh, safe, reliable, and affordable transportation. I get this kind of feedback from my riders almost on a daily basis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Antonio Cardenas, followed by John Doherty, followed by Kurt McLeod. Hi. Uh, my name is Antonio Cardenas. I live in the area of North Hills. Nuri Martinez is uh, my council member of my district. 
I tried with Uber because I was looking for an additional income. After five months, I realized that I really enjoy servicing my local community, making their trips safer and meeting new people. I want UberX to serve LAX, to provide a different customer exper service experience at an affordable price. Many riders share that with me, that they're interested and they want that, that option. I just want to finish my, my presentation with a quote that says, we are trying to construct a more inclusive society. We are going to make a country in which no one is left out. Franklin T. Roosevelt, thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have John Doherty, followed by Kurt McCleave. I'm sorry, did you say but my name? I did, not, I did not say your name. Oh, I thought you said Antonio. There's, uh, there was a different Antonio. Your, your card is in, is in the line, but it's, it, it hasn't been called yet. Mr. Doherty? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is John Doherty. I'm general counsel for TechNet, an association that focuses on advocating for the innovation economy. Uh, I'm here today to ask that this committee recommend adoption of the agreement with LAX to allow consumer choice and flexibility in choosing transportation options to and from the airport. While transportation services existed bef before LAX opened, the companies we're discussing today have radically transform transformed the industry. The level of accountability, consumer control, feedback, and built-in safety features result in a consumer experience that is more convenient, efficient, and safer than traditional means. The half a million rides per week not only attests to the popularity of the service, it provides a unique opportunity for constant and instantaneous feedback on safety concerns. I urge you to look forward and not backwards and to provide visitors to LAX access to these popular services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Doherty. Next we have Kurt McCleave, followed by uh, Koyorki Alvarado, followed by Carol Schatz. Good evening, I'm Kurt McCleave. I'm a resident of West Hollywood and I've been driving for Uber for close to two years and I'm in favor of us being allowed to pick up at LAX UberX and other ride-sharing services offer very safe, affordable transportation to get around the city. And if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be getting ride requests. So the public wants to be picked up at LAX. Um, we are allowed to drop them off there. I don't really see a difference between dropping someone off at the airport and picking them up. It's luggage in or luggage out of the, of the trunk. And the other thing is, if you are requesting UberX and you notice that the driver is not the person that's supposed to be behind the wheel, you do have the option to cancel the ride. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McLeave, uh, Kiorki Alvarado, followed by Carol Schatz, followed by Alberto uh, Diso Jr. Is Kiorki here? Kiorki Alvarado, followed by Carol Schatz, followed by Alberto Dico. Please state your name. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Alberto, and I am, I've been driving for Uber for over a year now. And uh, yeah, I drop off a lot of riders to LAX, and they've been always asking me about whether we can take them, I mean, pick them up from the airport. But uh, yeah, that's why I'm here uh, to uh, support Uber so that we can pick uh, riders from the airport. Uh, yeah, I applied for Uber uh, over a year ago and uh, there's no fingerprinting, but uh, I have to upload all my personal information, social security, driver's license, insurance, registration, everything. So I feel like uh, I shouldn't mess around with the system because it's easy to track me down. So I can assure you it's a very comfortable ride very efficient drivers, very quick to respond to your requests. And I uh, support 100% what Uber is uh, trying to, to get out of this uh, committee uh, meeting today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm taking the last call for Kiorki Alvarado, not here. Carol Schatz, not here. So next we'll hear from uh, Doniel Gilbert, followed by Larry Bazell, followed by Gary Vogan. Is Danielle Gilbert here? No. 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 Is Larry Bazell? No. We'll hear from Larry Bazell, followed by Gary Vogan, followed by Jose Luis uh, Orellano. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I'm Larry Bazell. I'm deaf. 
And my concern primarily is with throwing the ADA requirements in the mix. My concern basically is information which may not be correct off of YouTube and the internet, finding out that <clears throat> Uber is not really equipped in uh, able to pick up wheelchair users. And that concerns me because <clears throat> As a deaf person, I feel that the ADA least represents the deaf. I have understood practically nothing that has gone on, so I hope I'm not repeating any information. There's no closed captioning, and I'm at fault because I forgot to ask for an interpreter. So it would help to know that at least the ADA requirement is thought about. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate that, Mr. Bazell. So Gary Vogan, followed by Jose Luis Oriano, followed by Jesus Mendoza Gonzalez. Hello, honorable members of the City Council. My name is Gary Vogan, and I have been a dr cab driver since 1988, and I want to speak against Motion 245. I just want to welcome you to the brave new world of the sharing economy, which is nothing more than the latest chapter into the race to the bottom for the working men and women of this country. The Airport Commission, in its rush to allow entry of the TNCs into, into LAX, I think ignores one fundamental lesson that we all learn in Econ 101. And to quote Milton Friedman, not my favorite economist, but he did say one important thing. There is no free lunch. Uber has been taking the city by storm because it has a deregulated model that can undercut the cab industry. But that is low prices have been bought at the price of public safety because there is no regulatory framework in, as sound cut off, in, which, in, which to, in, in, in which to ensure public safety. Uber's business model Thank precludes public safety. Thank you. It's Thank, Thank you. Again, sorry, we, we have to cut you off. It's, it's, we could, we, you made your point, and it's a, it's a good point. Um, we have to keep everyone equal time. Next, we have Jose Luis Oriano, followed by Jesus Mendoza Gonzalez, followed by uh, Fernando Cesares. And if the other people are here, if they could line up at the second rope, that would make things more efficient. Good afternoon. My name is Fernando Casares with the Natural Resources Defense Council. I uh, just want to express that we support the safety of the drivers and the passengers as well as making sure that uh, passengers with disabilities get the quality transportation they deserved. Our organization uh, helped spearhead the passage of SB 375 uh, Sustainable Communities and Solutions Act, which aims to lower our screen, greenhouse gas emissions by lowering vehicle miles traveled. We believe that an important part of creating sustainable communities includes providing a menu of multimodal reliable transportation options. I am particularly excited that we are finally bringing reliable mass transit to LAX and look forward to the first ride. However, the Crenshaw LAX line is scheduled to be open in 2018. We don't have the luxury of waiting. We are interested in providing a suite of transportation choices that allow people to find and match with one another headed in the same direction so that they can share a ride rather than driving alone. And that can help us lower vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Give this technology a chance to test itself, come back in six months and 12 months and really test the accuracy. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, I called Jose Luis Oriano. I did not see anyone rise, so I'm gonna say Jose Oriano is not here. Uh, I also called Jesus Mendoza Gonzalez. I uh, did not have anyone come forward, so I assume he is not here. The next three names are Denny uh, Schindler, Douglas Karstens, and uh, Hillary Norton. I thought we called Hillary Norton. Are any of those people here? Denny Schneider? Not, are you coming forward? Okay. Don't, don't run. It's okay. Go ahead. Denny Schneider, Douglas Karstens, Hillary Norton. If you're here, please line up. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. I'm President of RSAC. 
I wanted to, we gave you several comments on this, uh, one of which was uh, 13 different areas of concern, most of which are not addressed. The one I want to address today, though, is simply the one related to protecting the community around LAX from the cars. The plan is not going to work, and I'm going to give you a scenario where it won't. People go to the airport with a TNC. They like the driver. They get the driver's phone number. They call them when they get back, or they're waiting for when they get back. They don't even have the, the unit on. They need a transponder. Otherwise, you aren't even going to collect your money at the, at the airport. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Douglas Carstens, followed by Hillary Norton, followed by Wayne Spindler. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, honorable council members. My name is Douglas Carstens. I'm uh, here on behalf of the Alliance for Regional Solution to Airport Congestion. We do support the 245 taking jurisdiction. We also submitted an appeal under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. That is the Bill of Rights for an Environmental Democracy. We understand that will be heard separately. I think it might be in September. I'm not sure where, but we're looking forward to that hearing as well because this uh, CEQA is integral to this decision. It will help you regulate this so that you will ensure the clean fleet requirements will be in place and you can ensure that public safety will be protected. CEQA does deal with public safety. It will allow you to distinguish between the factual assertions of each of these parties and, and resolve them but only if you do a properly conducted environmental impact report. This is not exempt from CEQA. It's a too important a decision for that with major environmental impacts that have to be analyzed properly. We ask you to reverse the BOAC decision, send it back to BOAC, and do this properly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've called Hillary Norton. I don't see her coming forward, so I'm assuming she's not here. Uh, Wayne Spindler, followed by Juan Dahlhaus, followed by John Walsh. The whole reason you made it taxi cabs too expensive to use, you and the rest of the corrupt cities, excessive transfer fees, excessive transaction fees and regulations have caused taxis to become inexpensive to nobody and too expensive for everybody. The market stepped in and found a solution, Lyft and Uber. So that's good. Let them come in and do the fares at the LAX. But also, you have to readjust the regulations on your taxi cab franchises so that they can get money back in their pockets and innovate so they can compete. So we have all of these choices so that all these fares can be affordable, especially short-term fares, especially in the urban areas where there's a lot of elderly African-Americans and other minorities that are underserved. So those are good solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Spindler. Uh, next, Juan Dahlhouse, who I do not see here, so we'll say he is not here. Mr. John Walsh, if you're here, come forward. Not seeing him, he's not here. Ms. Antonio, uh, Antonio Ramirez, followed by Mr. Herman. Thank you. To the board um, of commissioners, Please, um, stop hiring a lot of these ghetto cab companies and who are gangbangers, angry, atrocious, nasty, despicable, loud, obnoxious, filthy, indiscreet, brash, dismissive, not to mention unprofessional, as they broadcast out loud, where are you going? And then they give out the address. So if you are a victim of gang stalkings, this is dangerous. Please Google search retired ex-FBI agent Ted Gunderson on gang stalkings in YouTube. Again, that's Ted Gunderson. And it is vitally important that all parties involved in taxis and the dispatch and passengers, 911 dispatch and insurance companies have knowledge of this domestic terrorism affecting citizens and prospective tourists for their safety is at stake. That's why discretion and privacy is so important and um, it should be conducted appropriately. Moreover, I have not tried Uber, but I hope to in the future. God bless Donald Trump and God bless the military. Thank you. Um, and the last card on the list is Mr. Herman. Well, as the clock runs, I got plenty of time. Mr. Sprindler brought up very good, important points. Incidentally, though, not one of you stood up 
on behalf of those under the American Disability Act. Not one of you transpired to inspire me to understand if you really came up with an idea along with this group called Uber and this other company who you have taken their privileges of inspiring new competitive work, as they call it, but you would rather pad your wallets and have them pad you extensively behind closed doors so that everything will look fine and dandy. Screw you. Do something better for the public. If the public has not made any bark about what you're barking about, roo, roo, stop trying to extort more money. Dividing zones is racism and the color of discrimination. Great, thank you. Okay, that concludes all of the uh, public comment cards on this item. So uh, now, as we discussed, we're going to move to um, motions. I'm going to put forward a motion. Uh, we're going to have various motions, and then before we have the vote on the 245, we'll have some uh, discussion so members will have a chance to, uh, to make those discussions. And I think what I'll do as a chair, I'm going to go through the motions that I'm putting forward. And these motions are, again, specifically um, to be part of the committee report, an independent report from the decision that's being made. So uh, first, and I'm going to go through them in, I was going to think of taking them on block, but I'll just go through them and if, if say without objection, and if there is an objection, we can discuss it and then um, uh, vote on it. So, you know, first one was to request that LAWA come back to TCT in six months and one year with status reports on how ground operations are going at LAX, including the geofence, TNC, taxi limo driver citations, and NILA infractions. So, okay, without, without objection, that recommendation is included in the committee report. Second, to direct LADOT to draft a plan to streamline taxi regulations. That would go to the T committee? Uh, well, we're directing them directly. Yes, great. It, okay. So we're, we're asking them to, yeah. to do this. And then when they come with the T, with the streamline regulations, presumably that goes yeah, to T. Great. I don't know if we need to spell it. The, the dir well, as I'm envisioning this, we are directing LADOT to draft a plan to streamline taxi regulations. That will be voted on by the council as part of the committee report. They will then do what they said they were pretty much already doing, drafting this streamline. When they have those regulations, as all regulations, they would go back right. to T committee. Any objections? No. Seeing none, that will be included. Third, uh, support AB 1422, which is a Cooper bill to allow TNCs to participate in the DMV pull notice program. So moved. Seeing no objection, we'll include that. Fourth, request the CPUC to provide ITA with the zip code information on pickup and drop off locations for TNC rides in Los Angeles so that we can post it in our open data portal and or share that data with, with LAWA. I say and or because we need to make sure that it is legal to post it in our open data portal. Um, my hope is that we can, but even if we can't, I wanna make sure that we get the, the, the data to LAWA. Any objections? Seeing none, that will be part of the report. Fifth, request that LAWA report back with a third party audit of revenue from TNC drop-offs pickups at LAX. Seeing no objection or comments, that will be included in our report. Sixth, request that LAWA to report on clean fleet requirements. Seeing no objection, that will be reported. Seventh, to instruct the CAO to identify funding to update LADOT's taxi permitting technology. Seeing no objection, uh, that will be permitted. And Mr. Bonin, you had three that I've written down, but if I will turn it to you to make your motions one at a time. Okay, one is to add to the city's state legislative program an official position for the city of LA to request that the CUP, CPUC develop a revised comprehensive and uniform background check process for TNCs, limos, buses, and all other prearranged ride services as applicable, exploring fingerprinting, commercial databases, and the recommended best practices of the National Association of Professional Background Screeners. Not seeing an objection. You know, I, I'm not sure that fingerprinting is, is the best. I have, a lot of doubt has been thrown uh, during this discussion, but I think that that's a, a wise thing that you're putting forward to, to send it to, to CPUC to ask them to explore 
uh, all of the options. So without objection, going to move approval of that as part of our recommendation. Please, please use the microphone. Yeah, sorry. I had the same uh, thought, Mr. Chair, and, and I just want to clarify that these are not, um, th that the idea is to have them review all of the yes. various options and come up with their own recommendations exactly. and not presuppose, for example, that the National Association of Professional Background Screeners has the best exactly. practice. Okay, right. very good. Yep. Then uh, I support that. Yep. Um, second one was to encourage the Board of Airport Commissioners to adopt uniform standards for all of the LAWA regulated ground transportation operators and or companies at the airport. Yeah, you know, on, on that one, I don't know. There may be differences that are needed, um, but we're encouraging them to adopt uniform standards. I would say as, I would add the words as appropriate. Okay. Um, uh, and the third one was to direct. Friendly amendment acceptance. Yes, absolutely. The friendliest amendment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the third was to direct LADOT to report to the T committee on what actions would be necessary to require taxis to comply with the same background check processes as the TNCs. And again, we're not we're not saying that this is not a direction to tell them to require taxis, right. but specifically to report on uh, what that would involve. Exactly. Without objection. Okay, uh, Mr. Krikorian, you had. Uh, a proposed motion for the committee report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, move to recommend that the council impose to the extent that the city is not preempted by state law or regulation, a background check requirement that applies to all charter party carriers, including limos and shuttles, TNCs, taxis, and any other transit provider with a non-exclusive licensing agreement or other similar instrument with LAWA, with the following minimum features. A enrollment in a DMV employer pull notice program. B, participation in a fingerprint-based background check done by the California Department of Justice. And C, participation in a drug testing program. Well, I'm not sure I can support that. Um, you know, hearing, because basically that is, that is saying to the extent possible that, we're, that we are saying that they have to have a fingerprint program. And that, that really strikes at the heart of this, of this NILA. Um, as far as, I mean, I think going as far as Mr. Bonin went, which was to have the, the PUC look at all the options, including fingerprinting, for me is as far as I'm willing to go because I've had enough doubt about the, the different approaches to know which is truly better in terms of safety. Uh, I think it's, it's worth looking at them both. Um, but I was, I was moved by a lot of the conversation about the different safety mechanisms that we have with Uber that we, and Lyft that we don't have on taxis, and I was moved by all the discussion. Um, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that at this point in time we should be imposing that on um, basically in the NILA, which, which strikes at the heart of it. I agree. Any other comments on well, this? It, it, just to be clear, though, for clarification, Mr. Chair, um, it would not be in the NILA. This would be an action by the council because the airport did indicate that they don't do this sort of background uh, check for anybody. Uh, that's really up to the Department of Transportation or the appropriate city agency to do. So this, this would not be a requirement of the NILA. It would be a new action imposed by the city, by the city council. I, I, I know that's not going to change your position, but just for clarification. Um, Mr. Chair, isn't there um, a motion that was uh, put forward by Mr. Ryu um, looking at imposing these uh, background check requirements on a citywide basis, or is this this is what you're is this what you're gearing at, um, heading towards, uh, Mr. Kokorian? On this is more of a citywide, or specifically uh, the uh, the TNCs work at the airport. Well, this particular motion, Mr. Buscaino, is is limited to uh, transit providers who have a NILA or a similar instrument with, with, with LAWA. Uh, I, if I remember Mr. Roo's motion correctly, it would ask for a hearing on, it's similar to I think what Mr. Bonin asked for today, yes, all of the idea. various security uh, and background check options for all of the ground transportation providers without regard to, to LAX, as I recall, but um, yeah, I, I don't know that specifically. We had a, 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 a first hearing of the motion in T Committee last week, and 
what the direction was is for uh, DOT to report back within a couple weeks on what the potential scope of uh, such a, an analysis would be that sort of breaks down what the different requirements are for every transit operator in the city of Los Angeles, everything from our dash shuttle to taxis to the, the transportation network companies to the flyaway and stuff like that, uh, to give the council uh, a, a sense of what the full landscape is so we can come up with a more comprehensive policy. That's a healthy discussion. It's a right. sensible direction to go in to have the range of options. I'm prepared to move forward with this motion right now as uh, it relates to ground transportation in LAX, uh, but I certainly support that continuing broader conversation as well. Can I ask a question on this one? It, it says council imposed to the extent that the city isn't preempted, da 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 da, da uh, on all of these, the, the, the three requirements. Um, so are, are we, if, if this were approved by council, that's the the final action, or are we asking city departments to report back on what that policy would actually look like, who it would apply to, what the particulars are, and stuff like that? Well, I'm not sure if I understand the question. You mean, it's not a request um, for an ordinance to be drafted at right. this point, but um, it is to set that policy direction. So I assume that that would be vetted by the Department of Transportation and then um, brought back for an ordinance to be drafted by the council. So uh, uh, rather than council impose, which makes it sound like it's the final action, can we direct the departments to prepare the report or the work product to, to do what you're seeking to do? Um, we can say that um, direct the department to prepare the requirement. I, I think the report back is already covered by the other motions. Right. My motion goes a little further than that and initiates the action. Now, the enrollment in DMV employer pull notice, as I understand it, we need the, the state bill AB 1422 to be able to do that. So how could we impose that requirement if we don't have the authority, if the TNCs don't have the ability to do it under current law? Well, whether they have the ability to do it or not is not my concern. It's what we are imposing upon them. But if they can comply, they can comply. If they can't comply, they can't comply. So it's tantamount to saying that they cannot operate. Because if you're imposing an impossible condition, then and know that, that it's an impossible condition, you're preventing their operation. I don't know when the effective date of their participation of the NILA may be, but it in under the terms of the NILA it will be consistent with their compliance with the various requirements that we impose in the NILA. One of those may be uh, their eligibility to participate in a DMV employer pull notice program. I don't know what the status of that uh, legislation in Sacramento is now, but again, it's, I, I, my, would, my, I, would I, I mean, I, I don't mean to be, it's your, your um, motion, I get it. I don't mean to be uh, uh, draconian about this, but these are the requirements that I'm moving we should require. And if they can make it, they can make it. If they can't make it, they can't make it. I mean, I would suggest, I guess, that for motions that you would say enrollment in DMV employer pull notice, you know, contingent on that being legally possible. No, I, but, I, I but, appreciate the suggestion, yeah. but that's not my motion. So f for me, I have a problem with imposing something that is impossible. Because if you impose the impossible, it is basically saying we're not going to have you at the airport. And I get that. Um, similarly, you know, imposing participation in a fingerprint based background check when the PUC has already said that we don't have the ability to do that as a city is it also imposing an impossible criteria. Um, I, I, I may like the fingerprint idea. Um, and, and I want to hear how it goes with Mr. Bonnet's motion. But if we impose it and the PUC has said that we can't do it, it makes it in, it makes to me, it, it's an imposition of something impossible. And it basically, if you're imposing the impossible, it's just, it's just an end to run to say no. And, and as to that point, because this is a contract involving access to the airport, um, the PUC's, uh, preemption, as I understand it, does not preclude us from imposing additional requirements of security or, or anything else. If this were a citywide requirement, then presumably there would be a 
some preemptive effect, and that's why I exclude, um, you know, to the extent that it's preempted. But within the airport, as we've had this long discussion, the airport has come up with its own set of standards for what should be requirements of the contract. My motion relates to the additional requirements that I would suggest the council impose, uh, and that would be uh, the ones that are listed. Any additional comments? I, I was sort of on the fence on it, and the longer you guys talked about it, the more firm I got to be a no on it. Okay. Um, any additional questions? On yeah, I too struggle with this uh, motion, to all due respect, Mr. Kokorian. It's evident by the testimony today that not one background check is perfect. Um, it can, there can be some flaws, so I, I can't support uh, this um, proposed uh, motion. On, on, this, on this motion, we will have a vote, a uh, roll call vote. Ms. Clerk, would you, would you call the roll, please? Uh, Councilmember Blumenfield, no. Councilmember Bonin? No. Councilmember Krukorian? Aye. Councilmember Buscaino? No. And Councilmember Martinez? On this motion, uh, the ayes are two, the noes are three. This motion uh, fails. So, and so if I may, on the ultimate issue, uh, Mr. Blumenfield, if you're prepared to move to that now. Uh, well, we just want to make sure we've covered all of our okay. motions that we, we've, we have. So we have a total of uh, 10 committee recommendations. Uh, and now we can move to discussion on the 245 and what will be put before you, because we can, we can frame this in the positive or the negative. Uh, as the chair, I'm going, to, I'm going to frame this in the affirmative. So what's, what the vote that we're going to have is to vote to affirm the BOAC decision. So a yes vote would be to affirm the BOAC decision. A no vote would be to reject the, the 245 BOAC decision. And, uh, and I'll now open that up to discussion uh, on that motion. 245. Mr. Krikorian, go ahead. I think we have uh, debated the issue at length. It's uh, almost 6 o'clock. Uh, I don't know that it requires a lot of further discussion, but um, we've dealt with the, at least three significant issues of concern uh, with the NILA as it is now. One is uh, the implications of public safety, uh, the adequacy of background checks, um, another is the issue of accessibility of the disabled community uh, with the TNCs. And a third is the issue relating to equity throughout the city. Um, uh, I, there may be some room where through the use of technology and otherwise we might be, and with PUC records, according to your motion, that we might be able to address some of those equity issues. Um, I'm not at all convinced uh, that we've addressed uh, or that the NILA addresses the concerns of public safety uh, nor the rights of the disabled. And so um, I recommend a no vote on the motion to approve and uh, I will propose a, an alternative motion to veto the action of the uh, Board of Airport Commissioners of July 16th relative to approving the NILA uh, for TNC servicing LAX and remand the matter to the commission. Any additional comments? I mean uh, sure. Um, I'm gonna I, I won't say much. I'm, I'm unaccustomed to uh, having a serious to pol serious policy discussion, uh, on, particularly on transportation issues with Mr. Krikorian and, and coming to a different conclusion. This is one where uh, we have. Uh, I respect his opinion and, and his concerns and, and of, as well as uh, the concerns and opinions of those who, who, who share his opinions. Uh, uh, for me, though, I'm comfortable with Anila. Uh, I have been for some time. I've seen the work that BOAC has done on this. Uh, and I have heard consistently from folks throughout, really, the city uh, on all forms of uh, communication, particularly on social media, uh, seniors who like to go to and from the airport and don't want to rely on someone for a ride, uh, students, uh, neighborhood residents from all over the city in different parts who, who say that they really prefer to use Uber and Lyft uh, to go to and from the airport, uh, use it to get to the airport and want to be able to use it to get out of the airport. And uh, I think that what BOAC has done has looked at a series of different problems. 
They looked at the problem of congestion in the CTA. They looked at the problem of impacts on the neighborhood. They looked at the problem of too few choices for passengers who want to use the airport. And they came up with, as I've described it, as a smart, thoughtful, fair, and progressive looking solution. And uh, I think that the, the, the problems that I have heard the, the opposite side about are, are more about the problems of the taxi industry and not about the, the airport itself or, or not about the passengers. And uh, I side uh, with the passengers and therefore would uh, second your motion to affirm the decision of BOAC uh, and allow Uber and Lyft uh, to operate according to the NILA at the airport. Thank you. Other members? Otherwise, I'll close on this debate. Any additional members? Go ahead, Mr. I, I just want to say uh, thank you, Mr. Bryant, because I, too, uh, am unfamiliar with this position. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have to say um, that without having made a 245 motion, and without having brought this matter uh, to this committee, uh, we would not have had this extraordinarily uh, deep, right. insightful, thorough policy discussion, yes. which I think has, has been beneficial regardless of the outcome of these votes. And so I want to thank, um, first of all, all of the panelists who came and spoke, all of the members of the public who came to spoke, but especially my colleagues and the chair for doing a committee hearing different than many that we have to sit through. Uh, this was a, a very policy heavy, uh, detailed, nuanced discussion and I, I think we should be doing more of this and I really want to applaud uh, Chairman Blumenfield and, and all of you for, um, for having led that discussion. Thank you very much. Mr. Corian, and I, I appreciate that and, and want to echo my gratitude for all of the folks who helped make this, this possible. Um, all of the witnesses, the expert witnesses who came and testified gave us a tremendous amount of time. All of the members of the public who came and sat through a very long hearing and gave their, their views. Stephanie and my staff and my team who really uh, dug in on this and have worked very hard. So whichever way this you know, ends up, we've had a really good discussion about it. For me, I've been torn the entire time. I, I've not been you know, absolutely decided. Uh, I, I really like the choices of the TNCs that they bring to the table. I like the alternatives in terms of the, uh, the safety mechanisms of tracking uh, that go along with TNCs, the real-time information of it, and I think it's the future. It's where we're going on this, and I like us to be ahead of the curve uh, and, not, and not behind it. That doesn't mean I'm immune to some of the arguments that were made in terms of uh, safety. You know, we need to be, we have a responsibility to be safe, but there is a continuum. You know, I mean, ultimately, if we wanted to be the most safe, we could require that every driver of every provider uh, spend $1,000 on a, on a private investigator and investigate um, that driver, you know, thoroughly. And we could require that. That would be a belt and suspenders and a, and a hat and, and galoshes. Um, we could do that. We've got we've to draw a line somewhere, um, and this is a difficult line to draw. I mean, there are folks who use this third-party system that we consider very good providers. Our care, uh, at-home, uh, long-term care folks use the third-party provider system that's used by Uber and Lyft. Um, and yet, on the other hand, our fingerprints are often used by the city and at schools and other places that we care. So there's, there is a precedent for using both in very sensitive situations. Um, kind of what pushes me over the edge on, on the fingerprint issue and on, on the issue is, is all of the other safety mechanisms, safety mechanisms that are involved in the TNCs. Uh, because I see that as not just regulating the person's past history, um, but regulating behavior and in incentivizing good behavior. And I am also sympathetic to some of the, uh, the issues in terms of the, the, the Green Lining Institute that was referenced in terms of Folks who, um, you know, may have had a difficult past, may have been arrested, but are still worthy of being drivers and would get unnecessarily discriminated against in some situations. I'm concerned about that. Um, again, not an easy decision at all. I think we've come up with a number of motions uh, that are balanced, that are going to, um, you know, we're not, we're not choosing, we have to make an ultimate choice, but we're not choosing one side or the other side. 
we are trying to create a balanced situation and, and with Mr. Bonnet's motion about asking the PUC to look at finger, exploring the alternative of fingerprinting, uh, I think that takes us even further into balance. Uh, ultimately for me, you know, we were looking at the VOAC decision not because it was the wrong decision, but from my perspective, we were looking at it because it was an important decision. Uh, and and Lawa and, and folks have said, have shown that they really gave it a lot of thought that, and, and that was never really in, in question, if in case you thought it was, when we brought it forward. Uh, but I appreciated the thoroughness of which you all uh, gave to this question and to the questions put forward. So for me, I, you know, yes, we have a responsibility as a council to in some way substitute our judgment if we think your judgment is not, a, is not sound. But I think there's a, there's a threshold. It's not just if you like red and we like blue, we want to switch it. It has to be, there has to be a much higher bar if we're going to overturn a decision like that where we feel like it really fundamentally was a, a wrong decision, not just a different decision than we would have made. Um, and I don't think it was a fundamentally wrong decision. It may have been a different decision than some of us have made, but for me, that's not the threshold. Um, so uh, I'm leading up to the, the vote and the motion which I'm, I'm asking for an I vote on affirming the BOAC decision. And should that not be affirmed, we will then take up the alternative, which is a, uh, a, a, mo a motion to reject it. So the first vote, if you would call the roll, is to affir affirm the BOAC decision. If you would please call the roll. Yes, Con Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Bonin? Aye. Council Member Krikorian? No. Council Member Buscaino? Aye. Council Member Martinez. No. The, the uh, 245 affirmation uh, passes on a vote of three to two. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, my motion was to veto uh, the action of uh, the Board of Air Commissioners on July 16th uh, in order to preserve that as a minority position for a discussion in council. I would ask uh, for a vote on my motion to veto as well. Okay. We talked a lot about belt and suspenders. I don't think it's, it is necessary, but I'm happy to put the belt and the suspenders on. So we will take up uh, Mr. Krikorian's motion, which is to veto the BOAC decision. And as the chair, I'm recommending a no vote on this motion. And uh, Mr. Clerk, would you call the roll? Yes, Council Member Blumenfield. Uh, Blumenfield, no. Council Member Bonin. No. Council Member Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Buscaino? No. And Councilmember Martinez? Yes. On, on, on that vote, it, uh, the motion fails on a vote of two to three. Um, so that's it for this item. We're going to move to the other items, but I want to again uh, especially thank my colleagues for a really good discussion. You know, it's not every issue that we have a split vote like this, um, but we had a lot of good discussion. So we take a, a Folks don't want to be here for the next slide. We're going to go back to item one briefly. Um, item one, we have two public comment cards. And council member, would you like me to read that into the record? Yeah, if you could, again, well, we already read it into the record to start. Yeah. So we just quickly take uh, public comment cards on item one. And we'll start with uh, Antonio Ramirez, followed by Wanakawa, followed by John Walsh. the LA Harbor Department with the revenue funds. God bless all our harbor crew and personnel, including our beloved United States Coast Guard, for without them, all we would, we would have been threatened with terrorism long ago. In addition, now as we embark on an old wound frontier of opening up a foreign relations with Cuba, and I don't mean giving them the bird, this greatly concerns me for we will be deceived and or tricked into believing or accepting that this is so-called package or bin is normal standard operations. We must exercise caution and high alert when we deal with the coastal harbors. So again, please, um, ref Funding this, uh, the, the harbor is absolutely crucial and vital to sustaining our 
peace, protection, and safety here in America. And uh, God bless uh, our jefe, Donald Trump, who I believe will also protect the the democratic sovereignty of America, and God bless our United States military, and God bless our pilots and uh, Great, America. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Next, uh, Mr. Juan Dahlhaus, not seeing Mr. Dahlhaus here. Mr. John Walsh, not seeing Mr. Walsh pass. Mr. Wayne Spindler, Mr. Wayne Spindler, if you wish to speak, you must come to the microphone. Not seeing Mr. Wayne Spindler. Oh, there he is, okay. So it's very chaotic in here right now. He's on item one. There you go. So no community impact statement, but on, this is a CD12 issue, and this is by the, the little tiny dwarf, Mitchell Englander. So I'm against this issue. So we have to, we, what we have to do is we have to look more at the type of funding options that are available at the harbor. And also, I think that this item should not have been in this agenda because I just think it gets too overlooked right now because they spent so much time with Uber and Lyft that this thing is getting sort of swept under the rug. So I think based on this, I think you should move this item to another day to more thoroughly vet it. Okay, thank you, thank you very Mr. much. Okay. Uh, next we have Mr. Herman. I strongly agree on Mr. Spinner's point that there was no physical impact statement as brought out in many of your commission meetings. And you need to make some better choice, more so in CD15, which I believe is Joe Blow Busquiano's uh, Harbor District regarding uh, refunding revenue bonds. If Joe Blow is going to commission any exemption on a bond, I think he needs to have himself audit as to how well he can negotiate the revenue bonds for refunding so that the public and his community in CD15 are aware of how every bond dollar is spent. I demand a motion that there be an audit regarding item 14-1107-S1 on item number one. Thank Great. you. Thank you. That concludes uh, public comment on item one. Without objection, item one is approved by unanimous consent. Uh, that concludes item one and two. We now have general public comment. Yes. Free to go. <laughs> uh, starting with Mr. Herman. You know, at no point there was really no decency to want to add into this idea of yours people who have an individual disability. So from, the, from this point on, I really hope you consider with due respect of decency that you put into action an implementation to always include the American Disability Act, for it has significant importance to the standards that Congress and the federal government under the Civil Rights of Disability have made it possible for people with disabilities to have mobility access throughout Los Angeles, throughout the state of California. Stop causing problems with public transportation. Use the tools that the government has provided. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Herman. Um, next, Mr. Walsh. Not seeing Mr. Walsh here. Mr. Antonio Ramirez. Thank you. Let us show the world that America is a cradle in aviation brilliance with opulence and reaching her final apex of the golden age for our pilots are brilliant, handsome piece of hunks and with a great camaraderie they have excellent command of the English language and are the bundle of joy with great innate energy. Furthermore, pilot safety is a priority. Let them tantalize and mesmerize the world with American freedom, friendly service in the skies. So again, bring out America 
America, revive America with opulence, class, and culture, sophistication, taste, and vitality. And let us not forget that America is the, the, the leader of wisdom, brilliance, in innovation, and balls. And with that, let us remember to vote for Donald Trump because he's got spit and he loves traveling from here to there. So the man knows what the world needs. Great aviation experts and they come out of America. God bless Donald Trump. Thank you. Ms. Donna Perman. Perlman, uh, not seeing her, not coming forward. She's not here. Mr. Wanakawa is not here. And uh, last, uh, Mr. Wayne Spindler. Martinez, why, Nuri? You didn't support the Uber and Lyft. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 why did I'm, you support I'm, 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 against I'm, I'm, fair transportation costs for your daughter, Nuri? The next election, you could be unelected and out on the streets. You're going to need money to, to travel around the congested streets. You'll need Uber. In fact, I might even be the driver one day as we all go bankrupt with the next crash coming. So you have to understand, Nuri, you can't vote with a goat because Krikorian lost. <laughs> you lost Krikorian. That's why he's not here. Thank you to Joe Blow, Buscaino. Thank you to Bonin and to the sensibility of Chairman Blumenthal to let competition live. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Is there anything else on our docket? All right. This hearing is hereby adjourned. <laughs>